Hello world. Uh, my name's Glenn. Thank you very much for being here with me today. Um, today I'm going to conclusively prove to you that Edward de Vere is the author of Shakespeare uh, and many other works. Um, this is probably going to be the honour of my life, uh, so thank you very much for being here with me uh, and also for your patience in advance. This is going to take a little bit of time uh, and it's also unscripted, so there will be some mums and ahs as I, as I think my way uh, through this. But um, just thank you for your kindness and for being here with me today. Uh, before I start, I'd like to also thank the following people, Sir Mark Rylance, um, for starting all of this for me from something eloquent uh, he said, and also for championing uh, the authorship question and for championing uh, peace and virtue in the world. So thank you, uh, Sir Mark. Uh, secondly, to Alexander War, uh, who first encouraged me to enter into this debate uh, for his kind words and his encouragement for all of the brilliant research he himself has done. Um, and I know he's got a book coming out with Professor Roger Strickmatter, which I'm sure will be just terrific. And I can't wait to read it. Uh, and lastly, to the memory of Tom Renier, uh, who has done a tremendous amount for the authorship uh, question and research and for me in particular his work with uh, Hamlet and the law was really pivotal to my understanding of what I believe is going on here so thank you Tom may your memory and legacy live on so this is Edward de Vere the 17th Earl of Oxford and I really don't like this portrait uh, I think it's very funny though um, and I'll explain why later but I'm going to uh, prove that this this man this wonderful princely man uh, is in fact the author of quite a few things uh, and this is Shakespeare's arm so I'm going to do this by asking a simple question and that question is what does this mean that's it what does this mean and we're going to go all the way until uh, the terminus of that question now if you asked me what I thought this meant four weeks ago I, I would have told you well that's obviously Shakespeare's coat of arms it says Shakespeare spelt correctly I might say uh, Shakespeare at the top his coat of arms, there's a spear on it, there's a bird shaking a spear, that's Shakespeare's coat of arms. And I'm sorry to say, that's that's because I didn't understand heraldry. I didn't understand armoury, I, I didn't understand the signs, uh, the symbolic philosophy, so to say, of what, of what the different components and elements that make up this arm uh, mean. And that's what I really would love to explore with you today. And hopefully, um, well, it will yield some really exciting revelations. Uh, so uh, this is the Stratford um, Funerary Monument in uh, Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon. Got the bust of Shakespeare there, uh, an epitaph underneath. And above we have uh, our coat of arms, um, which is featuring quite prominently there. Now, I'm just going to sow this seed. Um, it's not always what we're looking at that's important. It's also what is around what we're looking at that is very important. So let's let's find our common ground first. If you've clicked on this video or you're watching, you probably you probably love or at least like Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. Uh, you, I hope, love the work of Shakespeare. So we we can agree on that. Um, and now let's agree on some facts. So it was granted to John Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's father. Um, two draft uh, grants were made by the Garter King of Arms, that's the, the chief herald, um, William Dethick, both dated October the 20th, 1596. Both of those uh, drafts were dated. Um, there was a third confirmation draft impaling Arden, that's Mary Arden, that's um, William Shakespeare's mother, John's wife, um, often when you get married you put your coat of arms together um, and that was uh, by Garter King of Arms William Dethick and Clarence Sue King of Arms William Camden, Camden in 1599. Uh, then we have, you can see the picture there, that's the uh, uh, Shakespeare's coat of arms in the Book of Coats and Crests uh, by William Smith, begun the 28th of May 1602. And then in 1602, Ralph Brooke drew up for submission to the Queen a list of 23 mean persons who he believed had wrongfully or incorrectly been granted arms by William Dethick. And Shakespeare uh, was on that list. 
Uh, I also really loved uh, this article that was in the New York Times in 2016 by Jennifer uh, Schusler, Shakespeare actor, playwright, social climber new, um, in the New York Times, as I've already said. Uh, so the new depictions Miss Wolf has gathered are all from the 17th century. That's Heather Wolf, who works um, at the uh, Folger Shakespeare Library. Uh, she, she does some incredible work there, uh, like what she's uh, doing in this article. Um, was being reported in this article. More than half associate the arms with Shakespeare the player or with William, not John. The material not only proves that Shakespeare was Shakespeare, as Miss Wolfe Riley put it, it also, she argues, underlines the degree to which contemporary saw the coat of arms as, in effect, being for William. It makes it abundantly clear that while Shakespeare was obtaining the arms on behalf of his father, it was really for his own status, she said. Uh, Mr Shapiro, that's James Shapiro, who's a professor of English at Columbia and is also brilliant, uh, said he agreed. All evidence suggests this was not about the father, he said, but, how, but about how Shakespeare wanted to be seen. Well, I agree that this coat of arms is all about uh, William Shakespeare and how he was to be seen. Uh, this is Ralph Brooks' compilation of arms granted by William Defick um, in 1602. You'll see that William Shakespeare is on there at number four. And as I said, just notice the names that are around there. Uh, before uh, I go any further, I'd also like to thank the following institutions because I really couldn't have done what I'm going to do today without uh, their help and the work that they've already done. So thank you uh, tremendously to the Folger Shakespeare Library, uh, particularly uh, Shakespeare Documented, which has just done some phenomenal work. So thank you. I really wouldn't have been able to do this without you. Uh, to Heather Wolf as well for the brilliant transcriptions you've done. I really appreciate everything you've done there. Uh, the College of Arms for uh, giving... Uh, permission to the Folger uh, to show those initial uh, graft grants, draft grants, grant drafts. Um, I will uh, I'll put the links to those uh, draft grants in the comments for you so you can have a look um, and see those with your own eyes because that's really important. I'm not interested in giving you things that you can't see with your own eyes. Uh, the Bodleian Library uh, and the University of Oxford, thank you so much for digitising the first folio. That's been really, really uh, crucial. Uh, to the British Library as well, um, just for everything you do. Uh, and the Internet Archive and Google for digitising books and the Internet Archive for ho hosting those. Um, that's been like really pivotal because I'm, I needed to read uh, these books <laughs> to do the work that I'm doing. Uh, so what I've done here, um, now, uh, Heather Wolf did some wonderful transcriptions. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't really read it for meaning because it's all spaced out. You'll find superscripts, strike throughs. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult to read. And one thing I do not want to do with this work is read a modern uh, transcription. We need to work with the original spellings uh, and the original uh, drafts because that contains a lot of meaning. So what I've done here is I've taken Heather Wolf's work and I've made my own transcriptions using her uh, transcriptions. So I've preserved the original spelling. Uh, all of the strike throughs uh, are as per uh, Heather's work. The only difference is here is I've highlighted some things. I've got rid of the uh, superscripts. I've just made it normal um, text. Um, and I've uh, emboldened some things and underlined a word. Okay. Other than that, this hopefully should be as accurate as possible. Now, this is just the, the start of where we're going. But I just need to alert you to some of the things that are going on uh, in the uh, draft grants. Um, and then as we proceed, we're going to refer back to some of the things that are happening in here. I encourage you to go and see these with your own eyes. Um, that's really important. So the first thing I want to say is just have a look. Have a look at his motto. So this is Shakespeare's motto, uh, non sans droit, uh, which is from old uh, French, meaning not without rights. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is it's th written three times. Now, this is William Dethick, who's the chief herald in the country, an experienced and intelligent man, that should be said. Uh, just notice that he has written that three times in draft number one, and notice what he's done to capitalisation, which is interesting. We've got all caps, all lowers, and then each word that's um, capitalised. Okay, that, that, that's weird. One of them has been struck through, one of them hasn't. 
okay, that that's weird. Why has he done that? Hmm, interesting. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to read through some of this, not all of this. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to draw your attention to a few things that I think are really important. I will read through draft number three, though. Um, so, to all singular, noble and genteel, double L, men, of what estate or degree bearing arms to who these presents uh, shall come? William Dethick, alias, uh, alias Garter, principal king, king of arms, sendeth uh, greetings, know ye. Um, I'd like you to pay attention to spelling. Because what you are going to start to see is some discrepancies of spelling uh, between draft number one and draft number two. Now remember, these were these were done on the same date, on the same day, um, and yet there are variations in spelling by the same person on the same date, which is a little bit uh, peculiar. Uh, to the end, that that means there's some damage. I'm not entirely sure what it's saying there. Um, as some by their ancient names, families, kindreds and descents uh, have and enjoy sundry, I love that word sundry, ensigns of arms, so other for their valiant facts, uh, magnanimity, virtue, just notice the spelling of virtue there with the in the end, dignities and deserts may have such tokens and marks and tokens huh, of honour and worthiness, a capital W there, uh, whereby their name and good fame shall be damaged and divulged, and their children and posterity in all virtue better encouraged discerned, uh, we've, we've struck that through, uh, to the better, struck that through, service of their prince and country. In this has been struck through. In consideration and better declaration, whereof I have been, being hereunto solicited and by credible report informed, uh, being therefore hereunto solicited, credible report informed that John Shakespeare of Stratford upon double P, Avon, in the country of, or just notice the spelling of Warwick here, War W, whose parentess and late ancestors were for their value and faithful service, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that said, John married the Mary, daughter, and one of uh, the heirs of Robert Arden of Wilmcote in the said country, gent, in consideration whereof and for the encouragement of his posterity, I have therefore assigned, given, and granted, and by these presents confirmed, this shield of coat of arms. And this is uh, the, the blazon, the description of the arms. Uh, so there's gold on a bend, sable, uh, a spear. We'll talk about this later. Of the first, the point steeled uh, argent. No, it's not argent, it's proper. Interesting. And for his crest and cognizance, a falcon, his wings displayed. No, it's not proper. It's, it's argent. No, it, it, argent. Uh, you wrote argent after you wrote the word argent, but without a capital. That's that's weird. William Dethick. Uh, standing on a wreath of his colours, supporting a spear, um, uh, gold, stilled as Apple said, proper argent. Oh, both of these, are, because it was Apple said, but why is he written it on? Oh, interesting. Uh, set upon a helmet with ment uh, mantles and tassels and hath been accustomed, and more plainly uh, appeareth the depicted on this margin, sing for blah, 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 uh, that he may uh, or use. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay, just notice uh, this. This is the, the 39th year of our reign of the sovereign lady Elizabeth. Okay, and also just notice uh, this. All look. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, by the ancient custom and law of arms. There is a custom and a law of a way of doing things in heraldry. Uh, a customary, lawful uh, way of doing things in arms. That's important as well. Uh, here's another picture of Shakespeare's arms. Um, also, so this is draft number two. Uh, just notice at the top there we have another non sans do but this time, notice the D is lowercase. So that's four variants of that motto. Four variants with different capitalisation. Now, these, as I said, draft grants were done on the same day. That's slightly peculiar, but that's because it's telling us something. There's actually quite a lot of wit um, that's going on here. Now, first thing, again, just notice the virtue. Suddenly, that doesn't have an e on the end. Same person. Uh, also, war. There's no. There's no w at the end here. It's now Warwick. Okay. Uh, it's crossed through. Crests and cognizances there. I love this word. Uh, uh, 
edifices or edifices. He's crossed it through, but I, I like the word uh, edifice. Uh, and also notice it's not the 13th. No, it's not the 39th year of the reign of our sovereign lady Elizabeth. No, it is the 38th year. Um, oh, and uh, Faith. I think it, we only had one left last time, didn't we? Now, it, it, scholars may like to try and just go, oh, this is spelling variations and spelling. Spelling didn't matter too much in those days. Um, but it, it, it did. And this is, this is unusual. There's some unusual peculiarities about these uh, draft grants that we just need to be more sensitive uh, to, I think. Uh, now, on the third uh, draft grant, uh, it talks about impaling the arms. This is, uh, and please do click on the link so you can see this, um, underneath the motto and the arms, you have what the impaled version should look like, which is this one. You've got uh, John Shakespeare and Mary Arden. Um, so this is on the third draft grant. Uh, I'm going to read through uh, this again. So, to all and singular noble and genteel men, notice only one L, of what? All estates and degrees bearing arms, to whom these presents shall come, William Dethick, Garter, Principal King of Arms of England, and William Cam Camden, and William Camden, alias Clarence, who is an elder, a King of Arms of the southeast and west parts of this realm, sendeth greetings, know ye, that in all nations and kingdoms the record and remembrance of the valiant facts and virtuous dispositions of value oh, oh we've crossed out value uh, worthy men have been made known and divulged by certain shields of arms and tokens of chivalry the grant and testimony whereof appertaineth unto us by virtue of our office from the queen's most excellent majesty and her highness most noble and victorious progenitors wherefore being solicited and by credible report informed that john shakespeare now strapped upon avon in the country of warwick Okay, another speller. Uh, gent, whose parent, great grandfather, no, and late ancestor was all across, uh, for his faithful and approved service to the late most prudent Prince King Henry the Seventh of most famous memory, was advanced and rewarded with lands and tenements given to him in those parts of Warwickshire. So another variant of Warwickshire, where they have continued in, by some descent. Uh, in good reputation and credit, and for that the said John Shakespeare, having married the daughter of one of the heirs of Robert Arden of Wellingcote in the said country, and also produced a certain, oh no, we've crossed that out, uh, this his uh, ancient coat of arms hereful to, uh, heretofore assigned uh, to him whilst he was his majesty's officer, uh, oh, he wasn't the justice though, uh, the bailiff of the town in consideration of the premises, where I've crossed out, uh, and for the encouragement of his posterity, unto whom such blazon of arms and achievements uh, of inheritance from their said mother, by the ancient custom and law of arms in this realm, may lawfully descend. Uh, we, the said Garter and Clarence, have by these pates, pates means head, interesting, um, assigned, granted, and confirmed by these presence exemplified unto the said John Shakespeare and to his posterity arms of cross out uh, that shield double L and coat of arms which he showed and produced um, there's a field of gold upon a Ben Sables a spear of the first point upward headed with steel argent proper oh, a little bit confused there aren't we oh no it's argent with capital A and for his crest I thought two heads were better than one. We're, we're, we're getting, um, and for his crest or cognizance, a falcon with his wings displayed, standing on a wreath of his colours, supporting a spear in pale. Armed, a headed or and steeled, argent, not argent, not argent with the capital A. No, 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 not argent, silver. Hmm, that's a big giveaway. Uh, fixed upon a helmet with mantles and tassels of mm, as more plainly may appear depicted on this margent and under the same not under the same, uh, we have further likewise upon other uh, escutions uh, sh shields impelled the same with the ancient arms of the said arden of wellingcote 
as aforesaid, signifying thereby that it may and shall be lawful for the said uh, John Shakespeare gent to bear and use the same shields of arms, single or impelled, as aforesaid during his natural life, and that it shall be lawful for his children, issue and posterity, lawfully begotten, uh, to bear, use and quarter and show forth the same, which uh, with their due differences for crossed out in all lawful warlike facts and civil use or exercises according to the law of arms and custom that the gent belongeth uh, without let or interruption of any person or persons for use or pre-bearing the same in witness and testimony whereof we have subscribed our names and fastened the seals of our offices these two most important heralds of the land even at the office of the arms london uh, the in uh, the uh, uh, the thirteenth year, the thirteenth huh. year of the reign of our most gracious uh, sovereign, Lady Elizabeth. Oh no, she's not a lady anymore. <laughs> um, by the graft, uh, by the grace of God, uh, France and Ireland, defender of the one F faith. Anchor and and continue. Sorry, uh, fifteen ninety nine. So as you can see, there's some interesting uh, variability between these draft grants, um, and some odd peculiarities which we're going to look at as we start to learn and understand the meaning of the arms. Uh, also, just notice this date here. If we do some digits, some arithmetic, and just add the digits of uh, fifteen ninety nine we get 24. If we add 2 and 4, we also get 6. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Now, I'm going to prove to you that Edward de Vere is the author of this uh, of, of Shakespeare and many other works using these seven books and two guest uh, books. Uh, so these books are Edmund Bolton, His Elements of Armoury, uh, The Minerva Britannia, um, The Iconologia, The Ascendance of Armoury, The Elements of Geometry, Cardinus Comfort and the Art of English Poesy, and then two other guest books. We're going to be doing a lot uh, of looking at uh, these sources and seeing what they're actually saying because they're very important and they are all linked. So we're going to start with Edmund Bolton, his Elements of Armories. Now, I made a video called Wit, Wit and Brass Part 2 um, where I had a bit of a break here and I realised that Edward de Beer was publishing works under other people's. Uh, names and this was one of the books that I thought um, was published by De Vere. So I, I really wanted to read this. It was called Elements. I know that elements were important uh, from the Elementaire uh, by Richard Moorcaster, which I thought was by De Vere. That was quite a shock when when I found that. I didn't want to believe it, but, but after reading it, I was I was pretty convinced. Um, and then also the uh, the elements of geometry, which was what my last video was on, where uh, Edward de Vere explains his life date. Um, so I was very keen to read the elements of armories by Mr. Edmund or EDM colon uh, Bolton. That colon's quite interesting. This is Ben Johnson from the first folio, his dedication poem. So. Elements, as I've said, is is we like the word elements. It's got e quite in and quite a lot in there as well. A lot of great letters uh, that I really like in there as well. Uh, so if we have a look at this uh, this little quote underneath uh, this shield, um, well, he actually explains this in his table of hard words, which he explains in the in the uh, in the back, um, which is I'd encourage you to read. Uh, what he's written there because it's very uh, very insightful and, and very good uh, but this is where it comes from it's actually a quote from Ovid it's a quote from Ovid at the beginning now we like Ovid given the fact that Edward de Beer's uncle translated the Metamorphoses which is going to feature a lot in this video um, into uh, English for the first time and Edward de Beer may well have helped him uh, so we start this book with a quote uh, from Metamorphoses, and he also explains uh, what he's doing here. This is a shield, you've got the elements, fire, um, air, water and earth, and then around you've got shields of, of the colours um, that we use in armoury. Uh, so this is the uh, the quote 
from Metamorphoses, um, which uh, says this, um, which they call chaos, quem dixere chaos, which they call chaos. Um, the, the bit before, because I like to read the side of these quotes to see, and he's also included it in, in, the, uh, in the table at the end, so I thought I'd, I'd translate it. There was, one, there was one countenance upon all of the world. There was one countenance upon all of the world, which they called chaos. And the sense of the whole impress is plain. At London, well, I found some uh, similarities with other published work with at London. I like A and T because it's the first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, so I, I very much like at London. Uh, then he has this quote, which he starts the book off with. But what I want you to notice is what he's done with this first word. Uh, Veru men in uh, Mavero. OK, because it actually should be um, this with some spaces. Veru. Uh, space enum space velo um, and what what does this mean well uh, for these men I consider life and death to be equal since uh, there is inactivity from each but in very truth he especially seems to me to live and to enjoy life who intent on any business seeks the fame of glorious deeds or a noble profession But in very truth. Now we like but in very truth because this was Edward de Vere and his motto was vero nihil verius, nothing truer than truth. So we like uh, varies and we like truth, things to watch out for as we go forward. Um, so this is, um, this is the dedication. He dedicates this book to the Right Honourable Henry Earl of Northampton, Baron Howard. Okay. Now this is really important because Henry Howard Earl of Northampton was the second son of Henry Howard Earl of Surrey, the poet, and uh, of his wife, the former lady, uh, the former Lady Frances de Vere, daughter of the fifteenth Earl of Oxford. Okay. So Henry Howard is the daughter of Lady Frances de Vere. I made this for you just so we can really see. Here's John de Vere. We have Francis uh, and her brother John and Henry and Edward, which makes Henry Howard and Edward de Vere cousins. He's dedicated this book to his cousins. And you'll notice all of these double V's, these de Vere's. Um, and why has he included all of these de Vere's uh, in his dedication to Henry Howard? Well, because Henry Howard is the child of a de Vere. He has de Vere blood in him. So I'm going to quickly just end this now. So you know this book is by Edward de Vere. In it, he contains a uh, summary slate of some of the things he's been talking of. Now, as we go forward in all of the work we're going to do today, I would like you to pay attention to what people are pointing to. We're playing a game of signs, and one of, one of the most human ways we communicate meaning is with what we're pointing to and what we're looking at. So I want you to be really sensitive to what uh, things are being pointed to you. Uh, so this is a, a summary table, as I said. Now, in the elements of geometry, which I also showed you the title page where people were pointing to really important thing, important things, you also have some of these hands, these invisible hands coming out of nowhere that are pointing to things. They're trying to alert your attention, IJ, for instance. Uh, and you're also going to have these hands uh, in the Minerva Britannia, which when we come to look at it, Britannia, uh, which we come to look at later. So these these hands, um, these clouded hands are quite important. So shall we have a look at what these ones are pointing to? Well, we have this one. We have this one. And we have this one. Which, of course, give you Edward de Vere's coat of arms. That's not an, uh, an admission of who wrote this book, then I'm, I'm not sure what it is. But just in case you don't yet believe, allow me to give you some very strong evidence. Because uh, after this other um, thing, that my favourite word, sundry, this sundry 
uh, choice. We like the word sundry because you saw that in the draft uh, grants. Gentlemen, friends of the author. Well, what that's referring to is we've got four dedicated letters in the front of this book. Should we have a look uh, at what they are? Well, the first one, um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's ingeniously written, uh, this book, The Elements of Armouries, the Finis uh, Coronet Opus, uh, the End Crowns the Work, or perhaps The Crown Ends the Work, I don't know. And just notice who this is signed by. Your loving friend, William Sagar Garter. Block caps. Now, why is that important? Well, William Sagar was the Garter King of Arms, after William Dethick. He is the subsequent Garter King of Arms who took William Dethick's position. The worthy William Sagar. Hmm. Okay. Let's have a look at the second one. And this is where the part, if, if you've stayed with me long enough already, this is the part where we start to turn up the dial of evidence because here is where uh, the argument I'm making is legitimised. Um, so, a letter to the author. Um, now, I love the which I acknowledge to be very little. Um, any reference to little or nothing, because I believe Edward de Beer is represented uh, by little or nothing, um, by nothing is very important. The, uh, so, I'm going to read through this. Uh, Sir, whereas uh, your desire is that I should deliver my full opinion of your book, which you lately sent and submitted to my censure, I assure you, if my judgment be any, which I acknowledge to be very little, you have, with that judicious learning and insight handled armoury, the subject of my profession, that I cannot but approve it, as both learnedly and diligently discovered from his first cradle, and could not but allow it if I were censor, uh, liberum, public authoritate, uh, uh, constrictus, uh, the, the body that's constricting publication. Uh, as you know, I am not. Uh, pardon me that I am so brief, for neither my head nor my hand can as yet perform that which they should nor my hand can yet perform that which they should, and would until the Almighty shall restore me to former health, to whose protection I commend you and yours resting. Your loving friend, William Camden, Clarence Sue. No L this time. Now, that's the same person, the same King of Arms, the Clarence Sue King of Arms from draft number three of Shakespeare's grant. Ha, we're just getting started, believe me. Um, so here's, here's where you're about to legitimise my argument. Now, I don't think this is by William Camden. I think this is by Edward de Vere. But if you agree with me, you legitimise all the arguments I'm going to make. Or you can say, no, 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 this is by William Camden. Uh, at which point uh, you also legitimise the arguments I'm going to make. Uh, so uh, let's let's just enjoy the ride. 1609, I really like that date because that is the date of the publication of the sonnets. Uh, 1609, the year of. OK. And also just note this. This will uh, you may be able to see what's going on there. I'll explain that later. Don't worry if you can't. OK, so uh, third letter, a letter to the author from his late dear friend, uh, the grave and courtly Thomas Beddingfield, a squire, late master of his uh, majesty's tents, tents and toils and, and continued deceased. So uh, this is uh, from Thomas Beddingfield. I really like this. So your elements of armories I have seen, but censure them I dare not. Blind eyes can judge no colours, and ignorance may not meddle with excellent conceit. This only I will admire your work and wish you to proceed, if you permit these discourses to wander abroad. <laughs> they shall meet with more men to marvel than understand them. That is the worst. Uh, I return them in haste, fearing to foul the paper or injure the ink. Uh, that's actually brilliant. If you watch this on your second view, you'll really enjoy that. Uh, blind eyes can judge no colours, and ignorance may not meddle with excellent... Uh, conceit. Well, four weeks ago, my eyes were completely blind, uh, but now I see uh, that coat of arms in a slightly 
uh, different lights. Now, Thomas Beddingfield, your loving friend, Thomas Beddingfield. Uh, Thomas Beddingfield was the author of this book. This is Cardinus uh, Comfort, um, which is a very good book. Now, this is a translation of Girolamo Cardano. Uh, I'm not sure if you know who uh, Cardano was. Uh, Cardano was an Italian polymath, personal friend of Leonardo da Vinci, published over 200 books in science and maths, influential for the likes of uh, Newton, uh, Pascal, Gauss, Leibniz, all the big names. He was a genius, an inventor, uh, a man ahead of his time. Um, how funny that this letter is from Thomas Beddingfield, the, uh, uh, the, the translator of, of, this, of this work, uh, of, uh, the author of this work. Well, let's, let's just have a look at Cardinus Comfort. To the right honourable and good, my lord, the Earl of Oxenford, Lord Great Chamberlain of England. So in the front of this book, you're going to find the letter from Thomas Beddingfield to the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. Ha. Let's just read through it. Uh, my good lord, I am uh, give nothing. Oh, there's a nothing reference more agreeable to your mind and my fortune uh, than willingly perform uh, the willing performance of service as it shall please you to command me unto and therefore rather to obey than boast of my cunning. And as a new sign of my old devotion, I do present the book your lo lordship uh, so long desired, love and desire the keys, BV, um, you will favourably conceal mine imperfections. Um, oh, it, it definitely he does. Uh, uh, Lord, who, as you well remember, unaware of my fond, uh, uh, me found some part of this work and willed me in any uh, ways uh, to proceed therein. My meaning was not to have imparted my travail to any, but your honour hath power to command mine intention. Uh, if you can't tell, I, I don't think this is by Thomas Beddingfield. Uh, wherein, considering the manifold uh, mysteries of others, you may the rather esteem your own happy estate uh, with in increase of those noble and rare virtues which I know and rejoice to be in you. Sure I am, it would have better beseemed me to have taken this travail in some discourse of arms of being your Lord's chief profession. And mine also, hold on, hold on, right? Edward de Vere's chief pro profession is arms. I am, I would have uh, been beseemed me to have taken this travail in some dis discourse of arms, being your Lord chief profession and mine also. Then in philosopher's skill. Hmm. How interesting. And we're going to start, we're going to talk a lot about philosophers uh, in, in this talk. Um, skill to have thus busied my life. Uh, <laughs> indeed, his life was busied. Uh, yet Sith your pleasure with such notice that double v and your uh, knowledge in either great uh, i do as i will ever most willingly obey you and if any either though skill or curiosity do find fault with me well i find uh, some fault with you mr thomas uh, beddingfield uh, and if you just have a look here as well this is really interesting thereof uh, or, uh, or therefore, to your Lord, mine errors, uh, forty, uh, whom? You delight to see others acquitted of your cares. Acquitted, just to remind you, means conduct oneself or perform in a specified way. So he delights to see others perform of his cares. Uh, your, your Lord's always to command Thomas Beddingfield, unlike Fields, um, if you've been following my work. So let's have a look, because it seems Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, writes a letter back to Mr Thomas 
uh, Beddingfield. To my loving friend, Thomas Beddingfield, Esquire, one of Her Majesty's gentlemen pensioners. After I have perused your letters, good Master Beddingfield, finding in your uh, request a fair differing from the desert of your labour, I could not choose but greatly doubt whether it were better for me to yield to you your desire or execute mine own intention towards the publishing of your book. For I do confess the affections that I have always borne towards you uh, could move me not a little. But when I had thoroughly considered in my mind of sundry and diverse, oh, diverse arguments, whether it were best to obey mine affections or the merits of your studies, um, at length I determined it better to deny your unlawful request than to grant or uh, confidence to the concealment of so worthy a work. Worthy a work, double V. Uh, I'm going to skip a little bit. Uh, lift up the base-minded uh, man to achieve, I like that, apt, achieve, to any true sum of grade or virtue. And because next to the sacred letters, nothing doth persuade the same more than philosophy. Now, remember, nothing, I believe, is Edward de Vere. Uh, so nothing doth persuade the same more than philosophy, the love of wisdom. I thought myself to commit an unpardonable error. I thought myself to commit an unpardonable error. Um, oftentimes to spoil and burn the corn of his own. Uh, <laughs> Just going to start dropping seeds. Uh, many of your countrymen uh, should be uh, deluded through my sinister means. M what? Many of your countrymen should be deluded, deluded through my sinister means of your industry. How interesting. I prefer my own intention uh, to discover your volume before your request to secret uh, ye same. Uh, cunning, uh, where, wherein I uh, may seem to you to play the part of the cunning and expert medicina uh, or physician. Uh, that's actually hilarious. I've just spotted this. Every time I do this work, I find uh, something new. <laughs> the expert medicina and physician, very important, uh, as I've just found. Um and so you uh, begin, uh, uh, so you being sick of so much doubt in your own proceedings, uh, I can't blame you, uh, though which infirmity uh, you are desirous to bury and uh, ensevel your works in the grave of oblivion. Uh, yet I, knowing the discomfort, uh, discomforties that shall uh, redound to yourself thereby, uh, but, but, uh, declare our affection more than by erecting them of tombs, double V. For in your lifetime I shall erect you such a monument that, as I say, your lifetime shall see um, how noble a shadow Sorry about players and shadows in there, uh, of your uh, virtuous life uh, shall hereafter remain uh, when you are dead and gone and in your lifetime again, I say, I shall give you that monument in remembrance of your life, whereby I may declare my goodwill uh, through, uh, though with your ill will, as yet I do bear you uh, in your life. Hmm. Thus eternally uh, desiring you in this on request of mine, as I would yield, as I would yield, and to you in a great many, not to repugn the setting forth of your own proper studies, I bid you farewell. He does like to say farewell a lot. Uh, just notice the double V there. We're going to have a look at this later. Uh, You've, uh, you have begun to proceedings, they're better virtuous actions. Now, uh, there's something beautiful here, which I, I need to make you aware for one of the final proofs that I will give you uh, towards the end of the video. And that is the word virtue. 
Okay, let's just count how many times the word virtue has been used in this letter. Virtue. Two, three, four, five, six. I love that one, virtuous. Seven, eight. So we have virtue eight times. Okay, we have virtue in this letter eight times. And it's by your loving and assured friend, Edward Oxenford. That's very important and will be for one of the final proofs. Um, so we also have a to the reader. Now I love to the readers most of my work from, from finding uh, the Art of English Posy, which was the beginning of this work for me, to all the other books I've found. They all have this common uh, preface. They all have a to the reader. Um, in, in the books that I'm finding. So they all have this to the reader. And the to the reader is a really important kind of giveaway about who is writing um, uh, the book or translating it. Um, now, I'm only going to focus on uh, the last two lines of this uh, because that's the crucial thing. It's quite cryptic, the Earl of Ox Oxenford uh, to the reader. It's quite cryptic, but the last two lines, uh, I think, are very, very important. For he that beats the bush the bird not gets, but who sits still and holdeth fast the nets. So he's told you exactly, actually, it's really funny, uh, like how he's going to like reveal uh, his identity uh, to you. He's told you, but it, it, we, we're going to have to go through um, some reading and some learning first to understand this. Uh, and there's also a To the Reader, again, by another one by Thomas uh, Churchyard, which I'm not going to uh, read. But I do love this. A man is but his mind. Uh, and another one there. Um, made for war as much for wisdom. OK, so that was just the third letter. OK, um, so that's the third letter. Should we do the fourth one, which I think is stunning? I think this is some wonderful uh, poetry. Uh, I really love it. It starts with Sir. And you'll notice that Sir is capitalised twice Sir. Two sirs capitalised twice there. Um, this letter, I think, is a work of poetry. Um, but a very interesting type of poetry, which... Um, good luck on trying to repeat uh, this poetry. I'm going to call this um, ancestral uh, poetry. So this is by John Beaumont. OK, well, who's Sir John Beaumont? Let's ask that question. Sir John Beaumont was the first uh, baronet of Grace Dew, and he was a poet part of the time uh, but he's also uh, John Bowman is also the great 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 grandson of um, John Beaumont the fourth Baron Beaumont knight of the garter who was knighted by King Edward the third well it just so happens that John Beaumont's mother is Margaret de Vere the daughter of John de Vere, the seventh Earl of Oxford. Yep. Which makes Edward de Vere also the great, 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 great grandson of John Beaumont. That is stunning. How he pulled that up, that's amazing. Uh, so that's why the Sir is important, because it's referring to the knight, John Beaumont. And there's two of them because they're both the great, great, great grandson of John Beaumont. Beautiful. Uh, uh, you will find it a hard task to equal uh, your invention. Indeed. Good luck to anyone else who wants to try that. Uh, and then we have some to the readers in our elements of armoury. If thou desire to know the reason why uh, thou dost in shield the arms of honour bear, this book will say that uh, they by nature were the hieroglyphics of nobility. It shows beside how art doth beautify, what nature doth inspire, and how each where all arts conjoined in this art do appear by structure of a choice of philosophy. Geometry gives lines in ordered place, numbers arithmetic, and thou mayst see how all in optic colours honour thee. But uh, since that virtue 
which adorned the race, uh, from whence thou didst descend, was ground of all have care to follow it, or all will fall. Well, we're going to follow it today. Um, I should have underlined virtue there. Sorry that I didn't. Um, so let's just, also hieroglyphics are important. We're talking about signs and symbols. Symbols and signs, like hieroglyphics, have meaning. Uh, as do words for that for that um, that point. Words are also signs uh, that convey meaning, but aren't the thing themselves. So Mr. Hugh Holland to his learned friend, uh, Mr. E. B. the author upon his elements of armory. Uh, my master Camden, sacred king of arms who bounds with heaven as well as sea, our soil is so uh, prosed and so praised, hath thy toil, as here no need is of my sorry charms. And to boast it, though my brain's Apollo warms, where, like in Jove's Minerva, keeps a coil, yet I a drone shall be thy honey spoil. Thou art the master bee of all swarms, deep in his judgment, spacious in his wit, and high his fame that can in arms enfold, whether sea or land or heaven hold. Philosophers are in a grievous fit to see, whilst envy doth with reason storm, new elements, new matter, and new form, and high his fame that can in arms enfold what either sea or land or heaven hold new elements, new matter and new form. Uh, another of the same by apostrophe to Phoebus, uh, finishing in symbolic allusion to the most uh, noble Earl of Northampton. I like North. On bolts on Phoebus. Hmm. Spend thy golden shafts and gild these papers with thy glorious rays. Crown every leaf with leaves of flowering bays and crown the author with thy laurel uh, grafts. Uh, grass, grafts. Uh, they treat the mystical, uh, the, the mystical of generous crafts uh, that shows what arms were born in antique days. We like days. By whom and where, why and how many ways on shields and blades not set in dudgeon ha uh, ha hafts um, thou and Minerva grace them in the sight of that great Lord whose judgment they rely on for as no I dare face thy glorious light when as thou reignest in the golden lion and so dare no cur against them ope his jaw once uh, seized into the silver lion's paw. Well there's loads going on there. Notice we've got uh, talk of Minerva and also uh, Phoebus, Phoebus Apollo. We like Apollo because the beer uh, was often represented by Apollo and there's loads of stuff here that if you if you ever come to look back on this uh, after we finish the video you're just going to see so much. You'll be like oh my goodness it's so obvious. Uh, yes it is. Um, but it's inattentional blindness. We don't see what we're not looking for. Um, so the author, uh, we're going to start our book. The author has a generous um, and uh, to the generous and learned reader. So this is the author of this book, Mr. Edmund Bolt on. Um, so this is the uh, the author to the reader. Um, we're going to start our learning now. Um, and I'm going to try and accelerate us through this by only taking the key bits that I, I kind of want you to be aware of. Uh, so uh, the matter of armories never as yet delivered in better uh, and causes of armories of which as words of letters, just as armories are signs, so are words and letters uh, with other spec speculations proper to the composite uh, com compositive part. Uh, the mysteries teaching that those armorial bodies so constituted do purport, mean or signify. Who is truly no noble and worthy to be honoured with armories? I have 
upon occasion in all the course of my present youth spent much time and coin to view in person the chief places of England and Ireland to converse the better with our our antiquities in that kind as well to perfect thereby mine own speculations as that I might when opportunity would deliver unto the thing certain pure and without abuse of innovation. Now I think uh, he has happened to find uh, an invention or a person um, which isn't, which is which is pure, which is not his invention. So how he's going to do this book, he's going to do this book using uh, interlocution, so a dialogue between uh, two knights, which is quite interesting. It's a kind of, in a sense, um, it's like Plato, I suppose, but like um, in a sense, it's, it's a play between two knights who are going to talk about arms. Um, their mighty peers, in brief, the noble... Um, uh, from Caesar to the simplest gentleman, yet of all, for the most part, most unknowingly. Coates, whose zeal notwithstanding is worthy to know better things thereof, that other being no more the thing, no more the thing, than books not understood are learning. External testimonies of nobleness are nothing worth, remember I'm telling you, um, that he is nothing so external testimonies of nobleness are nothing worth uh, but confess that armory is a majesty worthy thy service whereunto if names of men rather than things themselves can persuade uh, then canst not be unknowing but how many of our late and presently uh, both greatest and wisest have herefore heretofore and now in present do honour it so we're talking about worthiness, we're talking about arms, and we're talking about uh, people who unknowingly, um, who are unknowing of arms. And we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, let's look at some of this today. So, um, how to enlighten Britain in capitals with the beams of restored honour. And I'm really sorry that this is going to take a while. Thank you for your patience. But I really hope uh, we are going to do that uh, today. Farewell. <laughs> Good farewell. So here we go. Um, the elements of armories. Uh, you'll notice there's a nice John Verney at the top there, which is just perfect. Whoever signed that, whether that was De Vere or someone else, that is just brilliant. So thank you. Um, so this is the conference between two knights, Sir Eustace and Sir Amius. Uh, begun by apostrophe. Amius, I perceive you are loath, uh, good, uh, loath, good Sir Eustace, to be any l longer ignorant. So hopefully by the end of this we won't be. Um, it certainly uh, helped with, with my ignorance. It's cleared that up nicely. Uh, so wherein, when I behold mine ancestors' uh, peculiar coat of arms, I must confess they have left me that but which though i claim to be a gentleman yet neither know i what it symbolize uh, symbolizeth uh, nor out of what elements reasons or grounds of art uh, mine or the like are composed well here's a coat of arms um, and we're going to look at its elements uh, Mary, I might well, very well resemble myself to one of those blue-gowned target bearers who in London, upon their Lord Mayor's Day, uh, bear shields of arms with, with as little knowledge uh, what they are as uh, prop propriety uh, in them, standing uh, dully thereby. Uh, Somewhat you say now, Sir Eustace, and as for me, my youth and leisure have, uh, have ever, ever, I must confess, to deal ingeniously with you. Indeed, indeed he will in this book, being taken with uh, the study uh, as with that which seemed even at first the proper of nobleness, but afterwards of wisdom. Seeing arms have their certain principles, method, use and 
be awry. Uh, and yet will challenge the honourable right of bearing them uh, disdain to hear with the same antagonists. Uh, we have a lovely uh, uh, Latin thing there, which means they do not understand the arms they take, or if you change that A and T around, they do not understand the top of the arms. Uh, why not then, as soon on the hieroglyphics of arms, seeing arms or armories are no less properly the cipher, which remember the archaic meaning of that is nothing, of true armorists than hierograms of the Egyptian sages. So again, this is all to do with symbols and meaning. Okay. Um, and advantage which knowledge gives to them that have it above others. So if you understand these arms, uh, you're going to understand what's going on here. Uh, so just notice this. We have our double V with a hair behind. Hairs are quite fast. Uh, what, uh, therefore, mean you by arms? What do you mean by arms? Uh, such painted heritable uh, and armorial marks uh, as by which gentlemen are known first from the ignoble and then from one and the other. Why say you paint it? Because colours give them life. Uh, had arms or ensigns uh, like heresies or some mechanical crafts as printing. So arms are like printing. And artillery. Any first certain author, uh, art, Illery, yeah, uh, Illery, good. Any first certain author, um, if you will have me declare myself, my opinion is that is that the notion of ensignment of signs is universal and natural. Well, he defined uh, a little bit later the notion of ensignment, uh, the whole complement of arms, the invention, artillery, art, artillery, and typography. Well, typography is uh, how we're setting. Uh, our text and here's some lovely typography for you it's our two double v's are de vere uh, himself no less uh, the son holding himself no less the heir of his ancestors glory that's wonderful um, the uh, the equivocation on son is brilliant <laughs> um man this guy's just such such a beautiful poet he's he's he's, he's wonderful um so, I see right at the end. Uh, so, in in the book, uh, we also have uh, some arrow or spear shaped objects that we're going to see. I'll show you all of them, and we'll we'll talk about them. Uh, so, these, by your uh, favour, seem to countenance merchants' marks rather than the arms of gentlemen. He's talking about the arrows there. Uh, I'd imagine by your smiling that you had some such conceit. But, sir, by your favour and these rude strokes, I truly see the seed of arms for nature like a rural scholar began in their practice, her notions. Neither are they or so diverse, diverse forms uh, from arms or armories in their perfection as an excellent piece of architecture from the first elements of Geometry, oh goodness, elements of geometry. We looked at that in the last video and it's quite important. Uh, I actually missed off deliberately the most important thing that I found in that book, which I think is one of the most important, which I'll give you today. Um, I hope have no such original uh, notes of vassalage, uh, not of honour, therefore arms, I hope, have no such original double L. Double L, that's from the uh, the first folio, the original double L. Uh, as they are such notes, I give them not to you for an original of arms, but if from hence you grant that in nature there are notes of dishonour, it follows indivisibly that in nature there are notes of honour, then the game and set is up. Ennoblishments, brandings, um, embassies of contraries, the reason is the same. 
It's contrary is the reason is the same. Uh, you may not suspect the cause bare or barren by the thrift of my dealing upon barren. I like the word bare and barren because, again, it's nothing. Uh, in our Britain, the nation of brigands, uh, beside what whatsoever their ensignments else had shields painted blue, according to the known verse in Seneca, um, of all the Britons, perhaps, for that as islanders, islanders is important, as you'll see, uh, they were injured with the like coloured uh, environed, I should say not injured, <laughs> no, uh, environed with the like uh, coloured ocean, um, distinguished with marks of honour as the Trojans, and at Troy they did, if at least wise it be true, uh, Diodorus uh, Sicilus, uh, to the great glory, um, Siculus, of the great glory of the Britons, doth write that they have lived after the manner of the heroes at Troy, giving, for instance, there are fight, fighting out of chariots as those demigods and Ilian worthies did. Now, Ilian, that's the archaic name for Troy. Another word for that is Ilium. So Ilian, if you're from uh, Troy, Ilium is the, the name of Troy. Hmm. Which uh, gallant... Oh. Oopsie daisy. Um, the priests as... Um, oh, I should probably read that. Actually, it's important. So, uh, giving their instance there of fighting out of chariots of those de demigods, demigods and Ilian worthies did, uh, which, uh, blah, 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 uh, as bards their poets. Page 64. Uh, which carried in their public ensigns in memory of the great prince a hand holding many arrows or reeds and the English version of that author hath, which I hope is faithful, for at this present I have no other. We're going to start talking about princes. Uh, you'll notice, actually, which is really clever, you have a double V in that last arrow, uh, which is lovely. Uh, true, it seems, we like true, true it seems to be, um, were displanted, but for all this they cannot be charged with this superstition of imitating us, no print remaining among them of any European original. Pen Gwyn, a bird with a white head, uh, they say with that name upon the first discoveries beret such a secret and as it were retain possession for Europe which neither by book nor, fa nor fame nor any diligence of our age could ever be discovered. Um, found an eagle holding in one foot a bird at the other standing on a uh, cochineo tree of Chennai uh, the said tree or shrub growing out of a stone. This is the the bird with the uh, the little bird in its its foot. The eagle holding uh, one foot a bird. A lewd Turkish uh, ensign stands, which one day yet, O oh God, thou wilt raise by the martial arms of some zealous prince who shall bear it in the. Uh, canton of his royal coat of arms for perpetual memory of the conquest. Noble and excellent affections, I wish my labours could but give hope, the hope of a little spark, as unto their vertical point aspire. Uh, walk not, as saith Herodotus, uh, without their scepters or rods on the tops whereof some symbolical images or others as of a bird, a fish, a flower, a star, or the like were fixed. Uh, so I could rather incline to think them ensigns born after the manner in times of peace to distinguish the honourable from the vulgar. The terrible dove. Uh, well, he hath left his den like a strong lion seeking its prey, and their land will be made desolate by the sword of the enemy. 
This is page 40. Uh, Columbia means dove. Columbi means dove. Showing honourable marks upon shields and being among the most perfect bodies that are made according to symbolical doctrine. We're talking about marks and symbols still. May not stand accountable for willful waste. Willful waste. Uh, waste. Uh, by planting the eye at the true place of sight may give a fair and complete body in perspective. Uh, answerable in all the lineaments to the idea it's important which I follow uh, now I should say this is all just still set up uh, we need all set up I'm really sorry the setup is going to take some time uh, but I promise you these revelations will come and they will come fast and there will be quite a few of them uh, and preceding examples are dispersed among so many worlds and in so different uh, ages, but why make you a sudden pause or stand? Why you, why Amias, have you have you suddenly um, paused? And maybe the reason of your almost frowning silence. Oh, the the fear least that some seeming and affecting to seem wise will censure all our diligence, vain though employed in the proper subject of honour, which the most high and noble philosopher Plato rightly called uh, divinum. Uh, bonum and uh, trouble yourself uh, trouble not yourself good um sir amius but or if you notice you're going to start to see this a lot it's really clever he he breaks up uh, the words um to give it more meaning with the words that are contained so here you've got um i am a's effectively um which we'll we'll, we'll see later uh, for i have found out a new minerva shield for such sensors which will be more gracious uh, to them than any coat thereof called minerva shield such strange and costly delicacies fetch from the utmost bounds of outmost utmost bounds of the uh, Roman world was served in as that this one salad royale or, or salad uh, um, and favourite uh, Platus put in the mouth of uh, Sinceratus in his uh, Ponellus uh, that is to say notable deep pitchers and court jacks full of wine you have found out an arms uh, will bear please than the resplendent target of Pallas. Well, we're having Palais, um, Palais, I should say, uh, quite a lot. So Palais, Athena, Minerva. Well, I think this is referring to the Minerva's shield is referring to this book here, the Minerva Britanna. OK, uh, and we'll, we, we'll look at this book in a minute um, and Comparing it to um, one of the world's first uh, cookbooks, Greek cookbook, um, the Depnosophis of uh, Athenius. Athenius. Um, there's, there's more there as well, which I'll come to. Uh, the most renowned armories of books in all the world. Uh, so, uh, this is the Minerva Britannia. Uh, it's very cryptic, and there was a reason why uh, Sir Amius was saying, well, if we have a look, um, he, he doesn't want to be found out. Uh, so he's doing something very clever in a strange uh, salad royale of notable deep pictures and cork jacks full of wine. He doesn't want to be found out. Uh, so this book is very cryptic, and it's, it's a masterpiece. This is Minerva Britannia. Uh, or a garden of heroical devices furnished and adorned uh, with emblems and impressors, signs, of sundry natures, newly devised, moralised and published. Well, this book is actually all to do with armoury or heraldry. It is pretty much Edward de Vere telling you what he's doing, but he's doing it through emblems and impressors. Uh, and it's very witty and very clever and... Uh, very very deep uh, so we're going to have a look at this um, so the knights of the most noble order of the garter most excellent prince uh, signs princely showing here on 
uh, here in rather a will to desire to peerless a patronage. However, the world shall esteem them in regard of their rude and homely attire. Um, his majesty, your royal father, prescribed um, unto you, your guide as the golden branch uh, to Aeneas, to a virtuous and true uh, happy life. No one subject. Remember, nothing, no one. That's Edward de Vere. Uh, the epistle to the prince, this is called. And ever esteemed excellency of this kind of posy, the greatest princes of the world, in respect of so excellent a prince. Uh, the Aeneid 6. I like the number 6 because it's a perfect number. Um, if you're not familiar with the uh, the story of Aeneas. It's really important because Aeneas was a um, was a prince of Troy uh, who survived uh, the Trojan War, uh, and he is a hero that leads the remaining people uh, to to found a new homeland. So he's a prince of, of Troy uh, who founds a new uh, home for them. Uh, in Rome. So this is the origin, according to uh, Virgil, um, in his, in his uh, Aeneid, uh, is the, the origin of the Roman people from Aeneas. And there's something to do with a golden branch uh, when he visits the underworld and he, he tears off uh, a golden branch and two, and, and another one grows in its place. Um, so it's also a, that, that's, that's really important because it's about um, taking from antiquity and, and forming and founding uh, a new uh, a new people. Um, that's really important um, for, for what we're going to be talking about. So to the reader, we have a to the reader. I like to the readers. Greatness of the charge is no ordinary, a subject very rare, not an Englishman in our age that hath published any work of this kind. And they being, I doubt not, as ingenious and happy in their invention. Uh, valuing, that's an interesting spelling of veil valuing, um, with the double V, I'm saying veil because you may remember from the draft grants, you're gonna see lots of overlap. Edward, the black prince, it's very witty. Uh, Since their mer memory is fresh and many of their shields uh, yet scarce dry in the world, a hen sitting over her chickens. Well, this book is by apparently by Henry Peacham. A hen sitting over her uh, chickens. Uh, I, I might explain Peacham on, on Twitter because there's some brilliance to do with it. Uh, uh, known uh, dormit qui costed it. Um, to himself, a bit front, a double face placed upon the top of a column. Uh, sunburnt brains. Well, remember Apollo is the is other than the god of uh, poetry and artistic learning is is the god of the sun. Sunburnt brains are best invention. Whereas I have here dedicated many emblems to sundry and great personage, personages, uh, yet some to foreign princes. A transcendent dignity. Some of my private friends to whom I have in particular been, uh, since I have no other mean than by word to show a thankful mind toward them towards them uh, to feed at once both the mind and the eye by expressing mystically and doubt and doubtfully our disposition so he wants that doubt uh, changeth his silver into gold uh, value uh, rather better happening abated but only for thy pleasure and recreation. So he's doing all of this for our pleasure and recreation and our learning, uh, I should say. Uh, so we also have some interesting things here. We have um, upon the author to his Minerva. We've got this a, a few times here. In arms, uh, in arms, so it's telling you uh, that gainst enraged Mars could stand, uh, fleet his soul, arm could defend. Uh, we knowst thou art Minerva, that alike holds art and arms can speak as well as strike. So hopefully you're starting to see that we're talking about arms, nobility, uh, quite a lot. 
Uh, that's because this book is all about arms, um, which I'll show you. Uh, upon the author, all eyes behold, and yet not all alike. Straight ways uh, foreseemeth harms. Um, now, <sighs> we need to talk about equivocation. So he defines this in the back. Um, he actually defines the word equivocal in the back of the elements of armories. Just for those uh, sceptics who go, oh, this is you just reading. Well, it's deliberately equivocal. OK, and look at what he says here. An equivocal word is that which containeth more signification than one or that which is in the sense or meaning thereof doth equally extend itself as well to one as to the other, as the word arms in our vulgar use, thereof equally signify those parts of our bodies so-called, or weapons or tokens of honours. Now look at what he does, uh, tokens of honour, and with an aspiration, which in uh, Hellenic or deceit, in the accent, harms. Okay? Foresight foreseeth harms. Do you get it? This book is all to do with arms. And he's telling you it is equivocal. Eyes may deluded be. Without, uh, without words, I uh, first view and mark this book. With inward eye, uh, then on the matter look. So with inward eye. On the matter look foresee the author's care and little ease to invent to imprint and publish for delight and who's this by yep william sagar garter principal king of arms it's by william sagar someone who has uh, written a letter in the front of the elements of armories. William Sagar, the principal king of arms. We also have another one, a vision upon this, his Minerva. Methought I saw him a dead of silent night. Important because night is black. It's, it's the colour of nothing, isn't it? Nothing is the absence of all colour. Um, which is black, uh, upon whose ruins fate a nymph in white uh, rendering her hair of wiry gold who mourned or for uh, the fall of that fair city burned. This was the genius of the ancient Troy, so grieved to see the Briton should enjoy her palace whom she held and honoured so. Just notice all the capitalised words there in that are standing out. Um, he, he uses capitals deliberately to alert you to things. Genius, Troy, remember Troy means Ilium, Britain, Palais. Okay, so we've got our uh, our important keywords there. Uh, to etern to uh, eternize uh, eternize her, uh, since she did infuse her Enthian soul into the English muse. Where Enthian, uh, it means divinely inspired, wrought up. To enthusiasm. This is our tenth muse, Apollo. Apollo is sometimes called the tenth muse because he hung around uh, with the muses so much. Uh, so our English muse. And just notice those monkeys there. Uh, now, uh, I'm not sure how much you know already about uh, the birth of Palais, um, but according to the uh, Homeric hymn, according to Homer, uh, Athena sprang up quickly from the immortal head. Uh, of Zeus and stood before Zeus, uh, who holds uh, the uh, Aegis, Aegis uh, shaking a, sh a sharp spear. She's born fully formed from the head of Zeus, shaking a spear. Okay, and you'll see within uh, the uh, Minerva itself. You'll see this. You'll see um, uh, Athena or Palais. Uh, being born when uh, issueth Palais forth and much ado and you can see uh, that whoever's uh, cutting the head of Zeus there is wearing a mask interestingly uh, there's quite a lot there um, and then here on the we, Palais features uh, Minerva the Latinized version uh, features quite uh, a lot throughout this book so though Homer did invent it long ago 
uh, and where we go take Pale still along so she is leading Odysseus here Ulysses or Odysseus she's leading uh, the wise to guide our feet our ears and lavish tongue um, and here's another picture of Minerva here she's been caught in a net uh, but her spear uh, sticks out of this net I just noticed the two people that I've caught are one has got two faces uh, and there's plenty of v's there's a double v on the other person sure there's lots there so i'm just going to uh, quickly clear this up for you now why william shakespeare well it's actually fairly easy let's go for the straightforward one uh, genius troy britain uh, palais uh, so there's our troy our ilium ilium remember means troy uh, we've got our double v that we've already met so there is our william uh, oh, but Glenn, there's, a, there's another L in there. Well, yes, there are, but he likes double L's in true original copies. So there's our William, and we have our Palais uh, Athena or Merva, Minerva, uh, and that gives us our Shakespeare. She was uh, born brandishing that spear uh, which she was shaking. So that's uh, that's where we are um, there. Uh, so let's uh, let's start. Let's start reading. Just remember, this is very equivocal and there's a lot of oh, there's so many levels to the meaning that's going on um, here. Uh, he describes this as a pond as deep as hell. Uh, and believe me, um, it really is. So there we go. A secret arm outstretched from the sky. There we go. He's told you like the first, the, the opening line, a secret arm yeah, he's told you exactly what he's doing. This is equivocal, remember. He's talking about uh, a coat of arms. And you're going to see frequent coat of arms uh, within the Minerva itself. You will see frequent uh, coat of arms. Uh, when Trojan youth went out into the field, shield devoid of charge from ensign of the same. These are all um, like field and charge. These are all words which we'll see um, from armory. Now, if we return to the Shakespeare monument, uh, you're also going to start to see, oh, there's a skull there, and there's a skull there, or oh, there's some columns there, there's some columns there. Uh, so you're going to start to see there's quite a lot of overlap, and of course, our arms. I really love this one, because you have uh, your your flags um, here, um, which again are signs, who not of father's acts ambitious are, but of the brave achievements of their own, thus as their ensigns folded up, unshown. And that's what we have here. We've got folded up, wrapped up uh, meaning in these signs. Uh, and of course, some Ovids. Now, all of the, um, the footnotes and the sign notes are important and they are deep because they're referring to other meaning. You have to work for them. You've got to look them up um, to understand what's going on. Uh, so where does this come from? Well, this means birth and ancestry. And that which we have not ourselves achieved, we can scarcely call our own. Uh, and what do we have here? Um, but wisdom ever armed with foresights that uh, valour uh, of rateth valour at her weight in gold. Uh, we also have at the bottom um, a proverb well known in low countries and bids us arm when least we think of knocks for foes asleep, they say the devil rocks. OK, so we've got a lot of meaning wrapped up in these signs. Uh, just more proof that this book is about arms. Like uh, midway through, you've got like the second part and you've very clearly got quite a magnificent coat of arms there, uh, which is very important. Also notice uh, this lion there. Very important. Um the line is very important. Uh, 101, page 101, we have uh, this uh, armoured arm uh, with a flag here. So to you, great prince who little need be known. And if you have a look at the flag there, you can see in the centre, you, you have something that I can't really see. I can't, can't really see what that is, is it? Lion, is it a person? What is it? I don't know. Uh, but me or my worthy posy, uh, worthless posy, uh, since those admired virtues, virtues of your own, have made you an object of the world's wi wide eye. 
Um, this most, and if we have a look at this, uh, most of these are in Latin, so it's nice when you find one that's in English. Uh, this most noble prince, uh, beside his admiration, admirable knowledge in all learning and the languages, hath excellent skill in music. Uh, Mi Mr. Uh, Dooland hath many times showed me ten or twelve uh, several sets of songs for his chapel uh, of this own uh, com uh, composing. Ten's really important. Tenth Apollo, ten, really important. Um, it's a number that often represents De Beer. He was born on the twelfth. Um, this one's lovely. Fields and silence. Here's some fields and silence. And as thy birth in the city, uh, thou should bid adieu. Well, where chaos and confusion we see. Oh, chaos, remember a quote about chaos. A body severed in a thousand parts. A body severed in a thousand parts. Uh, some shady grove. A wood near Athen Athens wherein uh, uh, wherein the philosophers used to study. <laughs> now, this, now we're going to get a bit crazy, OK? Um, doth silver seven slide or avon courts? Well, that's referring to two rivers. The seven and the Avon. And there is Stratford. Stratford upon Avon. Hmm. There should thou fit a at long desired uh, the, sorry, there should thou sit at long desired rest and think thyself above a monarch blessed. Got some oars there. I'll explain this in time. I'm just setting it up. Silver Swan is found. Uh, that shout a thousand winged musicians hear geometry or wisheth thou to learn the rules of numbering for the greatest part uh, country swains so still the art with them entire remains if loves thy health prefer the country air nor princes richest arras may compare uh, with a small plot. Well, what's an arras? It's a rich tapestry used for concealment. This is obviously referring to Stratford upon Avon, um, in which something is being concealed or used for concealment, or as an arras. Uh, with all, as in some rare lined books, we find here painted lectures of God's sacred will. The most uh, disturb our sweet tranquility. What's this mean? Live for yourself. And flee far away from big names. This is someone who doesn't want a big name. To flee far away from big names. But muse beware, lest we aspire too high. Just remind you this. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. So, where's the best place to put a coat of arms? Uh, thy champion too, whose arts are uh, famed as far as was Tydides for his deeds of war. We know thou art Minerva, that alike uh, holds art of arms, can speak as well as strike. So the deeds of war, where's the best place to put a coat of arms? This warlike helm. And the answer is... Warwickshire. That's one of the reasons anyway. There's, a, there's an even better reason. Uh, but one of the reasons he's chosen to put a coat of arms in the most relevant place, Warwickshire. Brilliant. Uh, so let's continue uh, with the elements of armoury. Uh, to a subject ourselves to the worst tribunal of the world, mere popularity. The rise or fall of men's opinions concerning things which borrow not their volume, uh, value by estimation. Enjoy the secret nourishment of noble thoughts without imprudently uh, uh, flighting the present sway, though of most corrupted judgments or with our f uh, frailty uh, contemning ourselves uh, for... Da -da -da thereby to lay out our time upon a parcel of virtue or honour, so as we may see a Mount Bank. Now, Mount Bank is a person who, uh, from a platform in public places, 
um, attracts and influences an audience by telling stories. A charlatan, so to say. Um, t uh, fashion gain an opinion by retail thereof, uh, they're above our value, but really embrace it for ourselves and earnestly favour and foster it in others that it call, uh, calls require we may afford to our country and to other our obligers true offices and not deceivable. Uh, so this is someone who doesn't want mere popularity. Okay, uh, the secret nourishment of noble thoughts. Um, he, so he is being a mountbank, so to say. Um, he, he's deceiving so he can um, do this for other people. And how happy were the nation that had as many noble in parts as in marks. But it is far otherwise God knows whose uh, and the work of sovereign princes the Reformation is, and not of a satyr, not of a satyr, wherein uh, I have no kind of skill and much less will. No kind of skill and much less will. Uh, that I create these elements of myself. Mathematical. Well, you're already seeing there's quite a lot of references uh, to the elements of geometry. Believe me, there's quite a few, and I mean direct references to the elements of geometry, which we'll look at in a bit. Uh, who first devised grammar? Well, again, I've talked in the past about elementaire, um, which also uh, is very, very important because um, he's standardising English uh, language. Um, and the condition of being in these several subject matters, though to us eclipsed and shadowed, much less ought it be uh, conceived that in the father, the final, in the father, uh, and final prosecution of this affair, I ought to be tied to quotations where nev uh, never author hath gone before, seeing frequent and field observation is the only proper key to enlarge these elements out of their chaos and imprisonment and not variety of readings where for anything is known to me on the contrary all books fail which whether it shall happen to be imputed as an youthly over hardiness or reputed for praiseworthiness i must put in hazard okay so uh, forget not what you delivered in the beginning and think it worth the labour to approve uh, my memory unto you therein by repetition arms speaking in the vulgar and equivocal extension of the word were you said certain painted hereditable hereditable and um, armorial marks of honour by which gentlemen were distinguished first from the vulgar and then one from the other and gentlemen uh, notice this idea again um so Let's start. Blazon is the description of arms and their uh, appurtenances by the received terms or other apt expression of things by words. Uh, we have what he says is the continent and the content. He's borrowing familiar words as these are such terms in armory or do you only borrow them to express yourself? Borrow them only as I shall perhaps be enforced to do many others which all men that write either new things or newly of old matters will not only pardon but approve. So he's borrowing things such as names. Uh, what do you call the consonant in armories? Um, uh, the very same which the word importeth and no other. Uh, this is the shield containing part of, of itself considered without any mixture or mark uh, now uh, the shape itself which is really interesting is in the shape of a triangle uh, the reason for that i didn't know this is because it's to do with the body of man um it, so it carries a three-cornered or trike uh, tri tri figure uh, the body of man decreasing as it were in latitude from the shoulders downwards i, I thought that was really interesting um so gerard lee who we will talk about later, have done very commendably, 
commendably, as well because we are Christians, as also because his discourse or book being of arms, born and how they were to be correctly blazed. Uh, that sign uh, in Christian armour is most honourable. Uh, now, this is really interesting. He says, apparently, I'm not sure whether this is true or not, um, that our English flag actually comes from uh, great Constantine, um, who therefore in silver boss of this imperial shield on his shield, bear a cross of uh, Nicotia's, uh, Conat oh, my pronunciation of some of these words is shocking. Uh, forgive me. Nicotia's of Coniatus writes something like that. Um, he has a red cross on the shield. I'm not sure whether this is true or not, um, but it's really interesting if it is true. Uh, so, he has referred to Gerard Lee's uh, The Ascedents of Armoury. Now, um, we're. I'm just going to introduce this book now. Um, I'm kind of going to interlace the two books as we start to talk about uh, some of these uh, elements of armories. So I need to introduce this book uh, now. So this is The Ascedents of Armoury. Uh, it is done very, very similarly to how the elements of armoury. You have two people in interlocution. We have uh, Lee and Jared. Now the name, the author of this book happens to be Jared Lee. So, uh, God save you, uh, Heer Hort. So, a Heer Hort, uh, named ancient Heer Hort, who have made distinction between the gentle and the ungentle. So a Heer Hort is a herald, effectively. Uh, as there is much difference between virtue and vice, and Lee, a Caligat uh, knight, and un, um, so, so a common uh, person who serves, um, has become a knight, um, wears these kind of thigh-high boots, uh, is a, a, dis a distinguishing uh, mark of, of them. Um, and here halt, uh, so I am a Caligate knight, and understanding ye are a here halt, come to learn those things that you are bound to teach me, that is, to blaze arms, with all the terms thereto appertaining with my service to my sovereign, and if I were not bound to do it by mine oath, yet to courtesy I will teach you, and because ye are willing. Uh, so, as I said, the author leaves off his name uh, of this uh, book it's the author is apparently Jared Lee so he leaves it off because this little book ought to follow the matter whereof it beareth the title which shall be done in familiar talk between Jared the Heerhort and Lee the Caligate Knight um, he then will begin his book Name of Blazon but to the effect first I will begin with the most precious metal gold otherwise known as ore, uh, in heraldic terms. Gold is very important. Um, and again, how many soever I set forth, I mean to name very few, and such they are as be gone from the world, of whom I am uh, sure to be unthanked, um, Wherefore, most humbly, I beseech your honours uh, to uh, deign to be patrons uh, of this, may this my work against the middle fingers pointings. <laughs> it's quite funny, this. Um, to the <laughs> of this my work against the middle finger pointings of the ungentles, uh, diverse. Deserved un into uh, three unequal parts. I'm going to have some coffee. Oh, this is going to be long. Woo! So, uh, first whereof, so there's three ungentles that we need to talk about. Uh, first whereof are ungentle, uh, such be they as rather swear arms than bear arms, uh, who of negligence stop Mustard pots, remember that, mustard pots, with their father's degrees. Um, those of you who know 
uh, that reference will enjoy this already. Uh, or otherwise uh, abuse them. Second, uh, sort are ungentle gentlemen who being enhanced to honour by their fathers or whom, though it were to their own worship, yet can they not keep so much money from the dice as to make worshipful obs uh, obsequies uh, for their sad fathers with any point of armoury, but despise the same because those, uh, say they, those his arms were purchased for slips. Much of for money, I think that probably is. Most of these desire the title of worship, but none do the work, the deeds that appertaineth thereunto. And of these that run so far as will not turn, old women will say, such youth will have their swing, and it be but in the halter. That halter is really important. Uh, but God keep them uh, from that. The third sort and worst of all are neither... Uh, her gentle ungentle or ungentle gentle but very stubble cause uh, be neither doers sufferers or well speakers of honours tokens as of late one of them was called uh, to worship a city within the province of Middlesex unto whom the hearhawk came and him faulted with uh, joy of his new office requesting to see uh, his coat uh, who called unto him his maid commanding her to fetch his coat, which being brought was of cloth gardened uh, with uh, Burgundian guards of bare velvet, uh, well bordified on the, on the half placard and uh, quote, quoted in the four quarters. The four quarters, yeah. Um, Lo, quoth the man to the here hort, here it is, if ye will buy it, ye shall have time uh, of payment as first to pay half in hand and the rest by and by and with much boast he said he wear not the same since it it came last from John uh, Sean uh, Sean if you think about shearing a sheep past tense Sean uh, the hearhorts uh, being uh, somewhat moved said the hearhort being somewhat moved said I neither asked you for this coat sheep coat or hog's coat but my meaning was to have seen your coat of arms arms quoth he i would have good legs for my arms are indifferent this man was a horseman but not of the lightest sort or such as are called light horsemen for saith the hearhort uh, such have feet and cannot go legs they have but they cannot stand uh, let they certainly cannot stand let them uh, be like such as despise all gentlemen and evermore be infected with gout i could show you of the end of him but because of this little book ought to follow the matter and we've seen the rest um humbly beseeching you to understand uh, you judge and that is what i ask you to do please do try and understand this stuff uh, before you judge it please do watch this video in its entirety before you judge uh, some of the things that i'm trying to say um so uh, back to the continent the matter of armories uh, so uh, let's start talking about it now uh, the background of the shield is called the field now uh, a charge is any emblem or device occupying the field of the escutcheon the shield so, for instance, our lion there is our charge um, and the background is our field. Um, but he, he's been talking in terms of continent and content. Um, the matter of armory is to wheat the field and the lion. And you must understand once for all that I speak, not anywhere of arms as it is only painted on a paper. But do always suppose a subject shield. Now, I really like fields. Uh, from some of the previous work I've been doing because of Richard Field, who first printed uh, The Art of English Poesy um, and some other quite important books, uh, such as some of Shakespeare's books. Uh, you taught me before uh, that continent was the shield or thing containing, and now you say that the field and the lion are the content, uh, which being so that the content and the continent, because the field contains the lion, the field contains the lion, 
becomes the field and here shows much of mist. That's from Hamlet at the ending of the play. Uh, or there are two continents, one which comprehends the whole armories and the other which contains a part. Oh, remember it? As well of languages, as of differing hearts, a body severed in a thousand parts. Bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royally. My assertion is true. For the field that is the superficies is not is no part of the continent in my meaning, but it is self-contained as the lion is. May I remind you, uh, in arms the lion is to be preferred because he is king of all the beasts. He is most royal. So, the elements then are um, the common grounds. Uh, and beginnings of armories. They are, uh, well, so I'll skip this, but you can see the lines, lines, colours, number, position. So here we have lines, colour, number and position. And, um, and we, I'm going to structure uh, the next kind of chunk of this by looking at these three things. Lines, colour, number and position. And that's what we're going to do in specific reference uh, to Shakespeare's Code of Arms. So lines. Uh, the mystical chain in which all four are linked together. I cannot uh, sub we slip here uh, sub uh, anigmate, uh, which means below the riddle. So let's get below and start to get below the riddle. Uh, we have some lines. They can either be uh, straight or, or bendy uh, or wavy. Uh, again, I should I should say wavy. So it's straight. And they're either direct or oblique. Uh, you can see uh, on the left we have the uh, direct. Uh, oblique is at an angle. Okay, but oblique also means neither perpendicular nor par uh, well at an angle, neither perpendicular nor parallel to a given line or surface. Uh, but it also means in rhetoric, indirect. The original words of a speaker or writer are assimilated to the language of the reporter. That's important. Um, partly, or defence of himself for publishing his works that shall remain as if they were not published, though published. Okay, uh, someone who's publishing his works, but they remain as if they weren't published, though published, so not published under his own name. Now look here, because this is really important. There's an error. Now often he reveals things in his books through errors, uh, and here you have two e's. Okay. Uh, you have Eusus speaking twice. The second he really should be Amius. Um, and you know that because you know, well right, Sir Eustace, uh, how in a few words to demand enough. So what he's really doing here with this deliberate error is he's giving you an example of oblique speech, right? Because uh, Eustace here, E, um, very fitting use of E there, uh, is saying... Amius's words. Uh, your question is perplexed and cannot be satisfied without some diligence. Uh, first, therefore, of memorial lines in general. Now, this is also really important uh, because the author of this book is using oblique speech by putting his words into the words of the character. So it's funny that the characters themselves are doing that. Um, and also at the bottom there, you've got uh, IE and also what happens if you... Um, what happens if you were to rotate an M 180 degrees? You heard it have a double V. So we have our uh, direct um, and our oblique. This line is upright and this line is oblique. It's forming an angle um, to either side, two different angles um, to the side of the shield. Uh, so uh, the Pertransient uh, goes through the middle of the shield, that's the one on the left, and the pertingent is uh, going to be the one going from either side of the shield. Your first, the quality of lines, uh, pertransient as those which are of most honour and state. So the pertransient, that upright line, is of most honour and state. Your pertransient, uh, per, uh, pertransient, the chief 
of the lines entire do either touch some one angle on the shield or touch not none of them touching two or more so your pertingent your oblique is touching two or more uh, different angles because one of these if you have a look is curved one of these is straight in the lines besides that it's touching okay so uh, we also which double lines are parallel or follow in armories so if you have a look which side uh, one by the other without meeting according to the true property of parallels which may in other words be called Gemini's uh, Geminels or twins so if you have a look at Shakespeare's coat of arms I'm sure you can see now that we have two oblique uh, lines but these two oblique lines are parallel yes our twins or our Gemini and he even defines this in the back of his book Geminels twins pairs matches or like so he's defining that in his uh, table of hard words at the end of the book as well now why is that important well because in Shakespeare uh, in so this is uh, one of these that's from that's Venus and Adonis uh, you can see we have uh, some Geminis we have these twins and also uh, from the first folio we have uh, these twins we have quite a lot of these mirroring images these twins these parallels and these Geminis uh, I also need to alert you to this. What people are pointing to is very important. So if you have a look at what these two Geminis are pointing to, they are pointing to your double V. Yeah, and that V is being formed by the branches of this plant. Okay, can you see that V there? Two double Vs. It's really important. Now, these um, are two uh, oblique uh, parallels. Uh, well, they form what is called a bend. This is a bend. You can see uh, our bend across our shield here. Uh, this is a bend dexter um, because it's uh, going to the right uh, shoulder of the shield. If you think the best way to do this is if you if you remember dissecting a heart in school, um, then it's the same uh, thing here. This is actually the right side because if you were to hold this shield, it would be the right side uh, of your shield. So this is the right. This is a bend dexter, okay, um, to the going up to the right shoulder. Uh, and it's also interestingly the fourth honourable ordinary. I know this because I looked it up. Um, this is a great website. Really liked it. International Heraldry. Uh, dot com it was great. And I also like whoever made heraldsnet.org is brilliant. Uh, I think that's such a great website, so thank you so much. That was really useful in, in some of the research I've been doing. So you can see on Shakespeare's coat of arms, we have a bend dexter. Okay, now, ha, in the ascendants, um, we, we have something quite interesting that happens. Uh, we have quite a few uh, bends that we talk about. Um, but interestingly, there's, um, there's a bit of an error bit of an error on, on one of the uh, on one of the pages because he beareth argent a bend sinister hold on hold on glenn you just told me that was a ben dexter uh, that's because that is actually a ben dexter uh, that is not a bend sinister and someone who's written a book uh, on armory isn't going to make that mistake um you just notice the colors there it's saying uh, it's uh, sinister azure azure is blue so it should have a B there. It doesn't. It has an A and a V. So there's another error there as well. There's, there's a couple of errors. But he actually does tell you this. Um, uh, because so uh, for it is a great fault in a herehort to be over hasty and blazon. And then uh, our colour gate not says, uh, I know what is meant by bend sinister. It's just the spelling there, the Y instead of the I. I know, I know what is meant by bend sinister. Why are you telling me this, Jared? What is your opinion thereof, Lee? Here that beareth, uh, he that beareth it is a bastard. A bastard, quoth you? I never taught you that. Who that learned you so to term it? Uh, did give you wrong instruction. Count it, therefore, an error of arms, that which with as much speed as you may, I would you should forget. Know that this containeth as much in breadth as the bend... Uh, as the 
as the dexter bend stuff uh, there's a, some brilliance here that we're exploring in a bit um and what time as it shall please the prince that uh, the same may be enlarged or broken as uh, followeth and then we have a broken um bend here both both with a's on so that's lines we're going to leave um, for the time being and now have a look at colours uh, i really like this i don't know who did it, it was on wiki uh, uh, wikimedia commons thank you uh, to whoever um, put this on uh, i think it's it's great so well done although I, I'm, I'm the the blue and the red shouldn't really be there um but thank you uh, for doing that it's lovely um so uh, chapter 24 um amius uh, the beautiful and vital element of colour is in hand, but before either uh, with Plato or anyone we define which colour is best, let us not unskillfully overslip the handling of such matters as ought necessarily proceed. So, um, for that as lines give them shape or circumscription, so with colour, as hath been said, they neither have life nor distinction. Uh, liking it chiefly of those who being principal and colours as it were of themselves principal principal and the colours as it were of themselves are withal most different one from another we deal only with such as are most noble and useful which are seven so there's seven uh, key colours which we'll look at for that bearing of things in their proper colours uh, should be best as it is, I confess, somewhat commonly held. So it is a common error that but among the commons, uh, because those of the upper house of skill know it, is far otherwise the reason of arms and nature being so different. A blue or green lion, which are as in proper colours for the beast as can be, are a better bearing than a natural or a proper colour. Proper means natural. Uh, so that as most it can be said that creature is best born or born in most dignity, which is advanced in the predominant colour thereof, um, which also I must demur upon, for I believe it not yet, and the reason will appear elsewhere, for this is but by the way, which then are the seven chief armorial colours i'm troubled at your question as not knowing which to set down first the order in naming them right well the first thing to uh, realize is this again is about symbolic philosophy colors have meaning i'm just going to quickly well let allow him to demonstrate this to you actually uh, colors and colors rather than other are vulgarly appropriated to special uses as symbolical to them so for instance a bridegroom wed in yellow that is seldom seen i have not uh i've, I've not seen as of yet a bride bridegroom in yellow to mourn in black is a uh is a national custom uh, as for the grave we do not see typically people uh, mourning in hot pink um and uh, to mourn in black is a national custom as for the grave and civil to go for them um or triumph no man will usurp his majesty's known colours of yellow and red. So no man uh, will usurp his majesty's known colour of yellow and red. Uh, so last, so the present matter is of the order. What what order of colours in, um, in are really important? I will define these colours for you in a second. <laughs> um, so uh, is among the matters very diverse. There's, um, there's a differing opinion on the order of colours here. Uh, so Gerard Lee, uh, who we like, uh, who simplify hath the most and best collection for Blazon, and notwithstanding his uh, Pythagoras, uh, Pythagoras, Pythagoras, oh goodness, I'm getting tired now, is affecting certain numbers. Uh, that's referring to the elements of geometry and a very important uh, Pythagorean proof. Um, which I'd encourage you to uh, read. A uh, good choice in matters of antiquity doth best apply himself to the capacity of a learner who is ignorant in no other good letters. So he's saying if you want to learn, my suggestion would be read Gerard Lee. Um, so what we have here is um, 
Bolton uh, has given us uh, three different authors and their uh, their ordering of these colours. And I just want you to be aware of this, which is our S, that is our sable, our black, uh, and where they are in the in the order, in the ranking. So you can see that Lee has his uh, sable the highest. And there's a few other variations there. Uh, you also notice that uh, Jules, which is red, um, is uh, at the same level, but not in Upton, not in Upton. Um, and yeah, you might notice uh, we have uh, his his colours here, Lee's colours. So, uh, or uh, Argent, the, the white or the silver. Uh, white's often taken to be silver, and uh, jewels, which is our uh, our red. So Lee also has the colour scheme uh, of Edward de Beers' coat of arms. Uh, so let's have a look at uh, what Bolton, Edward de Vere, um, in this book, places uh, these uh, colours. So Bolton's order. We have ore, gold at the top. Uh, we have argent and silver, uh, sable, sorry, argent which is silver and sable which is black uh, on the same level, on the same rung. Argent and black on the same rung. OK, that's quite interesting. Uh, there's the previous orders just to remind you of where other people place them. So Bolton has placed Sable the highest up in third position. OK, um, I have worthily restored Sable to the third. OK, uh, we also have Jules, uh, which is red and Azure, which is blue. Um, we're using French names uh, for these colours, Vert, which is green and purple, uh, purple, uh, purple uh, which is purple. Uh, you also notice the sun at the top. We like this sun because, as I'm saying, uh, De Vere is represented by Apollo. We like uh, the sun. The key thing I want you to notice is that Argent and Sable are on the same level. Uh, this is really important because if we have a look at Shakespeare's coat of arms, well, have a look at what we have here, but the three colours that Bolton has put in order are the colour scheme of Shakespeare's coat of arms or Argent and Sable. Three most important colours, three most important colours of Shakespeare's coat of arms. Uh, so if we have a look at what um, Gerard Lee does in his book, uh, right at the end of the book we have a useful and helpful um, table of colours. Now we call the colours of armoury uh, tricking, that's putting the, the letters that represent the colours, um, tricking. Um, so the way to understand tricking, now I'm just going to give you 10 seconds to see whether you can spot uh, the mistake. Oh, I have some coffee. Okay, so if you said England with an E on the end, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to accept that. Now, the figure uh, from The Art of English Posey, the figure of addition is really important, but I'm not going to accept the additional L, the additional E or the additional E on, on second. I'm not going to um, accept that. But that is a hint. You see it? So what if I do this? This is uh, Lee's, um, so the same Lee, the same Lee, Gerard Lee's uh, uh, ranking in... Uh, Edmund Bolton's book. You may be able to see that he's accidentally missed one off. He's missed off, given that's in fifth position in Lee, he's missed off Sable. Okay? And that is because uh, that's the figure of subtraction. It's not just the figure of addition and adding those conceited E's that's important. It's also can be as important what you leave out, what you miss, the figure of subtraction. So let's just have a look at uh, some of the uh, shields in, in, in Lee's book that have been tricked. You can see this nice uh, lion here, A and V, uh, a, a nice uh, a boar there, a unicorn, argent and sable, sable, unicorn and argent fields, uh, 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 looks like a greyhound there, sable, 
um, on on a vert, a green field, uh, and then we get to an ox. Oh, that's interesting. We seem to have missed off uh, some of the. Uh, the well, where's the tricking? And that's probably because you can't trick an ox. Or if we're being slightly more uh, cunning, we might go. Actually, Glenn, if you have a look at his joint there, there's a there's a V, which would make that then a a green a green ox. If we're being a little bit more cunning, and if it is a green ox, then this might be important. Being so different, a blue or green with an E on the end, figure of addition, lion, uh, which are as improper colours for the beast as can be, are of better bearing than a natural. Now, your natural, just note here, your natural is your proper colour. Now, we've already met a proper, if you remember way back uh, at the beginning of this. Our proper is our natural. And there it is from draft one. Gold on a bend, sable, a spear of the first the point steeled, not argent, but proper. It's natural colour. And a green ox is better than a proper colour ox. So, to return here, I will tell you, nothing is more plain as I. That's because nothing is I. Edward de Vere is nothing. Suppose then that black is, as it were, the basis of or pedestal of colours and white the crown point or top. Uh, there being a kind of levity beside purity in one and and heaviness or obscurity in the other. White, according to books and reason, being capable of all colours and black uh, containing all. Well, black actually uh, is the absence of all colours, as we now know. Um, and if the speculation we may feign a uh, suresome and uh, the awesome, uh, an increase and decrease, an absence an ascents or descents, um, an aspiring, and a rest. So they are effectively your extremes. So if we have a look there, we have our gold, which is in first place, our ore, our argent in second place. Argent, again, he, he does explain this is represented uh, often by white. So we have argent and sable either side of that scale. They are extremes. They are opposites. The polarity, they are opposites of each other. And as the final cause of arms is one principal rule of excellency in arms, white being one extreme, black the other. Moreover, uh, the final cause of arms born uh, openly in the fields or elsewhere being manifestations where black, uh, for the solemn deepness thereof, is a colour altogether as far to be seen, if not farther uh, than white. Uh, from which cause also black uh, and bright in, com in composition are held the sovereign princely superlatives. Our understanding, therefore, must necessarily uh, be convinced that in the armorial placings of colours, sable next to metals is best. No herald, as I take it, doubting that these, the present armories of the Roman Empire, just just note uh, this shield and what is on that shield. That's very important. You'll meet that again. 10-4. Uh, I like 10-4 uh, um, for many reasons, particularly if you've watched my last video. Uh, the field is all a millet of uh, five point sable. We have a star, much like the star on Edward de Vere's coat of arms. Uh, and the star is sable on a field of ore. Black on gold. Mm. This is as much to be understood, uh, understand as uh, spots. Uh, okay, not important. Um, upon occasions of this double headed bird, which you will meet in the rudeness of my novice, it seems monstrous and unnatural. Uh, we move on to chat 28. I like number 28 because it's the second perfect number. So chapter 28, just look at this, after 16, 16 Delabracht under Edward the First, 17. Edward the First, 17. Uh, the master easily puts on points of these exceptions of honourable additions. Oh, I'm sure he has. Uh, so uh, this is the only spear that is in Edmund, Ed, Edmund Bolton's 
uh, from Edward de Vere's uh, book. This is the only spear. Okay, uh, nothing private, but national. Well, nothing. Remember, nothing is the the colour black. It's a sable. Uh, was a novice in arms without having achieved any honourable uh, note, and was a no vice. It was a <laughs> but a no vice. Very good. Very, very good. Well done, Edward Bevere. Any honourable note, and therefore his shield was white. Uh, as for uh, Alexander's uh, uh, agrospides, who were uh, kind of honoured warriors, um, uh, uh, was seen their writers' uh, ostentation. Uh, uh, so their banners were blue, um, effectively. Um, no excellencies, but in extremes, white and black. Okay, so uh, symbolic argument, signs of service valiantly performed, uh, of heroic virtues. Their coat was blue. That's really important. I'm not ignorant um, that for more honourable sake, uh, a whole coat hath been given to a name as an augmentation beside the original coat. Uh, if we have a look at this one, so that was the only the only spear there talking about uh, the blue um, of this and the golden spear. If we have a look at this one, uh, we have a shield here with, again, if you notice, an invisible hand, okay, much like this one, holding up a spear. And at the top of the spear is that heart. Um, and on the other side, we seem to have a black phoenix. So we've got a gold hand, gold arm, and a black phoenix on either side, which both are quite important. And just note the a more and the interlacing of words within words. You can see that a lot. So, oh, who can enough admire the truly, in, truly ingenious and liberal state of minds in divine antiquity, in the uh, rear regard, um, as it were, last. I think it's a, a Gerard pun there, um, potentially. Um, it was last hope of battle appears the example of Emion's, uh, which, uh, whatsoever it means, Della Brecht. Oh, we remember um, Della Brecht, don't we? And, and this is um, which, whatsoever it means. Well, this is page 167. And you may remember uh, 1616 and 17. Uh, Della Brecht, we have our Edward the First, seventeen, our Edward de Vere, the seventeenth Earl of Oxford. Uh, certainly, I deny not, but that a gentleman in exercises of arms may use may upon a private conceit as Della Brecht. Not only, well, that's definitely a private conceit. Um, Della Brecht not only paint his banner and shield, but his whole armour with vermilion red, or any other colour leaving off his own coat of arms for the time either upon vow singularity or otherwise geraldine's gerald uh, but could see uh, but could he show no other nor more significance note of honour he would never among the learned be registered gentleman of arms 40 40. 40 is a very important number, which you'll see a lot of uh, as we go forward. Of added their, uh, the, those golden ornaments, which now do shine therein, but I can no more call the one or the other a coat of arms without extreme impropriety um, and abuse of speech. Uh, then a plain piece of virgin wax, a seal, and a sheet of unwritten uh, paper or a maid or wife, I believe um, someone used Shakespeare's coat of arms in a piece of wax, actually. Um, grounds of knowledge of those two colours, one must be a metal contrary to which grounds, though there may, may be some examples um, even in antiquity. So, by the general test of armories for metal is their vegetative soul, and as nobody can move of it, itself without life so no armories are proper without it uh, quickening clearness well we want some clearness now just to remind you uh, the proper uh, from draft one there again 
Uh, we also have proper use, uh, uh, well, quite a few times in draft one and in draft three. So that's four times the word uh, proper. So by the general test of armory spawn, metal is their vegetative soul and as nobody can move it self without life. So no armories are proper. OK, I conceive nothing except uh, ye bear name for thus you said a single notes are no concords, no proportions in music, no single colours have no uh, armorial harmony or alliances of one colour with another. Uh, but also in the quantities and proportions uh, themselves, wherein they stand honoured with no less diversity than the countenance of man. Sorry, anything else I need to say? Nope. OK, so. Two metals, gold and silver, uh, black, E on the end there, green, E on the end, figure of addition there, important words, uh, but you must not so term them, um, wherefore, so you mustn't term these gold, silver, black, green, red, um, or blue, uh, whereof I will set their proper names within every of their scutcheons, and, call, uh, and for to call them by these names it were shame amongst the Heerhorts, and not worthy the name of Blazon, but to the effect, first I will begin with the most precious metal, gold so we mustn't term them silver and herein is a bit of a problem we have two of the foremost heralds in the country who have used the name silver who've crossed out argent beforehand and have used the name silver in a blazon okay that's just not going to happen for those men of education and experience to incorrectly use the term silver that is, again, a deliberate error, OK? Must not so term them. And for to call them by these names, it were shame amongst the Heerhorts and not worthy the name of Blazon. And you're also finding this letter, I'm not sure whether you spotted it, OK? A letter to the author um, from, uh, again, William Camden, who signed draft number three. What do you have but the silver very, very clever, no? You have your silver. <laughs> Absolute brilliance, okay? So we're starting to turn up the heat of evidence. Uh, I must yet uh, say more in commending of the worthiness thereof, for look how much this metal excelleth all others. This is gold. Uh, in the kind thereof, as in fineness and purity, so much should the bearer thereof excel all other uh, powers and virtues. Um, therefore, saith Christine of uh, Peace, no man should bear this metal in arms, but emperors and kings, or of blood royal. Are there not many that notwithstanding bear gold in their arms, and are not of blood royal? Uh, questions Lee. Gerard, yes, uh, but Christine spake it as only uh, from the worthiness thereof meaning that as none ought to be worthy, worthier than they, so they should bear the worthiest metal of all other. And yet I might say, a more in commendation thereof. So, here's Shakespeare's coat of arms. And I'm sure you can see now, this is Elizabeth I. This is James I. That is a very unworthy coat of arms. Why? Because it has more ore than the monarchs do, okay? That is a very uh, unworthy coat of arms. No man should bear this metal in arms, but emperors and kings are of blood royal. John Shakespeare was not... Um, <laughs> what, what, he, he was a bailiff of his town. He should not have had that much gold in his coat of arms, meaning that as none ought to be worthier than they. This is a very, very unworthy coat. Of arms. Now, if we have a look um, at the colours, um, it's not just colours in their singular um, singularities and, and their meaning thereof, but it's also the colours compounded, the relationship between the colours that are being used. There's meaning in the relationship between things. So, for instance, in um, in in our Lee, he defines not just the colour, but then it compounded in relation to other colours. So, for 
for gold, but simple, uh, signify as before is rehearsed, uh, with Argent to be a victor over all infidels, Turks and Saracens. Uh, infidels means, of course, not uh, the unfaithful. Uh, five, notice that five is sable, with sable constant in everything, also in love. Uh, gold signifieth um, wisdom, riches, magnin, uh, magnanimity, joyfulness, and elation of mind. I pray you tell the compounds. Um, so there are the compounds there. Uh, of argent, of silver, uh, simple of itself. It signifieth to the bearer thereof chastity, virginity, clear conscience, and charity. Compounded with awe to revenge Christ's bloodshed, with sable yielding up all pleasure. Uh, argent also... Uh, it is a royal metal and doth honourably serve, uh, does un honourable service to princes as well in the vessel uh, of household, as for the largest in gifts there, and to reward the ox with hay as Agrippa well on earth. Um, that's also in the silver section. Uh, sable, uh, of it self cons. Uh, constancy, divine doctrine and heaviness for loss of friends, but with all honour, with long life, with Argent, famous. So uh, the, the spear is famous, um, but with, uh, with all, it's its long life. So with all and sable, black and gold, uh, gives long life, uh, as we shall see. Um, and here it's uh, with sable constant in every veer thing, also in love. Black and gold will be very, very important. Uh, for the first of Genesis, it uh, appeareth that darkness was before God made light. So this is from which um, chaos, this is the chaos, the, the darkness, the nothing, from which our elements are going to emerge from, from, from nothing gives birth uh, creation in a sense it's, it's quite beautiful anyway so here's the um john shakespeare's arms which we've seen and here is the correctly impaled in accordance with draft number three uh, arms which john shakespeare should have used however he didn't okay now uh if we just have a look uh, at some of this it also as a marriage that is to say two coats that a man on the right side the woman on the left so this is impaling uh so uh it would be John Shakespeare's we saw on the right hand side the A and the jewels uh, side would be uh, Mary Arden. Um, as if it might be said that Argent uh, married with jewels, John and Ard, uh, Arden, let's say. Uh, but if it be no marriage, then ye shall say for the blazon thereof uh, uh, pity uh, parle Argent and jewels, um, pity per. <laughs> Parley, Argent and Jules, um, but somewhat to entreat of marriage. If the man have married an heir, of which Mary Arden was, we'll talk about that in a second, he shall bear her coat, none otherwise until he have begotten an heir of uh, the heir. Then may he, by the courtesy of arms, bear her arms in a, in scution, and that is to say, a scution of pretense. So then he can bear her arms. John Shakespeare was not noble, Mary Arden was. Uh, the second partition of, of this wise, uh, here is also to be noted that if a man marry an heir and have an heir uh, and have by her an heir, i.e. William Shakespeare, and the same heir shall bear his father's coat and his mother's quartered, as this is. So that he should, Shakespeare's arms should correctly be quartered. Uh, with his father's and mother's arms. Um, what if he have three wives? Why then, the more the merrier. If there be seven, then they shall have uh, room on the arms. I just think that's funny. Uh, so, uh, well, sir, here is enough for gentleness and nobility. Uh, for of these only, I could make the book. Indeed, he did. Uh, just notice the four there. Uh, the diverse degrees of which nine... Uh, five are noble, uh, as gentlemen, squire, knight, baron, and lord. So they're the uh, the five uh, nobles. 
uh, and four are excellent, the Earl, the Marquis, the Duke and the Prince. I didn't know this uh, as well as I should have beforehand. Um, and just notice, notice this, four are excellent as Earl. Four as Earl. Uh, there are nine gentlemen of sundry callings. Uh, which are they? Uh, well, let's just have a look at the gentlemen of which uh, John and William were. Gentlemen of ancestry, of blood, but not ancestry. Gentlemen of coat of arms, but not blood. Gentlemen of coat of armour with patent given to him and his heirs forever. Yemen, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, the fourth is also a gentleman. The fourth, we like fours. The fourth is also a gentleman of coat armour and not of blood as this. Fourth, the king giveth uh, a lordship by patent to him and his heirs for vir, uh, I mean ever, sorry. He may bear the coat of his lordship, but then must he make the herehort of that uh, province privy thereto, who will make search where uh, whether there be any of that blood yet remaining, for if there do any remain, then he cannot bear the same, neither can the prince by right of arms give the coat. But if it be clear without challenge, then it is to him but an unperfect uh, coat, notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> notwithstanding. <laughs> Again, very good. You'll see why. Um, <laughs> low, uh, so here's, uh, here's um, Mary Arden's coat of arms. Um, Arden's of Parks Hall. Uh, the Arden family of Parks Hall were given lands by William the Conqueror. Mary Arden is noble. She's from a noble family. And more importantly, her father left her his most valuable possession, the Arden estate in Wilm Wilmcote called Aspies. So she is an heiress and she is noble. Right? This is uh, John Shakespeare's uh, correctly impaled arms, as we can see. Now, if we refer back to our drafts, uh, our grants, uh, such blazons, uh, so such blazons of arms and achievements of inheritance uh, from they said mother by the ancient law uh, of of customs may lawfully descend. So it's lawful that the arms of the noble mother should def should descend uh, to uh, the uh, the heir of. And if we have a look at this and what this says here. Uh, uh, and that it shall be lawful for his children's issue in posterity, lawfully begotten, to bear, use and quarter and show forth the same. So he should have courted, right? Whereas John, John Shakespeare can use it singly if he so chooses to, right? The heir of Mary Arden, lawfully begotten by the, by the, by the law and custom of arms, should quarter his coat of arms okay that's what he should be doing oh, 40 40 show 40 four, four, sorry uh, the same so here's william shakespeare's arms correctly uh courted uh, i couldn't find a picture um so i had to uh, find find another artist um uh, so if you can call him an artist uh, here is also to be noted that if a man marry an heir um and have an heir uh, the same heir shall bear his father's coat and his mother's quartered. Well, here we have the quartered arms. You have his father's arms and his mother's arms correctly quartered. That is the lawful and correct arms that William Shakespeare should be using. So draft three, and that it shall be lawful for his children issue and posterity lawfully begotten to bear and use and quarter and show the same unto whom such blazon of uh, arms and achievements of inheritance from uh, their said mother by the ancient customs and laws of arms may lawfully descend. Okay, and that is the arms that William Shakespeare is currently using. So as we're starting to build up, it's not a lawful coat of arms. Okay. Uh, we also have this bird. That bird's quite important. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. So there's also like there's loads and loads of wit in this book, and you have to be very di diligent, and you have to read it multiple times to understand what's going on, because in the first time you just miss it. I have some water. Um, but if the same gentleman that is overcome have married a gentle woman. Uh, heir, yet all his lifetime after he may bear his wife's coat. And this is the courtesy of arms. And further, I will show you as he come into the combat camp uh, with his wife's coat of arms, her father, for instance, or her uncle may prohibit him from using his wife's coat. 
at least slander should come to those arms before it is doubtful whether he shall be victor or victus um, or vanquished what remedy is there then Jared, if he be knight well uh, he may have a wreath of his own colours but if an esquire uh, a, a sharpe from the left uh, scarpe from the left shoulder to the right side of one colour only we'll look at that in a second of which um, the sixth is a, uh, of which nine uh, we remember that he's a gentleman now the important thing here is the order so a squire is higher up the pecking order than a gentleman okay so if um, this is if there's some dispute about this arms then the esquire uh, should bear this scarpe um, from uh, oh sorry if he be a knight he may have a wreath of his own colours right but the esquire and the gentleman and the squire is above gentleman must uh, bear this scarpe from the left shoulder to the right of one colour only okay now let's have a look at this printing error because there's some really really clever stuff going on now for the first thing that I need you to realise is scarpe a scarpe is only mentioned twice as I can see in this book here and here. Now I didn't know what scarpe was, so I, I had a look here. The half whereof is called a scarpe. Okay, uh, so he beareth uh, argent a bend sinister. Okay. Uh, notice also the colours. There's, there's an error with the colour. Wherefore did you note? Uh, did you not call the other Baxter? We've just. Uh, Dex, ben, ben Dexter, we've discussed this already. Count it, therefore, an error of arms, uh, the which, uh, with as much speed as you may know, I could you should forget. Know that this containeth as much breadth as the Dexter Ben doth, the half whereof is called a scarpe. So half of this, uh, this bend is a scarpe. Apart from, that's not entirely correct, as we're going to see in a second. Uh, and the bastard... Of this shall bear the fourth part of this the fourth again part of this which must be called a baton sinister okay every bastard um so this is uh referring to the baton which we'll have a look in a second is called this apparently is called a baton it's not we'll have a look in a second uh, every bastard may also have a baton right so there's a magnificent error that's going on here which is all to do and he does tell you this is breadth you have the upright and this is breadth okay now the error here is we've mixed up the names of our, our bends and the breadths of our bends so allow me to uh, put the the breadths in the right order uh, so if I just do this now these are in the right order and you can check this for yourself you're more than welcome to uh, so this is the bend uh, that's uh, a Ben Lutt, okay, so this um, this is the uh, Cotis, which he does tell you, so he's using um, um, from it, some slightly Gartier Cotis, slightly uh, less familiar words before just to confuse you slightly. So this containeth half the bend aforesaid, that's not true, that is a bend, um, and may not be charged, but with flowers or foils foils i.e weapons such as a fencing sword uh, foils such as a metal hammer into a, uh, a thin sheet think aluminium foil um, from uh, it can also be termed such as in architecture a leaf shaped curve which you may see some leaf shaped curves a little bit later uh, the track in and from hunting the track or scent of a hunted animal He's he's a beautiful poet, and his word choice is magnificent. Um, so he ber he beareth uh, vert. Can you, oh, where's uh, where's vert on that tricking? I can't see that. I seem to have a and t at the first part um, of the fields. Of all other, there is none so divided, none nothing so divided as this is, as here appeareth. So that's not a bend. This is a bend, this is a bendlet. So can you see how he's mixed these up? Um, this is the fourth part of the bend. Notice that both of these bends are in or. Both of these bends are gold. Uh, other time, at some other time, a baton. Well, at some other time, well, what is a baton? That's when the ends of it are cooped, they're cut. 
yeah so they don't go all the way to the end of the shield that is a baton so we have a gold baton effectively uh, and then it parteth the field into two colours and it is of it self metal and then it is a secret of secrets and we'll talk about that secrets of secrets when I give you some just outrageous revelations a little bit later um, which I believe are true and are evidenced. Uh, so uh, come into the uh, combat camp we've had a look at this uh, may prohibit him so he can't use uh, his uh, his wife's arms because his father's perhaps challenging him um, to stop them coming in from slander so instead he should have a scarpe uh, a sharp a scarpe uh, from his left shoulder to his right of one color only well here is our scarpe apparently um, and the half of which which is this one which contains half the bend um, aforesaid well, here, well, the half of one is this one. OK, so this is it's, it's the same. It's the same one. It is a bend. So it's saying he should have a bend. Um, and from the left shoulder to the right uh, side. Well, remember, he's mixed up uh, this coat of arms. So he's called this one sinister. And to the left shoulder is a sinister coat of arms and he said this is sinister so he is telling us that this is the sinister uh, coat of arms so here we have uh, our uh, scarpe but it also says that bastards shall bear the fourth part of this which must be called a baton uh, sinister well here is our baton here's our baton so as you can see if you put the two of them together, you have the bend and the baton, the spear. Uh, you have Shakespeare's coat of arms. And as we remember, bend, uh, aforesaid, uh, may not be charged but with flowers or foils such as spears. And just to remind you, sinister sign of illegitimacy, sinister uh, bend and a sinister baton. You've got both in his terms. His terms, uh, a sinister bend and a sinister uh, baton. Uh, so that is his correctly courted arms as we've seen. Now this bird. Now this bird's important uh, because actually there's some birds mentioned uh, in the Lee. This bird, and I'm not quite sure what this bird is. I think I can, I'll have a guess though. Uh, this bird loveth man's company so much as he breeding where he payeth no rent so doth he give unto his landlord such a singular gift that wheresoever he breatheth the good man of the house is not made the cuckold what day day soever he be married on uh, here also uh, is another bird uh, i think that bird is probably a martlet uh, this is uh, the mart the mar mar Martlet, Ma I think we come across some Ma Mary Mars margin in the uh, in the first draft, didn't we? Uh, this Martlet breedeth and dwelleth in ancient houses, houses of honour, and when the lords of them have forsaken them, yet dwelleth the Martlet uh, there. These birds are and have been made and painted without feet, uh, not for that they lack, but having legs and feet, they use them not. I think we've met someone who doesn't use his legs and feet didn't we earlier in 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 lee to do with someone who didn't understand when when that herald came to to see a gentleman about his coat of arms and he didn't use his legs or feet um when he lighteth he lighteth on his wings uh, which are somewhat longer uh, than to answer to the proportion of the body so his wings are a little bit longer than his body there somewhat longer um uh, so this fourth brother, um, the, the bit before is quite phrasable, uh, because he is so far, uh, this fourth brother, because he's so far from the house of inheritance, must be a traveller on the sea, a horseman in field or a worthy captain. Um, he must be, he's so far from the house of inheritance. He must be a traveller on the sea, captain of a castle, um, and so to live uh, gentleman like and aspire to honour. Gentleman like 
not a gentleman. Uh, and here is also another one with this bird, which I think is a martlet there. Uh, I think the wordplay here is terrific. Uh, the Isle of Sardinia, Arden, Mary Arden, uh, by art. So Arden, I think he did teach you about that H before, Arden, these shields. Uh, also uh, pursed with Lance, Shakespeare. So to say, pursed with Lance. So the blaze on. Uh, here you shall learn a rule, that is, there are fewer words whereof you may not name any of them twice in a blazon of one coat, and these be they. Off, off, on, and, with. These may not be spoken any more than once in one coat. If they be, it is accustomed such a fault as he that hath committed the same is not worthy to blaze a coat. So... I would be loath to break any rule. I pray you of, you, of your licence therein, Gerard, uh, go to say on and take heed. You break no more rules but that one, beside naming of colour and metal too oft. Well, let's have a look at the blazon specifically uh, from draft one, draft two and draft three. Three, shall we? Now, uh, there is our first rule. Uh, we shouldn't use of on and and with more than once in one blazon so let me just quickly uh, underline all of these key words for you of on and and with okay these may not be spoken any more than once in one coat if they be it is a custom such a fault as he hath committed the same is not worthy to be blazed a coat and there we have a fair few errors thus not worthy to blaze a coat, according to Mr. Jared Lee. And naming of colour and metal too often. Ah, well, it seems that we've, we've named some, uh, some colours there more, uh, colours and metals more than once. I say so because I would not break no rule in naming of one thing twice in one coat. Uh, now I've, I've I'm not going to count the strike throughs. I'm I'm going to be kind uh, to our heralds, um, but I do want to make you aware of this. Things that you've already seen. You've seen the proper, and there's quite a lot of proper. There's actually only one proper that's not strike uh, strike struck through, which is the point of the first spear. The point of the first spear was proper. That's the only one that hasn't been struck through. If you remember our arguments on proper, that is very, very important. Also notice our silver, which should never be used uh, by the two wisest heralds in our land. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot of incorrect blaze on here on purpose because it's witty. Also, just notice this in pale. Uh, pale means upright. Um, that's going to be important for later. And Earl, Earl Marshal of England, for that all painters shall learn to do things orderly. For arms are not to be done by every painter. Sometime, although he be cunning in his art, uh, yet he doing of arms, he may commit error. Uh, it is the arms of every gentleman well marshaled, uh, with supporters helm, wreath and crest, with mantles, and the word, the witch of Heerholtz is properly called blaze on uh, not only blazed by the several coats but by the names appertaining of antiquity to the same and thus you shall use yourself in blaze on thereof uh, and what what you mean by the words achievement there's no t in that achievement because uh, i must begin with the achievement of duke uh, i ha uh, of a duke i have therefore set forth the achievement of Thomas Lord Howard, the second of that name, Duke of Norfolk, well, who is uh, Duke of Norfolk, um, Thomas Howard, Lord Howard. Well, that's the grandfather of Henry Howard, the Earl of Northampton. And if we remember who that's dedicated to, there's a reason uh, that is that achievement is coming there. Um, now, I can't move on from uh, colours without talking about vert. Uh, vert is a very important um, colour. Uh, that vert in ore 
is glorious to behold and glittering of itself. Um, indeed it is. Uh, this is on page nine or six. Uh, you can rotate a nine and it makes a six and six is a is the first perfect number. Transformations, uh, as in metamorphoses, are very important in this game. Uh, so verts, of which all authors agree, indeed they do, um, heart and therefore in May, the pleasantest month of the year. Take your pleasure. You, and I, I, I did tell you in my first ever video, May is, you'll see May is all the way through this because um, it is a key, so is love and desire. Uh, take your pleasure under all green trees with much more commendation. A uh, Jared Venus, uh, that's the god of love, love wonderfully, uh, but that I commit wholly to your judgment uh, or wisdom. The laurel tree, uh, which hath deserved chief praise, the laurels for poets, deserving chief praise, all under the co the colour of vert. And now, uh, but and now, uh, emerald is its its stone in itself, singular virtue. Here's our virtue again, in itself singular virtue, or grass of the field. And in the sun shining, that's beautiful. Um, uh, ray raiseth of itself, raiseth of itself a beam in the air, and prevaileth in play. Indeed, he does. Uh, I, I'm, I put Edward de Vere down as the greatest actor in history, actually. Um, that it ceaseth tempest. And just notice what he does here, and this is the only colour where he does this, which is really interesting. Um, the precious stone I leave off. Um, he takes leave. And now to the significations first of itself. Just notice that big space after that. He doesn't do that with any of the other colours in this book. First of itself. Um, it signifies joyful love. So the significations is, is this colour, vert, is first of itself. And we will see that um, a little bit later. Uh, I also love this, the uh, Argent at the service of princes, if we remember, the lieutenant. Ten's important. Uh, and jewels, no uh, weather stoppeth his will. And of course, we've got ten to delight in bloodshed. Let's notice that self with an E on the end. Um, self with the E on the end. Self with the E on the end. And a bit later, uh, he delights, of course, in his... Um, little story with the Earl of Vert uh, and the Earl of Jewels. He has a lot of fun. Uh, so we've done we've done colour. We're starting to build up our knowledge uh, of this coat of arms. We're now going to do um, probably some of the more important ones. Uh, well, they're, they're all important, but I think the most important, which is number and position. So number and position are the two remaining elements. Uh, now that lines and colours... Uh, are uh, dif uh, discussed. So, um, but why or how come number and position to be of uh, the quorum of this discourse? Uh, this of this discourse. Well, uh, whereas you say that number is the element of armories, mean ye that the figures of arithmetic are in arms, or the use of numeration only? Enumeration only as one, two, or more of this or that kind, and yet the figures or characters uh, themselves uh, may, I do not altogether deny, be in coats of arms so well as letters or the like, uh, though with little grace. There's our letters, um, which there are two of them. Uh, e, de vir, uh, e de vir. Uh, so lead me, I pray, into this other uh, revestry um, or secret place of armories. And indeed, it is going to lead us into a secret place of armories. Unity is perfection. He says one is perfect. And the more anything is one, uh, the more anything is one. So the more it is just one, the more it is excellent. So one is an excellent number um, as they are in their own kind, according to which there are Either, either even or odd, of which the odd are the best. So odd numbers are better uh, than even numbers. Um, to the purpose, Sir Eustace, um, and me, to the purpose, to the purpose of 
Uh, what nature, therefore, condition or state um, so, so ever armories be, whether composed of lines only or filled with remembrance, rem uh, resemblances of things or both, number is always in use and makes one art marshalling that number. The first and chief is the number of six. Um, so if we're going to do even numbers, the first and chief is six. Why? Because it is a perfect number, although he doesn't tell you this. He does tell you this in the elements of geometry. Uh, the first of digit numbers is ten. So after uh, six as an uh, ensueth, which also partakes uh, those excellencies whereof the number six doth uh, boast. Uh, the reason for that is with, we're looking at triangular numbers here, numbers that are going to go on this triangular, a trique uh, shaped shield. So we're looking at triangular numbers, uh, 1, uh, 3, 6, 10. Uh, that's why they're so important. Um, and 6, of course, really important because it's perfect. And 10, the number that represents uh, Devere 1, meaning self, 0 of nothing. So it's a really great number. Uh, for this. Uh, no even number is capable of these forms which uh, diversity of position gives to the odd. One is odd and one is only best next to the, the trios, uh, the ternio or the number three, uh, the trinity uh, for instance. Um, so honourable orderies, ordinaries as in bend, in pale. As in bend, in pale, so, uh, we've seen our bend, our in pale is our uh, upright uh, straight line and so forth so as you place them immorally and assure yourself that even number is excluded for of them some exercise as it were an uh, antipathy or war with fair arms so for the so assure you the even number is excluded why because the if you have two they're at war there's an antipathy between them uh, when they occupy the whole field the, the whole field. Uh, the dual or number two is such. Uh, therefore, for the dual of number two having nothing between cannot be said to have any distance, much less proportion, and for uh, default thereof cannot decently possess the whole field. It is by necessarily uh, necessary sequel discord in that kind and cannot sympathise of itself with perfectly fair armories unless from uh, somewhat uh, though of a different sort or condition be interjected or in company as this as of itself that is where no other thing doth possess the field uh, the ignorance of many men hath checked the uh, fawn upon the breaches of rules where to countenance with credit above general grounds were absurd so my first question to you it's quite a simple question how many spears are there in this coat of arms? And the answer, two. There is two spears in this coat of arms. Uh, two heads. Uh, Honourable ordinaries, as in bend, uh, impale, or so forth, and, and assure yourself the even number is excluded. So we've got two, should be excluded. Uh, there's antipathy between these two numbers. Um, dual number, nothing between them. Uh, can be said to have any distance, much less proportion. Um, there's discord. They cannot sympathise. Um, and I could, with a very good will, step aside here into a question or two, if you would allow thereof upon occasion of this double-headed bird, for that though you hold it to excellent, you uh, yet to me, in the rudeness of my noviceship, noviceship, it seems monstrous and unnatural. There's two heads to that bird. Now you also in the uh, in Lee have one just one spear, one spear notice of the same orientation um, as the spear across Shakespeare's coat of arms in our Gerard Lee. Um, so here beareth jewels, red, a lance, argent, silver, uh, with the shaft sable. The shaft of it is sable. The Hebrew rabbis writ upon uh, uh, in, in numbers that this was the standard of the tribe, standard with an E on the end, of the tribe of Simeon. Um, th this is where I think I get to use this term. Forgive me for using this term, but I do think it's very apt bullshit. OK, so if we actually have a look at what is going on, uh, 
let, let's look. We have uh, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter. The swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed uh, men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed by their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel, I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Well, swords killed men in anger, much like Edward de Vere, uh, the undercook in his youth, um, and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Um, I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Uh, so that's where it's coming from. Uh, in uh, So e really, their, uh, their emblem should either be a sword or an ox. It should not, however, be a spear. In company with Levi, Simeon attacked uh, Shechem, uh, for which act he was cursed by Jacob with dispersion amongst uh, the tribes. So this is uh, what's said um, in Genesis. Um, so Levi is one, uh, Simeon, sorry, is one of the ten lost tribes uh, that disappears, that gets amalgamated into the other uh, tribes and difficult to find. Uh, but later, after um, they've committed uh, this this act, which has caused quite a quite a lot of anger, um, what what happens later is they become priests. Um, they become uh, the teachers of the law, um, officiaries in with um, religion, um, so functionaries of the temple and, and priests. Um, so much like De Vere in his youth uh, committed a, a crime, uh, as he matured, um, he really does make atonements for that by doing great works, which is where um, our, our promise of hope comes in a bit later. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment uh, the Urim and the uh, Thummim, Thummim uh, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord uh, continually. Uh, that's talking about the breastplate, uh, which um, some of the priests wear, which have the, the stones of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you can have a sword, an oxen, um, the breastplate. But one thing you can't have um, on that shield as a standard of the tribe of Simeon is a spear. That's um, that's uh, that's not right. Uh, but. Here's a here's a spear. This is a this is the holy spear uh, that pierced uh, Jesus uh, in um, in his side, where uh, the blood uh, had separated and water burst forth to show that he was uh, dead. So that's the holy spear. I'm showing you that because that's relevant for what's coming. Uh, so page forty. I really like number forty because it is a number that represents uh, Edward de Vere. Uh, himself as I did show you in my last video uh, 20 years um, and well slept into years those I say uh, 20 is important as well uh, were not only elect for their cunning in that behalf but for their virtuous life and sage counsel for as Upton saith Law of arms is most part directed by the civil law. Of these officers of arms, I say at this day, are sundry sorts and that of sundry services and are diversely, diversely, versely created and made, uh, whereof I will show you, beginning at the lowest with Upton's own words, it is necessary, saith he, that all estates should have uh, curros, uh, as uh, couriers, as sure messengers uh, for the expedition of their business, whose office is to pass and repass on foot, being clad in their prince's colours, parted upright as the one half white and other black, like as the sergeants uh, at the law doth give their liveries in time of their feast. These, I say, have the arms of the sovereigns. Uh, so let's just have a look at this. Upton, Upton's upright got quite a lot of uh uptons there painted on their uh boxes i like boxes because it contains the word ox or oxes um his interlacing of words within words is just wonderful um so are knights in their offices but not nobles and they're called caligate 
or arms because they wear start-ups. That's the boot to the mid of the legs. Ah, start-ups. Ha, something going on here with ups. Um, and also, let's just notice this. We have some 40s on page 40. You'll notice that for each page, you've got like two pages um, for, pay, for the 40 bit. Uh, so T and 4, 40. Uh, we've got 7 and 7, which if you added that together, that would make 40. Uh, a lack of knowledge therein, unto whom I say that when the sword is born for their grace, the bearer therefore must carry it upright, and the blade directly up. Uh, for an earl must carry the same between the point of the shoulder and the elbow. And he that beareth... Uh, uh, blah, 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 I had occasion to speak of this because I have seen the fault thereof in some towns of England. To bear the head of anything in arms is the most worthiest part and the most honourable in bearing. And how should we bear our heads? But upright. So this is pale. That is your upright vertical band. It's vertical, it's upright. And what do we have in draft number three? And for his crest or cognizance, a falcon with his wings displayed, standing on a wreath of his colours, supporting a spear, in pale, armed, headed, or and stilled, argent, silver. So there's your in pale. He's even written it in, but he's struck it through. And you can, you're starting to maybe see the wit that's concealed uh, beneath that strike through. Supporting a spear in pale. Um, and we've got many examples of Ben in pale. Um, for instance, and while crucially, we were talking about that even number. So as you're going to see, we're going to start talking about uh, these spears and their orientation. A lewd Turkish ensign stands, which one day yet, O oh God, thou wilt raise by the martial arms of some zealous prince who shall bear in the canton of his royal coat of armours for perpetual memories of the conquest. Noble and excellent affection, I will with my labours, uh, could but give the hope a little spark, shall both this our conference, as unto their vertical point, aspire, as unto their vertical point, aspire, may seek to the glory of God. So it's pointing up to... Uh, God, and that is your vertical spear. And if we look, you can see the orientations of those spears. One is pointing upright, and one is oblique. Okay, not being carried honourably or worthily. So, as all our like endeavours, endeavours, um, as unto their vertical point, aspire, seek the glory. So we can see the orientation of our spears. And there's loads and loads and loads of references to this. Now, the order of information is really important because often it's telling us uh, something what's going on. So here we have uh, our first one, which is our oblique um, sink foils, whatever they are, uh, the flowers. Um, sink foils, I think, maybe, I don't know. Um, and then upright we have, um, I can't remember, our upright, which is immediately after. So oblique and then uh, upright. Uh, shift their, um, it is sink falls good, uh, that's good. Uh, shift their station from thence upwards into the dexter oblique, uh, obliquity. There are three uh, sink foils. Uh, bring it about to a per perpendicular position. They are in pale. So he's 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 telling you this perpendicular position is in pale. Uh, the bend is obliquity. Uh, thus much for position, uh, the last element of the four, and here by your good favour I will pitch up, pitch up one of my columns. This is actually the end uh, of uh, Edmund Bolton's elements of armoury, so you know it's important because firsts and lasts are always important. And then uh, the give thanks to God, pitch up my columns, Dio Glatius, uh, give thanks to God, so pitching up, this is really important. Uh, thus much for position, the last element of the four. Uh, I, look at that it, it, italicised I there. I will pitch up one of my columns. Okay, that's really important. And if we look in Lee, we have, well, the same thing, but reverse. We have first, which is your upright, and then immediately after, our oblique. Okay, um, and remember, triangles are important. They take the shape uh, of uh, the... Shields. Now we've got three of those uh, circles um, 
in a triangle shape. That's really important. We know three and triangles are important. So remember this because that's going to be important for something I show you uh, with some documentary evidence in a, in a minute. Uh, so <laughs> here we go. Now you'll notice this upright, oblique, oblique, oblique. All the way around the upright we have uh, the oblique and the last one on there as well is also oblique. Okay. Um, the So, uh, part of the palais, palais, palette, palais, a above spoken and is not uh, V used, uh, but when the pale uh, is between two of them, uh, so we have um, two spears and we need to really think about this orientation, but uh, we've talked about the foils there, which is on the oblique direction. So the oblique direction we're talking about that. Now, throughout the Minerva Brit Britanna, you have loads of references to what is going on. Uh, they're slightly uh, dense and full of meaning, but here's one that hopefully um, we can quickly discuss. This is the bend, and you can see this because it literally is a bend. You have a swan there, um, uh, and you can see this, this staff uh, is bending, it's refracting. If we remember uh, from our science lessons in the water okay so well let's have a look although the staff with the river within the river clear uh, be straight as an arrow in the persian bow yet to the view it crooked doth appear and one would swear that it indeed were so so soon the sense deceived the judge amiss and fools will blame where none error is the start to show how oft the honest mind that meaneth well and is of life upright, upright, is rationally censored by the vulgar blind, though vain opinion or vile envious spite. But if thou know'st thy conscience clear within, what others say, it matters not a pin. Well, here's your 1 Corinthians, and that references, but if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. If we have a look at this reference here, uh, again from, uh, I believe, Ovid, a good conscience daily, it turns green. It is not affected by this labour. He brings in joy, living and eternal. Remember, green is our vert. Uh, I, I like that's Bernard. Uh, the Ovid here is this one. As a man's conscience is so within hope or fear prevails, suiting to his mind. It's about uh, hope or fear prevails man's conscience to his design. Um, and if we have a look at uh, the Ovid, I know that um, because uh, I, I thankfully found it here um, in this in this book, which is great. Otherwise, I was, was really struggling to translate that because uh, my Latin is still in its elementary stages. Uh, and I can truly say that I have gone through several hazards with a more steady pace and consideration of the secret knowledge I had of my own will and my and the innocence of my intentions. And we have the Latin um, uh, there uh, from Ovid and then a translation, which I'm very grateful for. As a man's conscience is, so within hope of fear prevails, suiting to his design. Of this are a thousand examples, but it will be enough to instance three of one and the same person. Three of one and the same person. Now, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, to this to this author for this translation of this Latin. Uh, the author of this work, by the way, um, is a uh, Montagnier. Uh, and I believe I've done a video on, on Montagnier because I'm pretty sure De Vere hasn't just published in the English uh, language. Now, if we have a look at the top there, you're going to see there's Perseus. Perseus is important. And this Latin uh, here, which means do not seek for things outside of yourself. Seek, i.e. seek within yourself. Uh, and this expression written across uh, this scroll uh, here, mihi uh, cons, uh, conscia recti, uh, it means conscious of rectitude. So we're talking about this right. So here you have both your bend and 
your upright, which it says there, we have references to right and the, and the inscription says conscious of rectitude. Uh, and all through the Minerva, you're going to see now, hopefully, uh, this interplay between oblique and upright. Uh, and in, in, in defence of king and country's right, well, look, the England flag, the country is upright behind um, this uh, oblique uh, axe. Uh, and you're going to find loads of examples of this, the upright to the right, honourable north, it's pointing towards north, uh, upright, and virtue is upheld in every land. Virtue is upheld in every land. Okay, so, but wisely if thou leads the upright life, so even the ones that are slightly more obscure, you have these references, but wisely if thou leads thy life upright, um, Princes may take unto themselves what devices they will, so be it born of no man before the time he has duffed you there. Whereof have you used the number of nine in all your demonstrations more than any other? Not only because it is aptest for this science of, uh, of invention. Why? Because six and nine, again, perfect number, but you can uh, rotate them, reflect them. Uh, so uh, for the rules incident there too, incident uh, chiefly fall out of the number, uh, but that for that, uh, but that for that of all simple numbers, it is most content. Most of content, the figure whereof holdeth all other under it is by the art of arithmetic. Ye may soon perceive. So we're going to have. Um, Likewise, under all these, there are nine movable spheres. There's also nine muses. Should we have a look at the brilliance of what he does here? Now, notice that clearly says spheres. That says spheres. Are you ready? Uh, severally. Severally, virally. Uh, unto whom, for their continual armoury, the poets compare one of the nine muses with their uh, appropriate people, as Calepe dwells in the highest and swiftest spear. Swiftest spear. Doesn't say sphere, that says spear. Where the. Oh, spear. Oh, spear again. Oh, sun spear. Spear of Venus, Spear of Mercury, Spear of the Moon, uh, severally, E on the end as well. So we have, and it even tells you there, severally, seven, you have uh, several, ye, several, seven, severally, you have seven spears in this. You have seven references uh, of incorrectly spelt spear. Uh, contained under the number nine. Finally, to conclude, and I love this one, it pleased God in his humanity to yield up his holy spirit. Good, no? Um, again, he tells you in the Art of English Poesy, he's, he's, he's doing this not just for the nonce, but auricularly for the ear. So, holy spirit, to yield up his holy spirit. So, Next question, we're done. We're done with the orientation and the number of the spear. Now let's look at what I think is the most important thing of the entire coat of arms. And the question, who is shaking the spear? So who is shaking the spear? In heraldry, it is commonly accepted that the falcon symbolises one who does not rest until the object is achieved. Falcons were used in a royal sport known as falconry, the art of training falcons or hawks to pursue and attack wild fowl or game, hence were often associated with kings and nobles. It represents a person of action eagerly pursuing something desired. Uh, Ra, the sun god, if, sun god, if we go back to the Egyptians, was represented by the falcon. Or Horus, Horus, the sky god, was also depicted by the falcon. So the falcon represents Ra, the sun god. So there's a nice falcon there for you. We're going all the way back to ensigns, to signs, to hieroglyphics, remember, uh, of 
the Egyptians. An eagle holding in uh, one foot a bird. Remember this? We have our proper colour and our uh, argent. Um, a spear of the first, the first, uh, the point still argent proper. So we've got the often the confusing colours from our uh, our drafts. And the uh, cochineo tree. Uh, cochineo in uh, I think Spanish means suckling pig. Interesting. Uh, this was it probably is a tree as well, but I'm struggling to find it. This was the uh, sign uh, which the oracle gave them. Uh, where to settle the rear uh, a city uh, which should, as it was, be queen of many nations. They did so and for perpetual memory advanced the picture for their public ensign. Uh, a lewd Turkish ensign stands which one day we've had a little look at this. A noble and excellent affection, I wish my labours could but give hope of a little spark as unto their vertical point aspire. And now we understand what this means slightly more. We have our vertical point of our spear being brandished by our falcon. Uh, the Babylonian ancient citizens of Syrian walk not as faith Herodotus without their scepters or rods on tops, whereof some symbolic images or others or other as of bird, as fish or the like were fixed. I could rather incline to think them ensigns, born after the manner and times of peace to distinguish the honourable from the vulgar. And indeed, that falcon is going to um, is going to distinguish between uh, the worthy author of Shakespeare and many other works and the vulgar. Uh, the terrible dove. I like that. The terrible dove. Um, which again I said came from Jeremiah, um, which is referring it, it is referring to this falcon. Um, arms are they in a tradition where a dove, which also her name signifies, um, for Sumerians from ancient Diodorus, uh, so he's familiar with the Sumerians, uh, which is important, uh, is in the Syri uh, Syria a dove. Um, out of one authentic author to declare that the Assyrians bear a dragon. It wasn't a dove, it was a dragon. One of the other from the Cirrus, the Persian monarch, bear a golden eagle and like innumerable. So we've got lots of things. He's not directly saying uh, a falcon. I don't think he, he, he alludes to it. But I don't think he directly says the word falcon uh, in this book. Um, but he alludes to it, this terrible dove, this dragon, this eagle. Uh, many prophecies of Holy Scriptures are full of allusions concerning the princes, uh, painted onto us in symbolic images, which yet I do not say they were their arms. More for our present purpose are the ancient fiercer nations of Assyria, Scythians, Parthians, uh, Bactrians, Hyrcans, Sogdians, and the like, a great number of antiquities, uh, such as the Egyptians who had their very important symbol of the falcon. So, what? there seems to be quite a lot of references within um, this, the elements of armories uh, to the elements of geometries. Circles, angles and the like are in geometry. Armory, examples of the four kinds of crooked lines with geometry have nothing to do. Geometrical elements. Euclid was best known. Euclid's elements, not much more perplex, of a singular property. Uh, Euclid's geometrical elements. So, uh, it's we have this book, Elements of Armories, referring to the elements of geometry. Now, I have explained in the previous video uh, so much wit that's going on, which is all to do with what people are pointing at. Now I deliberately missed off the most important one um, last time, uh, which is this. We have a king, another king, and a lion, which is the king of the animal kingdom. What's he looking at? Uh, we also have a, a young uh, cherub or babe. We have a, 
an old man, so both the young and the old, uh, the old man scratching his head, very confused now what he's he's seeing uh, and is about to see in these clouds. And, and lastly, we have this winged messenger, this winged satyr. Um, they are all looking, of course, at the falcon. And how do I know it's a falcon? Because of what our winged messenger, our communicator, is holding. Falcon is derived from Latin, falx, meaning sickle, which is a reference to the falcon's wing shape in flight, often used in royal and noble sport. Uh, so you can see that our, uh, our winged satyr brandishing our spear is uh, our sickle is looking as are the six other people at our falcon which i'm hoping you can now clearly see uh, in this um in this cloud and they're all pointing to it so this isn't just interpretation or seeing things they you have six people who are either pointing or looking to this falcon in this cloud now we have quite a few falcon references as we're going to see um, in a bit. Honourable marks upon shields, uh, they being among the most perfect bodies that are made according to symbolic, uh, symbolical doctrine, nevertheless that I may not stand accountable for willful uh, whilst having so far exceeded in my proofs the charge which lay upon uh, me urging farther than to make plain the assignments in, assignments in general of what in isoever were universal that use may be drawn from those scattered shadows scattered shadows and limbs of our elements as by planting the eye at the true place of sight uh, may give a fair and complete body in perspective um, and we talk about the idea um, i've told you already about the imas uh, and the minerva britannia uh, which we'll see in a minute uh, Seven thousand fowls it's not a fowler bird um, and also but notice here and i missed this off um, last time this one and I was struck by this and I was like, I know this sounds really familiar, but I can't remember where it was. Glowworms or glowworms. Hmm. Now, I've been very lucky. I've been lucky with all of this stuff, really. Uh, most renowned armories or books in all the world. Well, let's think of one of the most renowned works of literature. And that is probably Hamlet. The glowworm shows the matin, the morning, to be near, and gins to pale his unaffectual fire. Men's are pale. Remember me. Bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. All sores of books. I am but mad north, northwest, when the wind is southerly. I know a hawk from a handsaw. Unmixed with base and matter, yes, yes, by heaven. So as I'm saying, there's a, there's a surface structure of the play, which is terrific. But underneath, uh, you have our author also uh, in the deeper structure communicating uh, something to you. And you're going to see a fair amount of this. Um, heaven secure him. Hilly ho ho boy, come bird, come. That's a, that's a direct call from falconry. No. Um, what news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord. Tell it. No, you'll reveal it. Like quills upon the fretful por uh, porpentine, the porcupine. Like quills upon, up. The fret is another term uh, from heraldry. That is a fret uh, there. You'll notice our Ben, our, our Ben's um, uh, Dexter and our Ben Sinister uh, kind of united there. Um, but this eternal blazon must not be. Revenge his foul, murder most foul, and his best it is. But this most foul, he's telling you this three times because he wants you to uh, to be aware that this is not an accident. This is deliberate, deliberate uh, wordplay. This is your foul, your falcon. That with wings as swift as meditation and with thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. Remember, I did tell you may uh, desire and love are the keys to this from the Art of English Posy printing preface. Um, 
So upon a wretch, upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor as those of mine, but virtue as it never will be moved, though lewdness caught in a shape of heaven. So lust, though to be a radiant angel linked, uh, such as a, a falcon, I suppose, in, in Argent, uh, will sate itself in the celestial bed and prey upon garbage, an angel preying upon uh, garbage, upon virtue, that's swift as quicksilver. Remember that falcon was blazed argent, as swift as quicksilver it courses through. So crestal cognizance of falcon, his wings displayed argent. So as you can see in Hamlet, we have these references uh, to the falcon. Now, um, I, can't, I think it was Whitwritten Brass Part 2 that I did some analysis um, on this. Um, and I, I realised, um, other than the ore, which you'll now see, uh, is the gold. Um, the most important thing I said was the sign of the falcon uh, by W.A. Dwight. Uh, Dight, sorry, means um, uh, noun. It's a noun, clothed or equipped. But as a verb, it also means to make ready for a use or propose, to prepare. So the sign of the falcon is really important. Printed at Shoe Lane. <laughs> Shoe Lane's pretty funny as well, actually. Um, at, the, at the sign of the, of the falcon. Well, let's have a look at the sign of the falcon, because there's only one falcon uh, in this book. And it's very telling and it's very, very important, um, <laughs> particularly for the wealth of stuff that's hidden be under the surface. The princely falcon, the princely falcon that hath been manned and taught to stoop unto the tossed law is now escaped from his master's hand and will no more such servitude endure and better likes the field and forests spray. I love fields, particularly with that uh, conceited E qualifying E at the end. I'm having a field day, so to say. Imprinted at London by Richard Field, dwelling at Blackfriars, and for himself in elder age to pray. Indeed. Uh, the virtuous mind, all oh, virtue again, virtuous mind and truly na uh, noble, bright, almost upright that, uh, can seldom brook in bondage base to serve, but most doth in his liberty delight, still rather choosing by himself to serve and eat some caterpillars, envy bread, or at another's courtesy be fed, or at another's courtesy be fed. O and three there. V is... Let's have a look a little bit deeper at some of the things that are going on here. Uh, Durham, uh, invisum et grave est servita uh, fellow. Uh, that's from Trojan Women uh, by Seneca, his play. Uh, it's hard, a uh, hateful, uh, galling thing to endure servitude. This yoke have I long endured for ten years captive. Is Ilium, Ilium laid low? Are your household gods? overthrown uh you can see uh i think in the art of english poetry he describes it as a as a god for the pagans and we um, william shakespeare is quite idealized um it's hard to lose one's native country harder to fear it you're comforted by companionship in so great a misfortune against me victor and vanquished rage alike uh if we look at the title servere Servere, 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 nesset. It means to serve knowledge, but you can hear the veer in there. Serving, uh, servere, servere, nesset. Uh, and if we have a look at this one, species, uh, well, this is this is really important. Um, so uh, this is from uh, uh, letters to his brother, uh, Quintus, by uh, Cicero. Um, if we have a look, uh, this is about... Um, and even so, in these things, show your highest fidelity, faithfulness, as I believe they do since that in your judgment. Yet the mere appearance of a freedman or slave enjoying such influence cannot but lower your dignity. Uh, so Statius was um, was a, a slave of uh, uh, um, Quintus, Cicero's brother, who he'd freed. And 
um, was gossiping and, and wasn't being uh, particularly nice. And, and Cicero um, thought he was making a mockery and, and lowering his brother's dignity. Uh, but this is really... Um, so uh, Statius freed Mano Quintus Telesilero, whom his brother Marcus felt too self-important and too free with his opinions. Um, this is really funny because this, is, again, is a play on words because Statius... Well, there's a few other Statiuses. Uh, Statius uh, Caecilius, uh, who was a Roman comic poet, and uh, Publius Papinius uh, Statius, uh, who was a Roman poet of the first century AD, um, which is, again, um, quite funny. Uh, but look at look at this. So this so we have, um, and also just just pay attention, please, to the the hand. The falcon has left this invisible hand. It's taken flight. Uh, uh, but better likes the field and forests uh, spray. Uh, there's a lot of ores in this as well that you may uh, fall or uh, that you may uh, pay attention to. But just notice this. Can seldom brook in bondage base to serve. Now you're going to find actually a number of brooks in this. And if you remember our herald, our herald um, Ralph Brook, who challenged um, the uh, the legitimacy of the granting of the arms uh, in his his documents. So uh, his uh, can Brook no peer to check his sovereign right? I love this one. Uh, to the right, truly noble and most honourable Lord William Earl of Pen Brook. That's good, isn't it? I wonder who penned Brook. Uh, I much did muse why Venus could not brook unto the murmur of the gentle brook, unto the murmur of the gentle brook. Um, <laughs> there's loads, there's loads of wit there. Uh, if we also have a look at the conclusion, which is full of stuff, uh, you're going to see these references to the falcon uh, shortly. Uh, so Phoebus, we like, oh, we, well, we've seen a hair, haven't we, between those double Vs, but Phoebus hair, uh, the winged uh, people, perched above oh someone winged and perched above uh, it may make those upon upon the authors that you saw a bit uh, earlier a little, make a little bit more sense uh, that winged flies before the wind uh, flora flora I'm sorry, just ignore that for the minute uh, brought from the city uh, whence they have their name who caused by art sun dry love that word sun dry uh, because apollo is the god of sun sun dry uh, kinds to be brought forth um to the gardener uh, gilly flowers well if you have a look um on uh the the monument in westminster abbey you're going to find Guillermo. we've got some gilly flowers there that gave the golden age her food uh unto the bender true uh the bend and true there uh we have our double v inter arden Double V Arden. Uh, Philibert loves the veil. Well, we've had some veil passing by the pale, pale upright again. The long lived eagle, uh, Jove forsook um, and hi uh, hither in a moment flew um, as king his multitude to view with falcon for the king's delight. So there's our first direct falcon reference. Uh, or emerald green ever was. I haven't really talked much about the the gems, uh, the stones in uh, Lee, which uh, each colour has a stone, but emerald uh, is green. And you'll see that emerald green uh, veer. It's an anagram of veer. And of course, vert is our emerald um, from Lee. Uh, in, uh, in robe uh, of worn silver fane with gold twine, a loft a mantle green she had, a loft a mantle vert she had, it did over all itself extend. Uh, wherein is sparkling diamonds, with diamonds is the stone of sable, uh, which is black, so did over all itself extend, whereon in sparkling diamonds. Uh, scepters of the finest gold, from Caesar ere she was betrayed, here saw I many a shivered lance shivered much as like shaken and crownets of her petty kings high feathered helmets for the tilt targets uh shields a target is also a shield uh, cleft in twain in two 
hung silver shields by three and three with pencil limed curiously uh, wherein were drawn with skillful such impresses and devices of all her gallant knights and such as actors so impresses and devices of her gallant knights as such as actors in her conquest were great edward the first that of the garter were that did the falcon shroud just notice that uh, york's lock or your keys lock your keys lock that did the falcon shroud and that's because the falcon very much uh, is the key to this as i will show you uh, howard's blood uh, uh, bedford uh, the, now this is really important the loyal fear and the brave falcon bridge the loyal veer and the brave falcon bridge that's our third falcon reference now our third falcon reference uh, and look at this look at the ending bit this is so clever uh, but virtue present and secure uh, now what they were on every tree important very very important um, particularly if you know um, the story in Ovid's Metamorphosis of uh, Romulus and his spear, uh, who put the spear into the ground and it became a tree. That's very important. The founding, um, Romulus, another founder of, of Rome there. Uh, devices new and old. Get ready. As those brave worthies faithfully. Well, if you remember, brave falcon bridge. And what's another word for faithful? Loyal. The loyal V. V. Of those brave worthies, faithfully. Brave Falcon Bridge, the loyal V. V. Shall in another book with an E on the end be told. Uh, if you do some digits some analysis, that adds to 10 as well. Another important uh, number. You can also see here you have our uh, very important letters uh, of addition that we frequently use, which is E and L. Uh, they're two of the most predominant. Uh, letters he uses for the figures of addition to let you know there's some uh, conceit or cunning going on. And we also have our anchor, our anchor. Uh, and that is referring, of course, uh, to some research. I've done, I've done two videos on this already on the Ancora uh, spy. If we have a look at uh, this one, which is the penultimate uh, impressor in, in this book, uh, all that means in a court, in a court or noble residence um, and we we seem to have a v of some stocks there and this interesting thing here which is our holy water brush it's got some hooks on and a and a brush well that is because that's really to do with the ancora spy our holy water uh, brush this is the printing device of richard fields thomas fotrolier who's not who he says either um, this is the printing device uh, of the Vir. And there's lots of references to this in this penultimate, uh, it's not penultimate, it's the last one in the book, in fact. Uh, in hope at length, uh, may he behold, uh, round about she throws, here with a knot of gilded hooks she bears, uh, a pair of stocks she opes. Well, what do stocks do? Stocks hold you in place. To show her bondage again, holding in place, as waiting long upon her hopes. So as you can see, to lie, to lie at the bottom of the ocean. So as we can see, this is um, all to do with our fair promise, our Hebrews 6, 19, which is our promise. Um, make the unchanging nature purpose what he promised. And it's Hebrews 6, 19, which is where the anchor of spy uh, derives uh, its name from we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain now that's so important as i have previously said because that is the image on the front of the minerva britannia that is the curtain and we're getting behind the curtain there um, and this book does do this but we just need to uh, to kind of really investigate so this is really important so we're going to really investigate uh, this one in particular it's the last one in the book so we know it's important and the Angkor spy is the prince's bane the mark of flattery so it's his mark 
this Ancora Spy is his uh, printing device, his emblem, his mark. So let's start having a look, let's start interrogating it uh, below the surface. So uh, this means uh, uh, silk words, uh, aurai uh, compendes, gold chains, so silk words and gold, silk words and gold chains. Um, this comes from here, which is uh, from Tac uh, Tacitus. Uh, these and like remarks they listen to with assent by those who make it a practice to eulogise everything coming from sovereigns, both good and bad, were received by the majority in silence or with suppressed murmurs. So they're being both good or bad were received by the majority in silence. Everything coming from sovereigns was received in silence. And this one, uh, which is so magnificent, uh, can have its own uh, thing. Uh, this uh, from uh, Seneca, Seneca and uh, Thaestes, um, for fleeces famous, tis the upright mind that holds true their sovereignty. He has no need of horses, none of arms, and the coward weapons which the Parthian hurls from far when he feigns flight. No need of ensigns, uh, engines, sorry, no need of engines hurling rocks stationed to batter cities to the ground. A king is he who has no fear. A king is he who shall naught desire. Such kingdom on himself each man bestows. Let him stand who will in pride of power on empire's slippery height. Let me be filled with sweet repose in humble station fixed. Let me enjoy untroubled ease and to my fellow citizens unknown to my fellow citizens unknown let my life stream flow in silence so when my days have passed noiselessly away lowly may i die and full of years on him does death lie heavily who but too well known to all dies to himself unknown so that's saying that uh, devere wants to die unknown. He doesn't want to be known for his uh, great acts uh, that he is going to be doing. He doesn't want um, the fame or the fickle opinion uh, that fame brings with it. He wants to be and die uh, and to be his, to his fellow citizens unknown. So uh, there's also this um, reference here. Which is quite interesting. It just says Caesar Rippian Iconologia. Now, there are numerous references to Caesar and actually directly to Caesar Ripper within this book. And in this last emblem, we have Caesar Ripper, which doesn't seem to be referenced. I can't I can't seem to so let me show you some of these references, except what Ripper dedicates to you. And again, Caesar Ripper. Well, here we have a direct parallel between the emblems in the Minerva Britannia and the Iconologia. Okay, this is humorousness. And if we read the description, it starts to help us understand some of the emblems that are in this book. So a, um, so a youth afraid in sundry colours. Oh, look, sundry again, my favourite word. Uh, and painted plumes that overspread his crest. Describe the varying, uh, varying and fantastic white of for like our minds, we are commonly dressed. Remember white from the, the, uh, the sign of the falcon on the front? For like our minds, we're commonly dressed. Except what Ripper has dedicated to you. Well, let's have a look. A young spark in a garment of various colours with a little cap on his head like his clothes, stuck with feathers of several colours, bellows in one hand and spur, not spear, spur in the other. This capricious fellow would be singular. His youth shows his inconstancy, his habit, his fickleness. His cap shows that such variety of unaccountable actions are principally in the fancy. The spur and bellows his proneness to praise other men's virtue, other men's virtue, or to vent uh, pricking scoffs against their vice. 
Oh, look, we have Lady Luck um, and we have Luck. And let's just have a look what she's holding. A poor man going to hang himself, finds a treasure and leaves the rope in the place. He that left the treasure, finding the rope, hanged himself. So this emblem is all about two people who change places. A rich man and a poor man changing places. Uh, that runs so far as it will not turn old, Yeoman will say. Such youth will have their swing. Remember the youth, the, the gaily dressed youth before? Will have their swing and it be but in a halter. So the two ones that we have, we have our fair youth, uh, comically dressed and saying this will swing and butt in a halter. Why is a halter important? Well, because it is the halter that she is hanging, uh, holding. That is a noose of rope. A halter took. A halter took. He takes and leaves his halter in the room. The other halter takes and hangs himself. He's saying it three times, uh, so you really pay attention that this is intended. Yeah, He's saying the rich man, the one who has the glory, and the poor man who has nothing or, or is nothing, are about to change places. Uh, fortune thus dallies ever, the, and, and anon, or swaying all with sceptre in her fist, and bandieth, uh, bandieth us like balls, which way the lift. Yes, which way is it going to be lifted, um, this sceptre, or swaying? So let's have a look at Iconologia, which is a very important book and has loads of proofs in it. Uh, so uh, first thing uh, to notice, moral emblems. Uh, there's a, there seems to be there's lots going on here. There's a guy here uh, in the stonework. Why? Because look at what he's pointing to. I think there might be a V on this guy's face as well. Uh, we have a lion in the stonework um, and a V on top of there. Uh, let's... Uh, Let's just let's have a look. Oh, there's a To The Reader. Now, uh, De Beers not just published in French, he's published in Italian. Uh, goodness knows how much this guy has published. Uh, just as uh, uh, there's a reason he gave you uh, the Cardinot. Cardinot published over 200 works, right? We have an English Renaissance man who we should be very, very proud of because he was a genius, uh, a, a man well ahead of his time. Uh, who's published in many, many different languages, and this is one of his books. So, uh, elements. Yep. The ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, and modern Italians. Uh, what De Vere is doing is he's translating. He's trying to capture all of the wisdom, the learning uh, from antiquity and translate it into the English language to enrich our English tongue and, moreover, our country. Um, so, all lovers of ingenuity. Uh, Mr. Tempest, the care and charge of P. Tempest. Mm, I like that P. Uh, ben J. Uh, Moat, printed by Ben J. Moat. To the reader, uh, this work is owing to the noble's idea and to produce others of his own and other celebrated authors in this science. In this science. He's calling this science. That's interesting. These images are the representations of our notions secret to give body to our thoughts thereby to render uh, them visible ingeniously concealed the mystery of nature and philosophy they represented time days days i'm just going to say that word again because it's more to months and years and continue uh, the invention of this science the invention of this science remember this ingenuity this invention of this science is as ascribed to the egyptians from whence Pythagoras brought it from the fur fur farthest part, uh, the doctrine from those hieroglyphics, uh, hieroglyphic figures, the prophets themselves veiled their sacred oracles with enigmas, divine mysteries under similitudes and parables, under stories drawn under human figures, since man being the measure of all things. Man is but his mind. 
accompanied with curious and solid morals owing to the very learned authors, to very learned authors. Um, the, understanding, uh, the understanding peruser of this book will meet therein things not only to divert the mind, diver, divert the mind, but to instruct it and to inspire him with love of virtue and hatred of vice. Uh, this work has been printed in six several languages, quite a few languages, and is esteemed by the best on the subject of which it treats. Um, and artists in their study of medals uh, and prints, it's used for the instruction in prints and to help their invention. Well, I can tell you I'll be using this in my future work that I, I'll do because I really love this and find it uh, very stimulating. Um, upon these accounts, it has been much desired to have the same in English, which now we have done uh, for the public benefit, not doubting, but that it will be acceptable to the lovers of art, as well as instruction to all sorts of people whatsoever. So we're going to have a look at some of these um, images because they partly give the game away. Uh, so we have inspiration here, holding a sunflower, uh, a sunflower, the heliotrope, um, that, as is always, turns towards the sun. So a sinner once inspired turns with a, <laughs> all affection towards God. That's really funny. You'll find out why in a bit. Um, all of this is very funny. And idea, idea is brilliant because it's what is idea pointing to. And if you see, you'll notice that there is a bird in the clouds or a V. And a V there as well. She's pointing to this V just as in the elements of geometry they are also pointing uh, to the falcon. Uh, she's pointing to a V and it looks like she may have like a, a falcon um, perch uh, there for her. Uh, let's look at this one, the free will. The free will. Uh, we'll see that we have a, a stick, a scepter with a, a V on. Uh, well, actually, uh, this is... Um, his legs also form a V, it should be said. Uh, this is the letter uh, Epsilon, declares the two ways a man's uh, two ways in a man's life. Notice uh, the the double V there, and also notice the capital of the M. Remember, if you flip that upside down, that is two Vs, and also contains a V in the centre. It's, it's a lovely, lovely letter, that one. Uh, in man's life, virtue and vice, as is divided at the top. So one is the path of virtue, one is the path of vice. Apart from, as is divided at the top. Well, why don't we look uh, to the top of this section? Um, and you will see, we've got diverse again, two Vs, di, two, vers, Vs. Uh, diverse means, and then the M straight after it again. He really is trying to tell you he's doing this. Uh, so we have the double V at the top, divided at the top, as he did tell you. Um, and we also have a, a will there. So our free will striking quite a imposing pose there. Uh, and if we have a look at liberality, who's next to this? Well, what do we have? This eagle denotes the habit of living, uh, habit of liberality, for she always leaves some of her prey to other birds. Where is that bird looking? Oh, at free will. So that bird is looking at our free will and she leaves her prey to other birds. So the eagle isn't going to eat it. Eat, uh, free will, I wonder what is going to prey upon free will. Uh, also notice there's two horns in that uh, cornucopia. There's two horns, two ox horns. It's worth noticing. Uh, this, I think, is the most important emblem in this book. This is, unsurprisingly, Verity. And adjacent to that is modest bashfulness. We should always look at what's adjacent or next to or around some of the things that we're looking for. So what's adjacent? Well, modest bashfulness. We've got 311. If you um, do some digit sum addition, you're going to get V. 5V. If we do some digit sum addition, you have 6, our perfect number. So you know something good is coming Already, if you add 7 and 8 together, you get 15. 15 added together is 6. 
So there's something good here. What do we have? Yep, this is the only time in this book we get our falcon. So Verity, the, the, uh, the naked beauty holds a sun in her right hand, in her left a book open with a palm. Under one foot a globe, the globe of the world, uh, naked, uh, because downright simplicity is natural to her. I wonder uh, who would have the globe underfoot um, players. Downright simplicity is natural to her. Downright. Downright is, uh, well, it's opposite of upright, isn't it? Um, the sun shows her great delight in clearness. The book that with truth of things may be found in good authors. The palm, her rising, the more she is dispersed. The globe, that being immortal, she is the strongest of all things in the world and therefore tramples upon it. Uh, so, modest bashfulness. Bashful, of course, means unassuming in one's ability. Reluctant to draw attention to oneself. So, modest bashfulness. Uh, an elephant's head for her headdress. A falcon in her right hand, in her right hand, and a scroll in her left, inscribed Dysopia Procol, which means defective vision from far away. So the elephant, uh, bashfulness, denotes bashfulness, seeking privacy in the venereal, uh, the, the venereal, it's got veer in, uh, act, the falcon, is modesty, for if it fail to catch its prey, it is so ashamed that it can scarce be reclaimed to the fist. Don't worry, the uh, falcon will very much catch its prey, I promise you that. So there we have uh, Verity with a quill and a book in his hand, nice kind of little V there as well, I suppose. The sun, the globe underfoot, the falcon who is directly looking at Verity. Um, that's, that's probably one of the most important in this book, but there's loads of other ones that are really important for the argument that we're making. Uh, so we're going to keep going. Uh, you'll notice the V's around in clearness. Um, and here we have celerity, speed, swiftness, and we have a hawk. Hawks and falcons are often uh, mixed up and, and put into the same bag, so to say. Um, Sparrowhawk, which is a type of falcon, I believe, a hawk, flying in the air. So we have a, a, a Mrs. Swiftness. This is speed. Uh, things being naturally very quick in their motion, which well express, expresseth celerity. OK, so uh, here's boasting, making a great show covered with peacock feathers, with a trumpet in her left hand and her right in the air, upright in the air. Uh, and what's she pointing to? Well, look, there seems to be two two V's in the air there. Um, the trumpet boasting oneself, it is blown by one's own breath, for vain boasters take delight in publishing their own actions. Vain boasters take delight in publishing their own actions. But we're not dealing with a vain boaster because he's not publishing uh, under his own actions. And what do we have uh, as well? Well, opposite it, we have Rome Eternal. We have someone brandishing a spear with also just just notice this. We have a bird uh, on a globe. That's actually really, really important. Um, we have a bird stands a bird with a long beak standing on a globe. You're going to meet that again. Oh, it's a phoenix as well. So the problem like every time I do this, this, this is the first time I haven't rehearsed this, so this is the first time I'm, I'm doing it in its entirety. So for me, this is really lovely to kind of watch uh, things that I've only like found like two days ago. Um, it's nice to see all of this knit together. So that's a bird. The bird is a phoenix, um, which is on top of that globe, which you will see again. Also, note note the snake at the bottom and this 
uh, this this circle, which is eternity, because this author uh, will, who has founded uh, a new Rome in Britain, will have his eternity. That is an incredibly important uh, picture. Please do remember that because I'm not. It's not in the slides later, but that is so important. So, um, glory. His glory. The upper part of her body is almost naked. She bears a sphere, uh, whereon. Uh, are the 12 signs and a little image holding a palm in one hand and a garland in another. You can see uh, in uh, her right hand you have a uh, what looks like a poet with a quill and a wreath of laurels. So that's a poet in one hand. And on the other side you've got that circle, that ring, that eternity. Okay. And also just notice, do you notice this trumpet? Do you notice this trumpet from uh, our, our vainglorious boaster before has been laid at its feet of glory, right? This person is not boasting about what they're doing. Uh, yeah, and nobility, uh, which is quite important. We have spear, brandishing a spear in, his, in her hand. Um, and, and that is of, the picture is of Minerva. So it's of Minerva, Palais. Um, the spear and Minerva show that nobility is acquired by arts or arms. <laughs> it's either by arts or arms, uh, Minerva being the protector, pre protectress of both alike. True nobility arises from virtuous actions. Again, there's virtue. Why is he saying virtue to me uh, so many times? That's because virtue is so important, as you'll find with one of our key proofs uh, later. Uh, and, and it is a conclusive proof. Uh, preservation. Rings are for remembrance. Can you see she's brandishing a ring? Rings are for eternity. They are for remembrance. Wedding rings, for instance. They are for eternity and for remembrance. Uh, so we've talked about this, Minerva. Uh, also notice that these are all in rings. So... He is invention. We like invention. Um, now, be really careful with when you read this, because there's a lot of invention that's taking place um, within the description itself. Uh, so invention. This mistress of arts appears in a white robe. So think of if you if you take a lot of what she's saying is the opposite, you come closer to the truth. Wherein is written uh, non alandi uh, uh, two uh, little wings on her head. Um, in one hand, the image of nature, a non alunde means from no other place. Uh, so it's not coming uh, from any other place. It's original. Uh, you'll notice um, two little wings on her head. <laughs> Just subtly insinuated there. Um, and we have the image of nature. You'll notice the image of nature there um, very much looks like the image of of a man or woman. Um, that is the image of nature, holding up the mirror to nature, so to say. Uh, and you also notice these strings attached to this image of nature, much like a puppet, so to say. And she has a cuff on the other sleeve, a cuff much like the cuff of a shirt or the cuff of gloves. Uh, with the motto, ad operum, to work. Youth denotes many spirits in the brain where invention is formed. Uh, the white robe, the uh, perenne, perennis of it, not making use of other men's labours. Uh, which, is, of course, is quite funny because she's not making use of other men's labours, but she may be making use of other men's names, as the motto shows. The wings, elevation of intellect, naked arms... There you go. Naked arms. Very funny because we're talking about the clothing of arms. Uh, her being ever, the, in action, the life of invention. The image of nature shows her invention. Well, if you notice what's in the cloud there, not only do you have uh, this falcon, but you also seem to have this T. Now, this T is really important. Uh, it comes way back uh, from antiquity, from, from uh, like the Hebrew tav, uh, tav meaning mark, 
Uh, it was the mark um, that was put up uh, so the Egyptians could plough um, their oxen uh, in, in straight lined furrows. So T is really important. It means mark. It's also a cross. Um, so uh, holds a trumpet. This is printing. Holds a trumpet in one hand uh, round with a uh, scroll inscribed uh, ubiqui. Um, semper vive, uh, always alive, uh, of uh, house uh, leak with the word semper on it, always. A printing press by her. Uh, remember, the printing press is it's still a fairly recent invention. So I'd imagine like put, putting a printing press, this modern, exciting technology, in the hands of a very, perhaps one of the world's most literary men, you're going to get some magic. Um, you, a bitqui signifies it's being famous everywhere. Okay, just notice that um, that Y, which we've seen from Free Will, that Epsilon and the W V, uh, the double V, De Vere, right next to each other, everywhere, famous everywhere. Okay, and if we have a look at uh, Ubiqui, well, let's actually have a look on that scroll. Well, what are the two things that you can see? But we have our V and our V. We have our double V on this scroll wrapped around this scroll we have our double v uh, we also have one called the will uh, that and acts like one groping out her way in the dark because seeing nothing herself uh, and she has wings uh, on her feet um, which mark efforts towards heaven efforts towards heaven that's also important by the wings on her feet. Uh, so if you've ever wondered where 101 comes from, uh, allow me to uh, show you. This is where it comes from, 101. Uh, the term apparently was first introduced by the University of Buffalo, which is funny if you think what Buffalo is in 1929. Um, but this book predates, far predates, uh, when they introduced that to name their courses. And I would not be surprised at all uh, if that has actually been named after this uh, uh, image here, 101, learning. Um, imitation. Pencils in her right hand, a mask in her left and an ape at her feet. Uh, the imitation of human actions. Uh, the mask and ape demonstrate the imitation of human actions. The ape imitates men and the other deportment of men upon the stage. So those monkeys uh, that you saw and are seeing, uh, for instance, in this one, well, that means it's imitation. It's it's playing like actors on a stage, imitating um, people. So here's our English fleece that not for wit, but for his wealth, tis said, a worthy knight away, hobby horse. A hobby horse. Please, could you remember the word hobby horse? You'll meet that again uh, magnificently. And we can see this imitation uh, in, and you will see this uh, uh, frequently. Uh, for instance, in the Minerva Britannia, you had that imitation. Virtue. As I said, virtue is very important. One of the most important things and aspects in this game. We have two... Well, we've got a number of uh, virtues. Here's virtue. A uh, has wings behind, a spear in her right hand, a crown of laurel and a sun in her bosom. Uh, bosom. Uh, the wings signify her soaring aloft far above the vulgar. Uh, that virtue inspires virtue to the whole body. Now, that's actually referring to, in a political sense, uh, the whole body politic. So virtue, inspiring virtue in the whole body. Uh, she is ever green. Again, veer and vert. We have the green, he loves telling you this. Uh, the spear dignity ruling over vice. Uh, and we have virtuous action. Uh, a man of lovely aspect is had surrounded uh, with resplendent rays. Hath a mantle embroidered, holds a spear in one hand and in the other a book 
and tramples on a death's head. And tramples on a death's head. <laughs> oh, that's great. Just notice how he's trampling on a skull there, right? And we have a snake, we have a skull, we have a spear in his right hand. Uh, a virtuous man never uh, denigrates, uh, uh, degenerates armed. A virtuous man never de degenerates armed. No, he certainly will not. Uh, because always upon his guard against vice, and therefore the serpent lies dead. The book shows that learning, joined with arms, makes a man famous, and for veer or ever renowned. And indeed it will. Um, it really, really will. So, as I said, that's the most important, I believe, emblem there. But actually, uh, there, there are a few more others uh, that are super, super important. Actually, it might not be the most important one, now I'm thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> so, let's have a look at this one. Um, this one's interesting. We have a winged key, yet nothing worth, uh, unless ye herewith find the fruits of skill and bettering of your mind. That's actually from the last emblem, but it's overspilled onto this one, but still relevant. So, uh, this is important because, as I showed you, with the falcon shroud, we have our your key lock um, here's your uh, lock you'll notice there's an x for that windmill in the background um, that cross on the key the heart of its base the wings um, the free will uh, so tandem divulganda means finally published uh, where was i going this uh, and great secrets though they hidden lie abroad at last with swiftest wings they fly. Oh yeah, that, that was why I showed you the Y, because you've got the Y there, free will, and the Y there, free will, throw, throw the Epsilon, as he said, the Epsilon, the Epsilon. Uh, that's really important. It's referring uh, to this free will very cleverly. So, and of greatest secrets, though they hidden lie abroad at last, with swiftest wings they fly. It is referring to this falcon upon the author and his Minerva. Now, why is this falcon important? Well, if we refer back to the Earl of Oxford's To the Reader and have a look at his last two lines, for he that beats the bush the bird not gets, but he who sits still and holdeth fast the net. Well, this is again uh, witty, bird, fast. You're not going to catch this bird because the falcon is the fastest animal in the world the peregrine uh, peregrine uh, falcon is the fastest animal in the world you're welcome to look that up if you didn't know that already so he's chosen the fastest animal in the world uh, to do this the paragon of animals uh, to quote hamlet so the uh, the art of english posy um we'll come to that in a second uh, and also, if you notice on the uh, the front uh, of this book, uh, you're going to see that, again, we have in an arm, in a shield, uh, we have, there's actually other things going on here as well, but you have um, uh, your bird uh, right there on the front of it. And that is where uh, he's he's told you um, that very witty thing. You also notice this, I bet you missed this the first time. Blind eyes can judge, no colours, and ignorance may not meddle with excellent conceit. You see this, I return them in haste, fearing to foul the paper or injure the ink. Um, that pet's also important, which we'll come to in a second. But now that we are starting to understand, you can see the wit uh, that is actually present uh, in these things. Um, so uh, let's have a look here at the sedents of armoury. Uh, as blazon by the days in the week devised by falcon principal here halt of england well that's an archaic spelling of falcon um principal here halt of england in the time of the famous king edward the uh, third in the sonnets i love to make reference to the sonnets we don't have a reference to the falcon but we do have this one uh, some glory in the birth some in their skill Hawks and hounds, uh, summon their hawks and hounds, summon their horses. Delight then hawks or horses be. Now, whereas there's no reference directly to falcons, uh, 
there is in the art of English poesy, uh, which is a very, very important book in the book that started all of this for me. Um, there is one reference to a falcon and we're going to have a look at it. So as falcon fares to buzzards flight, as eagles eyes to owlets sight, as fierce saker to coward kite, as brightest noon to darkest night, as summer sun exceedeth far the moon and every other star, so far my princess praise doth pass the famous queen that ever was. That ever was. If we actually have a look where this is from, though, and here's where the real wit comes in. Uh, this is uh, Expedito, or the Speedy uh, Dispatcher. The Speedy Dispatcher. Speedy for a reason. And by quick and swift argument dispatched by his persuasion um, to, uh, to get rid out of the way very quickly, uh, both figurative and argument, argumentative manner of speech. Uh, as that he, in a lit uh, litigious uh, case for land uh, would prove it not for adversary but his clients no man can say it his uh, it's his by heritage nor by legacy or uh, testator's device nor that it came by purchase or engage nor from his prince for any good service prince for any good service then needs must it be his by very wrong which he hath offered this poor plaintiff so long then, though we might call this figure very well properly the Paragon, yet dare I say, uh, yet dare I not so to do for fear of the courtier's envy who will have no man use that term, but after a country manner that is praising of horses, hawks and hounds. You've just seen that in the sonnets. Pearls, diamonds, rubies, emeralds and other precious stones, uh, spe uh, especially of fair women. So that was the reference that you've seen um, in uh, the sonnets. By parag uh, paragonising or setting one to the other, which moved the zealot's poet. Uh, again, more paragon. I will let our figure enjoy his best benoan name and call him still in all ordinary cases the figure of comparison as when a man will seem to make things appear good or bad better or worse more or less excellent either upon spite or for pleasure or for any other good affection then he sets the less by the greater or the greater to the less the equal to his equal and by such confronting of them together drives out the true odds that is betwixt them and makes it better appear as when we sang our sovereign lady thus in the 20th Parthenade as falcon fares to buzzards flight. So uh, falcon, oh, the falcon is so, so important. It's referenced there in the Art of English Posey, uh, a figure of which I will use on you uh, in a bit. So uh, in Shakespeare's work, in his canon, oh, we've got a fair few references. A falconer's voice to lure his tassel back again. Uh, bull, which is quite funny. An ox, um, as confident as is the falconer's uh, falcon's flight against a bird, I do with Marlborough fight. Uh, from Henry uh, VI, uh, with falconer's hallowing uh, for flying at the brook. Uh, your falcon maids, and what a pitch uh, that flew above the rest. The pitch is the highest point of the falcon's flight. Uh, they know their master's love to be aloft um, and bears his thoughts above his falcon's pitch. Uh, my lord, tis but a basic noble mind that mounts no higher than a bird can soar. Um, we also have this, talking of hawking. Nothing else, my lord. Nothing else. So... Um, talking of, of De Vere. Uh, Flo, um, I bless the time um, when my good falcon made her flight across thy father's ground. Uh, apprehends nothing but uh, jollity. Became a bull. Uh, this is really important. This is about transformations. The shapes of beasts upon them. Jupiter became a bull, an ox, and bellowed. And green vert, Neptune, a ram, and bleated, and the fire, uh, fire robed, uh, fire robed god, golden Apollo, a poor 
humble swain, a shepherd. As I seem now, their transformations. Oh, uh, that was, of course, uh, Florio, the character of uh, Florio. I, I mean, Florizel. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, and the clown, good, even... Uh, so clowns, always important. As the ox hath uh, his bow, sir, the horse his curb, and the falcon her bells. As the ox hath his bow, the falcon her bells. So man hath his desires. Uh, he also says, no, truly, for the truest poetry is the most feigning. The truest poetry is the most feigning. And lovers are given... And lovers are given to poetry, and what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers, they do feign. Hmm. They do feign indeed. Uh, there's a lovely sun, Apollo sun at the top top of that. I believe um, Florio translated the works of Montaigne for the first time into English and I believe he also has one of the first English dictionaries and there's many many parallels um, between Florio and Shakespeare's work how funny that students of armory and now uh, dedicated unto your honours the first fruits the first fruits of me gathered in other men's orchards pretty sure Florio uh, did the first fruits, didn't he? Uh, trusting that your wisdoms will take in good part my meaning and endeavour, although oppressed. Oh, huh. there's, there's some first fruits. First fruits for you. So, uh, measure for measure. Uh, as falcon doth the fowl, it is yet a devil. Well, we met a uh, devil bird before. His filth within being cast as he would appear, a pond as deep as hell. Indeed, this is a pretty deep pond, but by fatal fortune, I'm not quite sure, uh, I have managed to fish out a crown for you, um, as you'll see. The Rape of Lucrece. Um, this said, he shakes aloft his Roman blade, which like a falcon towering in the skies, uh, coucheth... Uh, the fowl below with his wings shade, whose crooked beak threats if he mounts he dies, so under his insulting falchion lies, with trembling fear as fowl hear falcons' bells. With trembling fear as fowl hear falcons' uh, bells from the late uh, the rape of Lucrece. And again, you have so much, so much to do with falcons and arms in this. Um, here's a lot to do with arms. We coated them on the way. The target, the shield, or the blank verse, 4T. I'm going to start feeding the 4Ts in. Uh, innovation, well, you've met uh, innovation in Iconologia. Um, oh, no, that was invention, my apologies. Uh, little uh, Eases that cry out on the top of the question. Well, Eases is a young falcon. So little eases that cry out on the top of question. 40. Uh, judgment in such matters cried in the top of mind. As Cully, I remember one said, there were no salads in the line. A salad is a spice a herb. It's also a joke. A salad is also a curved helmet. Uh, and engravings. There's lots of interesting definitions to that word, but it means there's more in these lines uh, than the surface would have you think. And there's a deeper meaning behind some of what is being said, uh, which is the work of a genius to kind of layer um, meaning in into some of the greatest ever work that's ever been written. Nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affection, but called it an honest method. One I chiefly loved was Aeneas's tale, um, the high, high, uh, Hyrcanian beast. Uh, the Hyrcanian comes from uh, uh, the Greek, the name of a region uh, borrowing from the old Persian, Verkana, which means wolf, a fierce lion. So it's, it's borrowing this name from Verkana. So that's where the Hyrcanian uh, beast comes from. It's a fierce lion. 
comes from Ver, uh, Verkana. It is not so. Uh, it begins, and then Hamlet goes on to explain uh, arms. He who sable arms, a black as his purpose, did the knight resemble black complexion, uh, with heraldry more dismal, head to toe, uh, uh, jewels horribly tricked, whose blood of fathers and sons, first and last, quite important there, all raised, all raised, uh, gore, uh, with which has ore inside it, that gold with eyes, uh, yeah. So as you can see, he's he's uh, talking. Um, he, he's giving you all of this heraldic term uh, in the speech because he's trying to communicate that this is about the arms. Uh, if we have a look uh, at back to the ascendants, uh, this is a badge um, of an esquire of England. If you marvel why I set not the same upon a wreath, as now is most usual, I say to you, in the time of King Henry V and long on after, no man had his badge set on a wreath under the degree of knight. So not set on a wreath, a wreath under the degree of knight, but the order is worn away and every man, uh, and every man wreath at this day. Every man. Hmm. As he... Uh, so much as the tailor and the shoemaker, uh, but will be as a gentleman like as a gentleman himself. Now, he, he tells a lovely story uh, about a tailor and a shoemaker. Now, uh, I, I read a pretty story of Sir uh, Philip Cawthrop, a, a worthy knight of Norwich in the time um, of King Henry the Seventh, uh, as like apes counterfeit that as appertaineth not to them. Hmm. Uh, so John Drake's shoemaker of the town, uh, seeing a knight uh, in gown, cloth, lying, they see a, a knight's lovely material, like a curtain, um, of the same cloth and price, um, entreats the tailor uh, to have a gown of the same material uh, that the knight would have it made of. Uh, quoth the tailor to some Sir John Drake's, who will have it made um in the same fashion as yours is made of. Well, the knight, being wily, says, well, OK, in, in good times be it, I will have mine uh, with loads of cuts through it, please. Can you can you make a dog's dinner of it, please? Um, he says to the tailor. And uh, so so the shoemaker, John, John Drakes, uh, I like the name John, uh, comes back to uh, the, the, the tailor, uh, only to find uh, that the tailor has uh, cut, uh, full of cuts, began to square uh, with the tailor um, for making the gown in the same as the knight. But my latchet, quoth John Jake, I will never wear gentleman's fashion again. Uh, a latchet uh, is a loop of cord leather used for fastening armour. So this is... Um, a story, an allegory of a coat of arms uh, and someone trying uh, to uh, wear a coat of arms uh, that is not natural uh, to uh, to them, who isn't a gentleman. Uh, what's also quite interesting, um, so in my opinion, the knight served the cobbler right as well he uh, had deserved. Uh, and then at the end, Theseus, the 10th king of Athens, gave for his badge. Uh, well, and we'll see, but it's of an ox. Now, um, there's an elephant in the room here, which is this. You have some side notes there. And let's just kind of have a look at these, uh, look at these, uh, this side note. And the first thing you might notice is you have this, which seems to me to be a hand. Interesting. So this, I believe, uh, of crests bound by uh, shows understanding of crests bound by themselves uh, for or badges. For I have sundry ancient seals of my ancestors in Edward the Third's time and Richard the uh, Second, where this coat of arms and crests obey the same cogniz cognizance. Cognize. Notice he's put I believe and cognize in brackets. That's really important. It's set upon on uh, 
the helmet, both with uh, wreath and mantle. Okay, so you need to know what a cognizance are. We're talking about badges here. A cognizance is a heraldic badge, emblem or device formerly worn by retainers of a royal or noble house. Okay, the word cognizance, cognize, is really, really important. Uh, it denotes um, nobility and royalty, such as this one, uh, which is uh, the uh, Henry Peachams, but it's also uh, very similar to the Prince of Wales. Um, emblem. So this is a cognizance. And a cognizance also is an awareness to cogn a cogn a cognizance is also an awareness, realization, perception, or knowledge of something. To be aware of this cognizance. Uh, so I think this is really important. I believe in cognizance in brackets. Why is this so important? Well, well, let the blazon go and use this word merry. For so it is well blazed and very ancient, and is a Spanish coat most commonly. So we're using an old word, this badge. No man has had this badge set on any wreath under the degree of a knight. Draft 1, draft 2 and draft 3 all contain the words crest or cognizance. The word cognizance should not be there, according to Gerard Lee. Okay, so that word cognizance in those draft grants should not be there. Okay, and we continue with thesis, the badge of an ox, um, who was, I think he was the, was, he was the 10th, wasn't it? Well, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, um, stamped the same thereon. Uh, we have an eagle for the badge in uh, this Roman here. Um, the sixth of the name, French king, took on him to bear the flying heart. For that he dreamed that he rode on such a one in his pastime of hawking. Princes may take unto themselves what devices they will, so it be born of no man before that time. Wherefore have you uh, used the number of nine uh, in all your demonstrations, uh, more than any other? Well, the figure whereof holdeth all other under it, as by the art of arithmetic, you may soon perceive. Well, six and nine are really important. So let's just quickly have a look at six and nine and their uses, uh, usages in other places. Well, so here's six and nine, uh, a thing that maketh all the foundations upon unsure ground to be very firm. OK, notice that there are V's. OK, these are V's on this shield. OK, uh, well, we have this one here again. We have a V. Uh, the last one, hold, hold on, Glenn. The last one isn't isn't a V. Well, or it is a wavy V. But let's have a look at what it actually says. Uh, this place uh, that shall be engrailed, invect, or otherwise. Well, what do these terms mean? Well, there's engrailed, there's invect or invect, uh, and you can see that actually we have V's in this line. So there's so there are V's here. Um, also, uh, or otherwise, and you can see um, that double V there, because uh, I am in uh, piles, uh, you shall have a coat to learn by uh, the like thereof in se is seldom seen. Coat to learn by like, seldom seen. Well, if we think about this wavy line and where we see this, um, this pile, um, well, a field of azure and the pile is or, Pile in bend is all. Well, that's that's the sun, isn't it? Well, here we go. Look, here's some here's some wavy, um, wavy piles, and it's in the colour scheme of our um, azure and or. You also have this one here. We can now see, and we're getting used to these seeing these V's in things. Uh, he beareth party per bust bar erased argent and there. It is good and lawful armory, and this is from um, the first folio to my to the memory of my beloved, the author, and you can see uh, these these very clearly there for you. Uh, if we have a look at page ninety six, well, we only go and have a retelling of the story of King Lear, 
uh, but just title of inheritance such wisdom temperance and noble courage reigned and i am constrained not to pass her worthy doings in science we're talking about uh, cordelia he praises the virtue of cordelia in this so he retells the story and he's praising her noble virtues um in this on page 96 a retelling of king lear uh with praising cordelia uh if you also have a look at this i just thought this was quite interesting here's another interesting printing error uh, isabel wife of king edward ii philip wife to king edward iii i didn't realize uh edward iii was that uh, was that progressive as a monarch that's brilliant though really happy uh, and jane the wife of king edward uh, the fourth of course that's because that should be philippa why is that error being made well because it is between uh, edwards three edwards uh, and we can see the v's immediately on these uh, but nowadays if he be a mean man either birth or lineage uh, for every man will wear as best doth uh, without all order for now we have a common saying win gold and wear it so by that means a gentleman by, by patent will have his doubling as rich as a baron or a king of the garter under which two degrees none should double with ermine but there is a good hope that the earl ma r shall of england uh, will see to the amendment thereof as of other things that are out of order so people with too much gold on their shield it's out of order uh, whereof mourning at burials is not one of the least as these day as this day day is important for you shall hear uh, for you shall have an artificer such one as no gentleman shall give to his burial eight black gowns with hoods and all they shall be mourners and an earl by law an order of arms may have no more many of those abuses were well reformed in king edward's the first time by the earl uh, th of lancaster uh, Lay Leicester and um, derby and constable of england this noble man ordained by special reformation that no man should wear a hood on his shoulder in the time of mourning except where he were a gentleman but on uh, only a on or only a tippet of three nails uh, breadth also that no parson curate church wardens or other should pull down any achievement coat of arms or pin pinion uh, or erase any tomb out of churches or churchyards uh, the days of jack straw willing war and their companions in time of king henry the sixth jack cade in the now this is important because uh, in the last figure of rhetoric uh, he teaches in the art of english poesy he says many insurrection rebellions have been stirred up in this realm as that of jack straw and jack uh, cade uh, the reign of king edward the fourth the bastard of falconbridge oh falconbridge there uh, the jerry gate in king henry uh, the seventh his days parkin warbeck that was the ardens of park hall um it's war warbeck warwick parkin uh the blacksmith all which with their accompany accomplices have accomplices have defaced the laws of arms amongst all this uh rascal nothing that he did but spoiled beer houses i believe he was a beer taster wasn't he i believe john shakespeare was at saint catherine's um and that was but twice which was either for, for brewing now the reason why i keep saying day so much is because day is really really important uh, i'm setting you up for what's coming um and there's some really great revelations that are coming but i have to set this up first uh, this is a ring um rings for remembrance for that they had that he deceived the goddess of the element of fire and did bring it to man's use made a ring with a stone therein and wear it in like fort sort uh, are they uh, they used for remembrances so rings are used for remembrances just like john d which we looked at uh, in the last video there is our ring for remembrance 
life is death and death is life but in these days some gentlemen will not have any token of arms graven in their rings for which much to their worship but rather a graven image or the likeness of a, a charnel uh, of a man uh, which they term death if death were of gold as that it is uh, as that is there is many that would run to embrace him and now flieth away from his uh, lean looks but yet their good um intent 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 that's important um as this today such shall thou be tomorrow so these days are really really important and rings as we remember are important for preservation now um we're going to put some things together here. Uh, this is important. Pieces you shall perceive the better in the coat next to the uh, burulet. Uh, field which is more estimation than is well considered by many that bear the same. Must stand always by couples as in next to. And I did tell you to remember uh, that rings a for remembrance and it's in a triangle now what we're going to do is we're going to put these together uh, in a second and see something really cool uh, rings are for remembrance so we're going to put all of these kind of elements of these arms together in a second uh, so uh, this is i don't i don't have the the rights to this so i've had to uh, to draw this uh for you uh, but it will make it will make the point i'll put a link to it in the um the description uh, so that you can see this uh, with your own eyes uh, but these are the crucial elements it's what's adjacent to shakespeare's coat of arms now this is a uh, shakespeare's uh, arms challenged by one ralph brooke as presented to queen elizabeth okay here's shakespeare number four and we have hall and clark adjacent well who happened to be hall and clark edward hall edward clark Arlington. Oh, there's some 28 there. We like 28 or 82. It's an anagram, it's 28, the perfect number. Uh, and if we put our coat of arms that I've just been talking about together, we get this this arm there. We put all the elements he's told us to together, uh, which is next to Shakespeare's coat of arms. 28 again. Notice this is the pet. The pet, uh, pet house, petus, pet house, petus. I think. Uh, and also notice this peculiar. There's a there's a um, a smaller shield next to this. Is that because Robert uh, Robert Ralph Brooke is challenging the shield? Because um, this is Lord Morley's shield here. Okay. And well, who was Morley? But Sir Edmund de Morley, uh, and there was also Sir Robert. Uh, de Morley, who served under, both served under, either King Edward II or King Edward III. And that is one of their arms there, as you can see, very, very similar. So really, we shouldn't uh, be using uh, the marks uh, from previous ago, which is why uh, uh, Ralph Brooke uh, challenged this coat of arms. Now, now that we've done another uh, one, let's do another so here we go. This is Ralph Brooks' Compilations of Arms granted to William Dethick. So here's another document. And look, we have the same shield. Okay, Pet House of Norwich. Okay, notice uh, Sagar, William Sagar gave, uh, to, that's the same person who signs the Minerva Britannia. Uh, William Sagar gave, I think, uh, one crest uh, and had uh, 40 shillings a coat. So we have our four T and a T on the top of it. Pet, pet. And why is that important? Sir, if you add or write more, I pray you, make me a partaker. I say with pet, Rock. Yeah? And it, it, I, I did mention the art before. Uh, but also, interesting, look at this. Sagar gave to the one west a crest that had the coat. And this coat here at the bottom why is that important because here's another document and I'll, I'll include these are all here's one that you can actually see you remember 
It's 28 again, per second perfect number. We have this coat, the one you've just seen next to. Next to. William Sagar, again, 40 shillings. Uh, so a copy of a note, some coats and crests uh, given to William Dethick when he was herald. So you can see uh, this same coat next to this this pet house uh, coat next to Shakespeare's coat of arms, which is really important. So these are just more indications uh, that this really isn't what you think. Uh, if we have a look at this, and this is absolutely hilarious, in William Smith's um, uh, book of coats and crests, started the 28th of May, 1602, we have this picture of Shakespeare's coat of arms. But, um, this is British Library, I believe, uh, but we also have... Um, Oh yeah, if you just this is page sixty six, six a perfect number, and you've also have got twenty eight second perfect number written uh, under that. Okay, uh, but you also have in this same book, on page seventeen or seventeen four, this picture. This is a very sick looking falcon that falcon doesn't look happy at all very dejected why well because his spear is in the same orientation in the same oblique direction uh, as the spear that is on the shield now if we apply the same logic we were just using and have a look uh, at this sickly uh, poor sickly falcon in the uh, in the coat of arms well let's have a look and what is adjacent? So here's our sick falcon. Well, we have a hat with wings on and a sun behind. We have a V. It's been tricked with V. An O. An A, which is a V upside down. Uh, it's uh, someone from Warwickshire. Uh, just clock this Pegasus as well. This Pegasus is really, really important and will be towards the end. Uh, and this ox, we have an ox on the other side. We actually have an ox on the other side. Uh, what we may also have here is E, V and O, the initials of De Vere. Uh, and on this side we have Edward. <laughs> um, tricked with V again. Uh, so you can see there are, there are some really telling indications, if you look what's next to it, uh, that this coat of arms... Uh, really doesn't belong to the person that you think it does. It's just looking around. Um, there are too many coincidence. Uh, coincidence is here for it to be like statistically unviable. So you do uh, have to um, start to kind of realize, recognize that there are some strong indications. Now, a accompanying um, this Shakespeare's coat of arms is a motto, uh, which uh, non sans duat, not without right. And this is why I'm really grateful to that article in the New York Times. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. So there we are, the four different variations uh, by uh, William Dethick. Not entirely sure what's been capitalised and what's not. Now, uh, in the New York Times, uh, Ben Johnson's play, um, not without uh, every man out of his humour, Sogliato's motto is not without mustard. I was really grateful uh, that they mentioned that. Uh, because I thought, okay, that's that's quite interesting. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit more research on that. I'm really glad I did. So there's the colour of mustard for you, um, which is has been used here. Very similar to gold, not quite, but very simi similar uh, to gold. And he's saying it's not without mustard, because there's quite a lot of, uh, of, of mustard on Shakespeare's coat of arms. So um, here's another character. Let the world be not without mustard. This is the actual quote where it comes from. Um, Let the world be not without mustard. Your crest is very rare, sir. Indeed, his his crest is very rare. Um, swear arms, uh, then bar, bear arms who have negligence stop mustard pots with their father's pedigrees. Do you remember that from the Ascedents earlier? Ascedents of armories. We have a mustard reference. So... Let's just examine the uh, the character of Sogliado. Um, Sogliado, uh, an essential clown, brother to uh, Sordido, 
yet so enamoured of the name of a gentleman that he will have it though he buys it. He comes up every, every, up every uh, term, uh, term to learn to take uh, tobacco and see new motions. He is in his kingdom when he can get himself into the company where he may well, uh, may be well laughed at. Indeed. Um, so, enamoured of the name of gem gentleman, kingdom, really interesting because if you think about what that means, uh, Dom originally means decree or judgment, so he's at his king's judgment. Uh, Sogliado, can you see the uh, Malaya in it? Perhaps there's an anagram of good liars. Um, so, <laughs> the important thing though um, is in the previous play, Every Man in His Humour, Shakespeare was included in his cast. Do you remember the figure of subtraction? That's all I'll say. So, as a player, he was included in the cast as a player, as an actor. Uh, it was not near his thoughts, this is the author, uh, that hath published this either to tra traduce, uh, traduce the author or to make vulgar and cheap any peculiar and sufficient deserts of the actors in the play, but rather where, where as many uh, censors fluttered about it to give all leave and leisure, to give all leave and leisure. Shakespeare was not included in this cast uh, when he can get himself into company, if I remind you, to give all leave and leisure. Shakespeare is not in this company. Uh, he has been given leisure. And this is hence why it's called every man out of his humour. Via. Remember that why? Free will. Via, free will. So Via's uh, free will man out of his humour. It's the figure of subtraction. He's not in this play. Sometimes what we leave out is as as telling as what we include out of his humour. So the comical satire of every man. I could also do this since uh, epsilon uh, in, in Greek can sometimes be an E sound. I could also do this and this. And you might say it's every man, evir man, uh, out of his humour. Um, every uh, Edward Veer's man out of his humour, particularly if you see that there's a big S there, so you could take it as Edward Veer's man out of his humour. Um, so remember humour, if we remember humoresque, that was the picture in the Iconologia of the man sillily uh, dressed uh, in outlandish clothing, that was humoresque. So what's this plot about? Well, it's a general mockery of socially ambitious fools. Sogliado is a country bumpkin new to the city who boasts of the coat of arms he has recently purchased, containing more than hath been publicly spoken or acted. Containing more than hath been acted. Uh, with double V in uh, the several or all Vs, you could say, character of uh, very, very uh, per person. This is wonderful. So this is the uh, uh, Pantariolo, Pantariolo, which has R in, actually. If you've um, been following my work, Huntsman, and I'll talk about that later anyway. Uh, Huntsman, uh, we have um, Hungoso. So these are, these are all the characters played by this one person. As you can see, uh, Pantarleo, uh is is playing quite a few characters in this. He he's 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 doing quite a few, uh, but notice most importantly with Fungoso, notice the tailor and the shoemaker. Why is the tailor and the shoemaker so important? Because in every man, weareth at his day. And he tells the story of the tailor and the shoemaker. Sogliado. Uh, you also have this fasted brisk, fast and brisk, uh, and that is by the name of Shift. He's all this, this actor's all playing one person. That's and that's Shift, the groom, drawers, constables, 
uh, a constable and officers, your shift. So your falcon is represented by your shift. And I know it's because uh, just after uh, he names it as Pastidius Brisk. So he's changed the F for a P, which is interesting. So it's the character of shift. Um, a threadbare shark. <laughs> a thin a, a thin shark. Um, threadbare, also brilliant, because we're talking about cloth and bare nothing. Um, one that was never a soldier yet lives upon uh, lendings. His profession is uh, skildering and oddling, which is swindling and trickery. Uh, his bank pools, which, of course, is chicken and French. Uh, his wear. Uh, we have our R there. Uh, our R. Our Ra. Uh, sun God, which is our sun God. Ra is, is your falcon. Uh, is pitch hath. Falcon term. Uh, pitch also can mean black, though, interestingly. Uh, takes up single uh, testons upon oaths. He takes up single testons upon oaths till doomsday. So he's taking a testimony. Uh, he falls under executions of three shillings and enters into five groats. There's a groat. The groat is four pence. It's by bonds. Um, he waylays the reports of services. We've met services before, haven't we? A service, severe, servere, nesset, services, which is probably why uh, it is uh, in italics. Cons them without book, damning himself. He came new uh, from them, and all the while he was taking the diet of a bawdy house or lay poured in his chamber for rent and uh, victuals. Uh, he is of admirable and happy memory uh, that he will salute uh, one for an old acquaintance that he never saw, he never or ever saw in his life before. He usurps upon cheats, quarrelers, quarrels and robberies, which he never did only to get him a name. His chief exercises are taking the whiff, uh, squiring um a cockatrice. Now a cockatrice is is really important. I didn't know what a cockatrice was before, but thankfully uh it's explained for me in the Ascendants of Armory. Um so slayeth all things that come within a spear's length of him. A cockatrice be v venom nom v v nom uh name uh, without remedy whilst he liveth, yet when he is dead and burnt to ashes, he uh, loseth all his malice. Ooh, dead and burnt to ashes, burnt to ashes, uh, malice. And the ashes of him are good for alchemists, people who turn base metal into gold, and namely in turning and changing of metal and making privy searches of imparters. So searching, catching the whiff of someone and uh, killing killing them like a cockatrice he slayeth all things so he's a slayer a cockatrice is a slayer catching the whiff of prey making a privy search for imparters if you think about what impart there im uh, to impart is to make known tell or reveal but it's really clever those hyphens how he hyphens words and lets them run on to the next line really clever im from latin means not part not in part so he's telling you the person who is not in part that was in the previous play that is not in this part uh, of sogliado who of course is uh, 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 personifying um, william shakespeare or is the part that uh, uh, representing William Shakespeare. Uh, so let's have a look at what Sogliado says, because that's also very telling. Uh, this is my human now. I have land and money. My friends left me it well, and I will be a gentleman, uh, whatever it costs me. Nay, my humour is not for boys. I'll keep men as I keep any, and I'll give coats. That's my humour. That's his humour. He gives coats. Uh, Carlo has the ra in there. Oh, I, you shall have one take, uh, have one take measure of you and make you a coat arms, a coat of arms to fit you of what fashion you will. So, Sogliado, by word of mouth, I thank you, senor. Uh, I'll be once a little prodig uh, prod uh, prodigal in a humour, I faith, 
and have a most prodigious coat. By my wits, no, sir, I scorn to live by my wits. I have better means, I tell thee, uh, than to take such base courses as to live by my wits. Oh, no, I, what dost thou think? I live by my wits. Oh, no, don't be silly. Marry, sir, I am telling this gentleman of a hobby horse. It was my father's indeed. Do you remember that hobby horse from the Minerva and brought us back beads, hobby horses? Just notice this as well. Boxes, oxes. There we are. Our, uh, our actor imitating with our hobby horse. And our hobby horse really uh, uh, representing our coat of arms. Uh, Sogli Sogliato, so he did dance in it with as good humour and as good regard as any man of his degree whatsoever, being no gentleman. I have danced in it myself too. Did dance in it with as good humour. Perhaps that refers to dancing in um, every man in his humour as well. Um, so, uh, but being no gentleman, I have danced in it myself. So he's even admitting he's not a gentleman, uh, yet has this coat of arms. So uh, Carlo, um, at his coming from hawking or hunting as a jig after a play, I even, even like your jig, sir, uh, you shall have met me at the Herald's office, sir, for some week or so at my first coming. Come, Carlo, uh, Sogliado, uh, I faith I thank them. I can write myself a gentleman now. Here's my patent. It cost me Thirty pound by this breath, uh, a punt, a very fair coat, well charged and full of armoury. Nay, it has as much variety of colours in it as you have seen a coat have. How like you the crest, sir? Marry, sir, it it is your boar without a head, rampant. A boar without a head. That's very rare. Well, it well. Let's have a look at a boar. Uh, as the uh, the crest, shall we, on the head? Well, there is a, a certain person with a boar on the top of his arms, and that would be Edward de Vere. Apart from Sogliado's, is a boar without a head. How very rare. I also would imagine that was a particularly therapeutic drawing uh, for Edward de Vere. Uh, Sogliado, by this element, he is ingenious, a tall man as ever swaggered about London. He and I uh, call countenance and resolution, but his name is Cavalier Swift. By this element, he is ingenious. Call countenance and resolution, uh, he and I, he and I call countenance and resolution, but his name is Cavalier Swift. Shift now, countenance revolution shift very important. Shift the falcon. We'll look at countenance revelation uh, resolution in a second and start to give this some resolution. So, Gliardo, oh lord, sir, I there were some presents there that were the nine worthies to him. I, I, faith, car, uh, Carlio, faith, gallants. I'm persuading this gentleman points to Sogliado next to turn courtier. Uh, shift this is rare. I have set up my bills without discovery. This is rare. Ra, remember, uh, it's the sun god represented by the fal falcon. And argent is also silver. Uh, I have set up my bills. Bills uh, could be a diminutive for William. Uh, without discovery. God's will. Here are none but friends resolution so this idea of resolution well it just so happens that there is a uh, an emblem in iconologia by the name of irresolution here's irresolution uh, she has two uh, crows she's wrapped in a sable cloth wrapped about her head uh, and these these crows um uh, these crows, deliberate, which is best of old age because of long experience, make men unresolved. So you have these two crows that seem to be uh, loggerheads facing each other, um, 
that are croaking, crass, crass, uh, men's putting off from day to day, uh, when uh, they should dispatch the black cloth obscurity in her intellect. Hmm. Well, crass, of course, meaning showing no intelligence or sensitivity. So our crows there, irresolution, irre are, are very uh, crass. That's irresolution. Um, Sog, a sogliato by this element. He is ingenious as a tall man has ever swaggered about London. He and I call countenance and revolution. So he and I, countenance and resolution. He's irresolution. Uh, but his name is Cavalier Swift. Well, it just so happens, actually, uh, to be a reference uh, to uh, in the love of our country. The love of our country, which I think is actually probably my favourite uh, in the entire book, because it's so, so important. Standing upright amidst flame and smoke, on which he looks with a resolute countenance. Well, that's both countenance and resolution. So I know this one is of supreme importance, because I have the falcon in Every Man Out of His Humour telling me resonance and countenance. Uh, uh, countenance and resolution and here we have resolute countenance carries a crown in each hand and being just upon the brink of a precipice yet marches courageously over spears and tramples upon naked swords because his strength increases with years the crown of grass or bays or laurels it seems to be um, denotes honour for it was given to some for delivering delivering their country and the oaken one for saving a life the precipice that a public spirited man apprehends no danger for the love of his country i love this one it's one of my favorites in the book and kind of gives the game away and we're, we're going to explore it in a minute so the love of one's country standing upright amidst flame uh, and smoke with looks with a resolute countenance oaken one for saving life okay so well, here's the standing upright. We've talked a lot about the uh, the upward, the upward shoot, a column strong and stately from the root. Uh, it should the impress be of resolution and true constancy. So this is really, this is uh, really important as well because uh, we're talking about resolution and constancy. Uh, his virtue, virtue again, yet doth ever, 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 ver, ever upward tend. And he himself stands irremoved, straight. OK, so we're, we're talking about this upright and this is a T. Yeah, I'll mark our T. Um, it's standing upright. So, oh, admiral rare, he cannot choose but be a gentleman that has these excellent gifts. More, more, I beseech you. Now, I was very lucky with the first ever video uh, that I made on this. Uh, new Shakespeare finds. I, I went to S Westminster Abbey uh, and I'm quite a curious person um, and like asking questions and I, 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 perhaps one too many but um, I I accidentally noticed um, oh rare Ben Johnson in Westminster Abbey. There were two stones and I did mention this in the first video actually and uh, he's the only person in Westminster Abbey to be buried standing upright oh rare Ben Johnson now this is actually where oh rare Ben Johnson comes from it comes from every man uh, out of his humour oh rare oh admirable rare he cannot choose but be a gentleman that has these excellent gifts more or or I beseech you oh rare Ben Johnson why because he's buried upright he is buried upright or the person below this stone is buried upright and bring it about to a perpendicular position they are in pale oh rare ben johnson well let's just um let's just uh let's just research a little bit more about ben johnson i'm going to use um what i love westminster abbey with a passion uh, i've been quite a few times in the last couple of days uh, actually, um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of Westminster Abbey. I think it's beautiful, and and I went to I had to go back because I missed a few things, uh, so I had to go back uh, and attend some services, which actually I adored. So thank you to Westminster Abbey. 
um, like our man here in that organ in that place is just beautiful everyone should go do services because it's just so so beautiful um, anyway uh, I'm too uh, poor for that and no one will lay out funeral charges upon me this is from uh, Westminster um, Abbey's website uh, no sir six feet long by two feet wide is too much for me um, two feet by two feet will do for all I want he's talking about his grave here um, you shall have it said the dean so Johnson was buried standing on his feet in the northern aisle of the nave, in the northern aisle of the nave, and not in Poet's Corner. Two times two, two feet by two feet is four square feet. Um, four, square, four square feet times six feet is, by my maths, 24 cubic feet. So he's buried in 24 cubic feet. Is, is his grave. The simple inscription O oh, Rare Ben Johnson was said to have been cut at the expense of Jack, I believe that Jack is a diminutive of John, Jack Young, who was walking by when the grave was covered uh, uh, was covered in the grave and grave gave them a uh, mason and lighted pence uh, 18 pence to inscribe it. The inscription had once been ascribed to Sir uh, William Davenant Johnson's successor as poet laureate on whose own gravestone in the abbey the words O oh, Rare um, also appear. Johnson's original stone was moved in the 19th century to the base of the wall opposite the grave uh, to preserve it. When the whole nave floor was relayed and many uh, larger gravestones taken away, he get, his grave site is today marked with a small grey lozenge stone. Some might say grey. Uh, it's very easy to miss. Some might say sable. Just to the east of the brass of John Hunter. Uh, the inscription is the same as the original stone, although Ben himself always used the form uh, Johnson. Yet you'll notice there is a H in there. A rare. He cannot uh, choose but be a gentleman that has the... Uh, has these excellent gifts more more i beseech you or or i beseech you a monument to johnson was erected interestingly in about 1723 about 1723 by the earl of oxford what a monument has been erected by the earl of oxford in the eastern isle of poet's corner it includes a portrait medallion and the same inscription as on the gravestone again shown as johnson at the base are three masks linked by a ribbon through the eye masks linked by a ribbon through the eyes at the top is a golden lamp with the flame broken off well that uh, is the uh, monument dedicated by the earl of oxford right in the corner um right by the wall actually it's the last last monument um uh, there in the eastern isle um and that's by the earl of oxford you see the masks You'll see the uh, the colon there, a rare Ben Johnson. There's a nice colon there. Um, perhaps you can see there's a there's a golden an ore lamp there. Oh look, these these supports seem to be in sable. How interesting. Ben Johnson. Uh, let's let's just read a little bit more about Ben Johnson, poet playwright and actor bonus point if you can find where that mask is from so he was born on the 11th of june 1572 but little is known about his parents uh, the family was this is from westminster abbey's website again the family was a scottish descent and his family became a clergyman uh, he was educated at westminster school at the expense of one of the masters there william camden and later possibly attended St. John's College, Cambridge. He went into a trade as a bricklayer. Notice the possibly. He went into a trade as a bricklayer, did he? Did he really? For a short term, his stepfather's occupation. <laughs> stepfather's. Uh, in Flanders, he thought uh, he fought with the English troops there. And on returning to London, he married uh, 
but no children survived him. He became an actor and playwright. In 1598, he killed a fellow actor in a duel but escaped hanging and was imprisoned as a fellow for a short time. This incident does not seem to have affected his reputation. His play, Every Man in His Humour, included Shakespeare in his cast. Johnson was a well-known uh, writer of masks and a tutor to Sir Walter Raleigh's son. He became Poet Laureate in 1619, although it was not a formal appointment. Uh, do you notice that he he killed a man? He killed a fellow actor. Oh, he, he killed a fellow actor. I'm pretty sure killing uh, was a capital offence uh, in those days, uh, which is surprising that he escaped hanging um, and was only in prison for a very short time. Well, I wonder which other fellow actor Mr Ben Johnson may have killed. Well, it just so happens that in Palladay, uh, Tamia, published in 1598, Francis uh, Merrill uh, says Marlowe was sat, stabbed to death by a bored, a bardy uh, serving man. A bardy serving man, a bawdy serving man. Uh, a rival of his in his lewd love. A rival of his in his lewd love. Could that lewd love have been poetry, I wonder? Um, so the important thing here to notice is he was educated at Westminster School at the expense of one of the masters there, William Camden. That's William Camden. Do we remember William Camden? Uh, William Camden. Uh, ben Johnson wrote an affectionate epigram to Camden. Camden, most reverend head to whom I owe all that I am in arts, most definitely. All that I know has nothings how nothing's that to whom my country owes the great renown and name wherewith she goes. Well, here's William Camden's monument. His monument of white marble is on the west wall of the transept uh, with a bust, uh, I should say, west wall of Poet's Corner. If you have a think about where those two monuments are, that might just redefine your understanding of Poets Corner. Uh, his, uh, his monument of white marble is on the west wall of the transept with a bust. Unfortunately, the inscription gives an incorrect age. Oh dear, there's an error. These errors, they, they, they do like to find their way everywhere, don't they? He has his left hand on the famous book Britannia. And his right, he holds some gloves in the arcade behind is a gilded coronet referring to his king of arms office and two shields of arms. The Latin inscription can be translated William Candu, Clarence suit, where well, they left out the L this time, which is good. Uh, William Camden Clarence suit, king of arms, uh, who illustrated the British antiqui antiquities by ancient truth and indefinite indefatigable industry and adorned his innate simplicity with useful literature and illustrated his pleasantness of humour with candour and sincerity lies lies here quietly in hopes of a certain resurrection in Christ he died 9th of November 1623 aged 74 illustrated antiquities truth uh, Simplicity illustrated with pleasantness, humour, sincerity, lies here quietly. Um, if you have a look at these two words here, in uh, indagavit, uh, which comes from indago, uh, uh, which means to hunt, to track, to investigate, to explore. And this word here, which is also uh, by itself, invocatus, it's the call forth, to lure, to entice out, to summon or to invoke and there's also a cue uh, there and this book is obviously equivocal in its description it's obviously he's, he's he has written um a book called minerva britannia uh, which i'd encourage you to read because i think it has something interesting about stratford upon avon uh, written there so he has written a book but it's equivocal uh, because he's also written uh, well not written well the author has uh, it's also referring to this book the minerva britannia why do I know this? Uh, well, because we it's signed uh, by William uh, Sagar Garter, Principal King of Arms. It's signed by a King of Arms, Principal King of Arms, the guy who got the job after uh, William um, 
Dethic. So it's signed by a principal king of arms. Uh, just as your loving friend William Camden uh, signed uh, the, uh, the element of armories. And, and William Sagar Garter dedicated a letter um, to uh, likewise to that same book. So you can see there's a link here uh, between our King of Arms. Yeah, William Sagar Garter has dedicated a letter. Uh, so has William Camden. Uh, William Sagar has signed, uh, has dedicated a letter to the Minerva Britannia. So draft through and William Camden, alias Clarence, uh, King of Arms. Remember, William Camden signed uh, that draft uh, thing as well. So we've got something going on with our arms here. Now, there's more importance uh, to uh, be had. Because it's always we need to be thinking about what is around um, our uh, monuments. What it, just as with our coats of arms, we need to think about the arms that are around surrounding those. Well, let's have a look at what's around it. Well, we have an E there. Can you see in the masonry we have the E in the stonework? E. And look, look what we've got there. We've also got this little stone here that if we look at it, well, let's have a look. Can you can you see there's something written there? Can you see that? It's very faint. It's really difficult, but it sticks out like a sore thumb. It shouldn't be there. So if we have a look at it. OK, now I'm going to do uh, a few of these just so you can see. I'm not too bothered, to be honest, about all of um, what this is saying. But you can see, I'm really hoping you can see that there are some letters E, X, O that have been written there. Now, I can tell you that's important because the title page of, um, of Shakespeare's work, if you have a look at the doublet, we're actually hidden behind uh, in, in the lines of his doublet and all the blank panels. You actually have loads of the same thing, all of these E's, these T's. Um, I think you've got initial, his initials actually written uh, across his heart there. So you've, you've got all of these, um, all of these things right there. Uh, I'm, I'm not too interested in what that means. They're just the characteristic letters uh, more than anything, although I do think that might be quite important. But let's, uh, let's look further. Let's have a look more around uh, the monument. Um, well, who's above William Camden? Mr. David Garrick, one of the principal actors of his time. Two masks coming from behind a curtain, although there still seems to be some material behind him. Well, why is this important? Well, because if we have a look, we have a bust of Shakespeare behind Garrick, behind this curtain. And what colour? Well, I wonder what colour that is actually behind as well. Um, and if we have a look at the inscription, Shakespeare, a Shakespeare rose. Now, that's actually very funny now that I look at it. Uh, the glowing we've already seen, um, the glowworms. In night, in darkness, in black they lay. Uh, Shakespeare again. Twin stars shall shine. This is all very funny. Uh, and earth they radiate with a beam divine. So that's all that's around William Camden. So you, you're pretty sure that he um, he's he's insinuating uh, the Minerva Britannia. Um, and there's loads of references to Shakespeare and Edward de Vere going around uh, this. And the hints are there for you. There's the book itself and we have this lozenge shape. OK, this same shape, which is of the gravestone of O Rare Ben Johnson. Um, so there we go. We've spoken about um, the connection and the hints. Remember, William Camden paid at the expense for Ben Johnson's education. And I don't think Ben Johnson is who uh, it says he is at all. But also notice this. William Camden died 1623. Isn't that the, uh, the date of publication of the sonnets? Now, I really like 1623 uh, because uh, six is the perfect number. It's the sum um, of its parts one, two and three. It's factors. Uh, so it adds together... Um, to make one, two, and three, if you add them together, make six. So that's a really great date. It's perfect, perfect date for that. Um, so that's that's when he's died on the 9th of November, at 16, 
23. So uh, God's will here and none but friends resolution. Well, we're still working with resolution and um, countenance and resolution. We know about the standing upright. OK, that's Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson is standing upright in Westminster. But what about the mist, flame and smoke? Well, actually, that's incredibly telling. Um, ben Johnson's personal library. Uh, <laughs> ben Johnson wrote a very brilliant book called The Execration Against Vulcan. OK, um, his personal library was destroyed uh, by fire. And the 51 year old author describes this disaster in his poem Execration Against uh, Vulcan. Now, Vulcan is the god of fire, volcanoes or blacksmiths, metalworking, carpenters, craftsmen, artisans, sculptors uh, and met metallurgy. OK, so Vulcan, um, the Latinized Hep Hephaestus, uh, is the god of fire and volcanoes. And Ben Johnson has only gone uh, written a book, An Execration. With e, I like that e. Uh, creation against Vulcan. When did his library burn down? I bet you know the answer to this question. When did his library burn down? The answer, 1623. It's a very good date to have your library burnt down. I can tell you that. So I love this, and this is probably one of my favourite um, plays of words in it. It's simple, it's just nice, it's just really lovely. Um, so in this, our uh, re John, John, re John, John the fire, John the fire. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've got loads of gold uh, with an E on the end. Uh, will it not melt in the fire without art? Uh, um, Fear of fire and the stones. This is all from the ascendants, by the way, the ascendants of armory. Uh, the <laughs> come on, man. the army potent God. The army potent God, a hardy desire uh, to be avenged with speedy boldness um, to all fiery works. Come on, army potent. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, so if we continue um, fearing nothing but thunder, uh, fighting leading his father's cart, uh, though negligence set all the world on fire, which was uh, translated out of French and printed one of my name. The lion feareth nothing but fire. So fire is obviously quite important in the uh, ascendance of armoury. So let's have a look at the title page, the always very telling title pages of Ben Johnson's Execration Against Vulcan. Well, let's have a look first. Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson of the inscription around this ring. Do you notice that you do not have a H there? How interesting. But that H is then suddenly put in, just as the H is on the gravestone of Ben Johnson. That's really important. You'll notice it's uh, Ben Johnson the second. Also notice the um, the colon, just like on the monument uh, and in the poem in the first folio. You have two. Why? Because you have two stones for Ben Johnson in Westminster Abbey. You have the VV of Vulcan with De Vere. You have Vera uh, on this inscription ring. Uh, we have our Ra, our A, our, our Ra, God of the Sun, our Or, our Gold, our Ro, uh, which um, again is is really important. It's all one way. Um, uh, the other way, uh, VV, double V, diverse. There we go. Our, our two Vs, our double Vs, epigrams, diverse epigrams. Uh, the same author to several. Or all veers, uh, all veers, noble personages in the kingdom. N that noble personages. Uh, again, we have this veer, and if you notice, also N is really two Vs. It's your double V again. And then we have this curious thing. How interesting this this emblem. This looks like a looks almost like a fleur de lis, doesn't it? How utterly interesting. Uh, again, he's holding some gloves. Uh, John Benson. Come on, this is Ben Johnson, right? He, he's literally just changed the Ben and the John around. Uh, why is this showing it's important? Well, because it's an anagram of Ben Johnson, because uh, we have here Dunstan's. I'd imagine that would be Sun Stand. 
Saint Stan's Son or Sun Stand, the churchyard of Fleet Street. And the churchyard, well, it is in the church. Here's the most important thing, I think. You notice those books? Do you notice that two of those books are at a right angle? One of them is upstanding. And also you'll notice that V behind. So, oh, could there be an art found out that might produce his shape so lively as to write? Um, Abhol. Uh, and if you actually have a look in this book, there's many great things in here. A parallel, there's a parallel of the prince to the king. Now, we've been talking about princes quite a lot. Uh, his nester knew in arms his fellow was, but not in years, too soon renowned of his glass. Ours, though not nester, knew we trust shall be as wise in arms as old in years as he. And also, just to remind you, the, uh, the the sign of Richard Field's shop was the was the falcon, the splayed splayed eagle. It's really a falcon, uh, and with the fire beneath it, rising from the ashes and its fire. So fire is evidently really important uh, in this work. Let's have a look at the beginning to the right honourable. What if we have a look? Let's just let's just have a look. Oh, got, got some birds here. Bird that's caught a fish. Seems seems quite important. So, to the Right Honourable Thomas Lord Windsor, Anchor. Anchor to you, I love anchors. My Lord, T. That's very important. The mark of his dessert. We've met our T uh, multiple times. Here's our mark of T. And in, in the Minerva Britannia, you're going to get quite a few T's, actually, uh, all the way through. So we've got our T's. So obviously T's are really important. Noble love, concentration, bold desire. In the person of one deceased, the form whereof somewhat dispersed. Remember, a body severed into a thousand parts. Uh, yet carry them the prerogative uh, of truth to Mr Ben Johnson. And will so appear to all whose eyes and spirits are rightly placed. You are, my lord, a person who is able to give value and true esteem to things of themselves no less deserving. Such were his strong and far transcendent ordinary imagination as they are comfortable to the sense of such who are of sound judgment. His strenuous lines and sinewy, uh, final, uh, sinewy uh, labours have raised uh, such pyramids. you find those pyramids there. Those lasting monuments, the world's great monument of their fame, shall outlast time. And these may, without any diminution to the glory of his greater works, enjoy the profession of public favour. By your honour's permission, I shall be glad by this final test. Notice that T there. N notice all the important letters. I, H, T. This final testimony account is a fit opportunity to assure your honour my lord that I am John Benson now why is that so important my lord T that I am now <laughs> trust him in to, to parallel Moses and the burning bush of I am that I am I am I am He's telling you, my Lord T, I am. So this is a testimony. This is a testimony account to assure uh, the reader and the viewer that he is T. He is represented by this T that you are seeing. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do this before the next part. Uh, I think it's actually from, uh, there's some over quoted on this uh, as, as one of the footnotes or side notes of, of this pyramid it's the same Ovid um, which uh, my, my Latin translation is poor forgive me but um, uh, our leader uh, escapes um, the, the the fire uh, through um, hard work and and glory or glory returns to our hard work uh, our leader through hard work and he escapes the fire so O rare Ben Johnson uh, please feel free to correct that Latin for me. I am in much need of correction. Uh, so, Sogliardo, 
O oh, admirable rare, he cannot choose but be a gentleman that has these excellent gifts. More, more, I beseech you. Well, there is our, our, our stone to Ben Johnson. Um, well, Ben Johnson, as we've said, it's got a H here. And really, he went by uh, other his name without a H. Why is that important? Well, I have mentioned this in previous videos. That H is our eater. Uh, eater uh, translated uh, with a... a Tonos is all. So eater translated in Greek is all. Uh, that's your H, your IHS. Your, uh, that, it's the same thing. You'll see IHS if you go to pretty much any uh, graveyard in the country. Um, but the H, it's the first three letters of Jesus, is your E. So I'm just saying that the H is your E there. So H and E. And uh, you'll find that. Uh, in the Minerva Britannia, you can see your H and your E. So with our Angkor Spy, you're playing. Now, Miss Edward de Vere was a languages scholar. He was so learned uh, in his languages, his Greek, Latin, French, um, Hebrew. Like he, he knew so many uh, different um, languages, Italian in particular. He, he was such a languages scholar. Uh, so, Anne, well, if you trans translate an in latin you get or or uh, remember is uh, in it were well, in hebrew i've said this in a previous video or in hebrew is light ra is the sun god gold we of, is we often associate uh, with the sun so we have our ra there so our an is or our ra uh, is our sun god likewise golden um Spy is hope. Translates as hope. And what do we have in hope? But we have our or. Why, do, why am I saying or? Because the Greek P is your row, it's your R. So we have an or with a H and an E either side, actually. Okay, H and E either side. So we have, and look, look at what's between the H and the E. We have a crown. Crowns are frequently gold um, so you can assume that is a golden crown so all is gold we're playing as we've seen in our heraldry in our armory that all is gold we're very much playing a golden game and you'll see this in what Sogliardo said which is brilliant Ra Ra both sides actually An An in man or or see that's each of these each of these twice in this. Ra, ra, and an, or, or. So you've got these things in this. It's really beautiful. Um, he, well, we've got uh, either side of this E, our H and our E. Our eta and our epsilon. Here, well, look. Well, we've got a double E there, but equidistant from these, we have our E and our H. So again, we have the same uh, E and our H. So we are playing a golden game. This really is a golden game now i'm going to apply my learning and i'm going to use uh, a figure that i've been learning which is called the speedy dispatcher are you ready for this what do you see hopefully i shouldn't have left that on sorry um what you, hopefully what you can see is you can see that there is a golden falcon a golden falcon holding a scepter pointing to this gravestone. Now, I've chosen to use the original photo that I took from the first time I ever went to Westminster Abbey, uh, just before my first video, uh, because I really like it. This was, the, this was where I made this discovery with this photo. So this is the golden fa falcon above um, this sable uh, gra gravestone. So we have a ore, a falcon, completely in ore. Uh, and this lovely quote here uh, wisdom has god made them all in wisdom hast uh, thou sorry in wisdom hast thou made them all and we have if you notice it's kind of pointing it's kind of pointing towards uh, ben johnson there parallel to the prince of a king his nest anew in arms his fellow was but not in years too soon uh, run out of glass well just remember nesto uh, Nesta, um, with Judico Pilium. Pilium is Latin for Nesta, uh, the wise 
uh, Greek uh, king, Nestor. So you have an, in the Stratford Monument, you have the Stratford Monument. The first line is wise Nestor. And here is Nestor, who's wise, his Nestor knew in arms. Again, we're talking about arms. His fellow wasn't, but not in years. Two son had soon run out of his glass hours, though not Nestor knew. Uh, we, Trish, shall be as wise in arms, as old in years as he. So wisdom hast thou made them all. Who has he made? O rare Ben Johnson. Okay. And you can see, just see the colours, start to see the colours of the ore and the sable, the black and the gold, the game that we are playing. Uh, if we also have a look uh, at this, so if we have a look at this here, you'll see that uh, this is from the Ascedents again, we have the same um, kind of fleur-de-lis um, and also the same one in Ben Jonson's Execration Against Vulcan. So like unto a sunbeam or unto the flame of fire, uh, Isidore writeth it, if it be uh, thrown into the fire, the fire seemeth to be quenched, or, which is gold, as the coals which are often black or sable, were dead. So can you see just what is going on here? This is really amazing stuff. Uh, and also you'll notice, obviously, there's Vs and Xs in the corner. And what's crazy, though, is if you have a look uh, at William Camden and the, uh, the Ben Johnson monument, you can see uh, we have this same shape uh, in the stone there, uh, which, is, which is crazy. So, uh, why I hate this picture, and you might be able to see uh, why now. I think it's very funny, uh, but it makes me feel a little bit uh, sick with its overall saturation. What are the two most dominant colours in this picture? I'm hoping you're going to tell me uh, black and gold, and indeed they are, because if we have a look at the very witty um, uh, description here or or door altar or lord or daughter this one kind of gives it away that uh, corn orn um staff ord 24 four so we have an or in every line and then of course we have our ras uh, our ands we've got some ras and ands uh, so as you can see this this whole game uh, of black and gold is here. This coincidentally is by an unknown artist. Um, I don't know who painted this, but if it was De Vere, hats off to you. Uh, so, as you can see, ore and, go uh, ore and sable, black and gold, or gold and black, uh, are very, very important to this game. And you're going to see this, you can see this now in the Stratford Monument, black and gold, black and gold. Black and gold. You can also see the red marble here, which kind of mirrors a little bit of the bust of Shakespeare, which is quite funny. Um, and again, we have at least at least we're being consistent with the colour scheme for the most part. Um, so here we go. Black and gold, black and gold, black and gold. Or and sable. Let's just go into this a little bit deeper. You'll see here uh, we have uh, a, P a PS uh, uh, C uh c4 uh 24 so that's actually psalms uh, 104 verse uh, 24 okay that's that's what it is um and what is the verse of scripture um and actually the verse of scripture goes all, all the way around this monument how many are your works lord in wisdom you made them all the earth is full of your creatures uh and well let's have a look at uh, 104 in the sonnets, shall we? Let's just let's just have a look. I know the sonnets are important; they're very cryptic. They they all relate to this work. So let's have a look at Psalm 104. Well, let's see it in relation to this to me. Well, there are two stones to Ben Johnson. Never can be old. Oh, so cold. Um, we have our colds, our coal, our coal which is our um, our sable, our coal. Yellow autumn. Autumn. Think about the, the sound of that word, autumn. You have or 
the auricular sound of or in that word. And the process of, if you're processing through Westminster Abbey, fumes, hot, burned, you've got the fire there. A green, the vert, the, the ver. Uh, the die or dial, die, still doth stand. Ha, huh, well, that person still is standing. Uh, uh, four, we've got the oar again. Here, this thou age and bred, ere you were born, or was beauty's summer dead. Now, it's telling you to hear. So if we're hearing, you can see with the autumn, for instance, and the born, that we're, we're playing with the or. But there's actually something really brilliant that's going on uh, in this. Because um, you can see there's a lot of numbers going on. And we'll have a look at that in just a second. So you can see uh, summer and summer's pride there. Summer's dead and summer's pride. Now, I know from my work in a previous video uh, to do with Edward de Beer's life dates, uh, that there's a lot of wit to do with sum and summing. So when I see summer, I immediately think I should probably sum uh, some of the things in this uh, sonnet. Now, um, 10, uh, 104, let's, let's apply this just to 104 first. Uh, 104, a uh, 10, 4, I could say is four lots of 10, uh, which would be 40. If I was to sum four lots of 10, that would be uh, 40. Now, well, 40 is a very, very important uh, number to Edward de Vere. Uh, our 4T, so we've got four lots of T. Um, if you think about the word four, it contains or. So our, our four contains our or. Um, four, uh, well, what is four? Uh, four in German is wir, wir. So it's wir is four, forty, wirty. Uh, if we also have a look, for instance, at uh, John Day, we have forty in this room, and that's because actually with Edward de Vere's life dates, you can make twenty on one side, twenty on the other by quite simple addition, and then adding those together, you can make forty. So it's a, it's a number that really represents uh, Edward de Vere, as I spend pretty much a whole video uh, going into why 40 is such uh, an important number he self-identifies uh, with. But let's, um, let's assume that 10, four lots of 10, is 40. Now, I know I'm going to have to sum something, and I know there's, there's, some, there's some obvious numbers in here. Uh, but I'm also, because we're playing an auricular game, I'm going to write numbers next to all of the words uh, that could also be represented as numbers. So two, four, first is going to be one. Uh, there's something here as well. Now in Roman numerals, I is one. Okay, I is one. So I'm taking I to be one, but on either side, we've got I and I. So we've got I three times. So that implies to me that I is also one, as it is in Roman numerals. So I've put numbers next to them, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add these numbers together. So two, four, first, I, I, I. So two, four, one, one, one. That gives me ten. So on the first uh, opening two lines, I have ten. I'm going to continue. Three, four, three. Second two lines, ten. So in the opening four lines, we have twenty. Three, two, one, one, three. Three, uh, one, one, one. Sum that. That gives us sixteen. Now, uh, with sonnets, uh, I like to think of sonnets in terms of um, uh, a Hegelian dialectic, which I'd love, which is your thesis, your antithesis, and your synthesis. So we have our, our main argument, and then on the uh, on on our after our eighth line, we have our volta, our turn. Uh, which is where we have something that kind of opposes what we're doing and then we knit it all together in the last two lines. So I know that in the next four lines something is going to happen. So, well, we have our one. That's the only number we have in those 
four lines, which is peculiar. We only have one compared to the bombardment of numbers in the other lines. However, don't be deceived. And yet, still from this figure, and no pace perceived. We're not going forward with this. No pace. Minus one. Mine. You can see the I there. Minus. Clever. Still doth stand zero. That is absolute genius. So if we continue, we have four uh, last, and I'm pretty sure you can have a guess at what this is going to add to. By the way, this is repeatable, right? So like all the academics in the world, I was uh, trained as an undergrad in science. This is repeatable. You have 40. So there we go. Uh, but also if we have a look at... Um, William Shakespeare's monument in Westminster Abbey, you'll notice there's four T's on, just as there are quite a lot of four T's, just as on the uh, on the, the Stratford monument. But also look to what he's pointing to. He's pointing to our E, okay? He's pointing to the E in temples. Now, really funny um, is the fact that in Sumerian, temples also means E. So it's both E in temples and temples itself. Uh, means he, his arms are also in an E. But what many people don't uh, look at is what is under his uh, heel. And you can see this here. You know there's something going on because look at the wall behind. You can see there's a little mark, whether or not there's a V or some E's going on there. I'm sure uh, there's one or two uh, letters uh, that have been very craftily and subtly and obscurely carved in uh, to his heel. But why on earth does he have a mark on his heel? Well, that is because to take his position in Poet's Corner, he's probably, if he's following the Westminster uh, Abbey tour currently anyway, which I very much enjoyed, um, he would have passed over at this very subtle grave of Ben Johnson. He would have walked over that grave, which is maybe why he has a mark on his heel um, to stand to uphold the banner the black prince uh, not find him closed neither in town or castle but in plain field a very modest grave in Westminster perhaps one of the most modest graves in Westminster therefore uh, shall uh, be victors blah, 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 um, the treading of his banner underfoot which was of me Underfoot, which was of me, air chance but king, mere chance but king. Hmm. I say unto you, none uh, can by order of arms tread underfoot, uh, suffer little John of much the miller's son to be erased in coat of arms as I have seen some wear at Whitsuntide in May, pole mirth, which have been pulled down and given to them by the church wardens of John of the same town, banished the snail which deed done he was demanded of the townsmen. What it was, quote John, it is uh, either something or nothing. Uh, here, uh, the O uh, of Ben Johnson's augment, you have your or augmented, um, augmenti ed. It's good. So uh, this is your magic key, but I think it's telling you to li listen as well to what's going on here. Um, you're worthy. You've got your aura in again. Hath begun his book of the arts of arts in London language. Uh, N dead. You've got your Ed. Uh, An E. Your ten. Your R I R. Your An. Uh, your Ra again, your or, your or, and this lovely thing here, which you're going to meet again, like as science and cunning is the only good thing of the world, so is ignorance the only evil. Uh, you're going to meet that again. Uh, ra, uh, or to hold the candle. Well, here's a candle. So that he stands as torch upon a hill in open view, and ever veer shining bright in good or ill to thousands giving light. Now, why is 24 important? 
well, we have uh, 129 there. Uh, you can see that's an error because it comes in between 118 and 1120. And there's 129. Uh, where you touched a prince, a soldier of palace, to sh palais, to show uh, forth his praise. Uh, therefore, let me understand at length what he meant there in uh, Jared. If you will attend, I will, as my memory serveth, utter as I can the man that I mean and show you what I saw in his court touching arms. Uh, will uh, return to that. I began uh, with arms a matter. Uh, me for a soldier after I have travailed through the east part of the unknown world to understand the deed of arms um, uh, so came unto me so basically what was what's going on here is um, um Gerard's is a meets a a hearhort uh, by the name of Palaphilos. He's a king of arms. Okay, meet say here, Hawk, king of arms. Uh, highest praise to the goddess Pallas of uh, Palais, as we know, is, is Palais Athena, uh, and Philos, the lover of Palais. So he meets um, Miss Here, Hawk, this king of arms called Palais Philos. And they go off on a bit of a journey. Now, while they're off on a journey, um, Palaphilos uh, recite, tells um, Gerard of a uh, uh, an, an analogy, a story to pass the time. Um, so, so the King of Arms, who uh, courteously saluted me, saying that I was a stranger, seeming by my demeanour a lover of honour, I was uh, right. So he's about to tell him a, a story an allegory to pass the time um, and this is really important and this is really this is really clever what he's doing now as I've said um, uh, De Vere is represented um, or personified uh, by desire and love uh, which will change your meaning of Venus and Adonis rape of Lucrece a lover's complaint and the sonnet uh, if you read it uh, in that sense that Edward De Vere is represented uh, by love uh, by Cupid Venus, desire, and also um, nothing. Um, it really does change your meaning about how you read those. Anyway, he's gonna. He he tells them this uh, this story. I uh, felt the air of the uh, the pleasant uh, uh, Elos, uh, the breath of fame. So this is uh, Elos uh, uh, representing fame, who sweetly recounted to him uh, Dame Beauty's gifts, which done as he suddenly came to likewise vanished unknown. So he tells them of uh, fame comes and tells him of beauty's gifts, uh, but when done, he suddenly, uh, as he suddenly came, he likewise vanishes, unknown. Okay, so he he's vanishing. The fame is vanishing, unknown. Uh, and then he's meted by other people like governance. Uh, we'll see the fair day when uh, Phoebus showed himself. Um, so he's he's telling this story, which is really important. Um, it's actually really clever. This is this this is the um, the proto inception um, because you have well the author speaking, uh, pretending to be Gerard, uh, who's then uh, being reciting Palaphilos, uh, telling a story. So you've got like three layers here um, of a of a play within a play within a play. Um, so it's it's wonderful. Uh, the kind of depth of meaning here. Such VA, uh, valiant gentleman through his province, whose lying honour had uh, deceived, uh, deserved the same. So this is right at the end after the story. They've gone uh, uh, to feast uh, at the court of a prince. Um, and remember, we're asking why is 24 important here? Um, so God hath appointed the number um, such special gentlemen as gods hath appointed the number of 24. Um, so there's our 24. Oh, yeah, I was going to say this uh, CI there, this, this, the seal of gentlemen. Um, anyway, uh, this done, Palaf uh, Palaphilos, obeying his prince's commandment, departed uh, with 24. 
accompanied with 24 valiant knights. So again, this 24. Um, standing e very man in his anciency as he hath borne arms in the field and began to show his prince's pleasure with honour, uh, uh, the honour of uh, order much to the effect. So why 24? Right, it's been mentioned here quite a few times. It's the uh, it's the number appointed a uh, God hath appointed to special gentlemen. Why twenty four? Well, there's another reason. How many hours are there in a day? Twenty four. Okay, there's twenty four hours in a day. It is one full rotation, one complete cycle, a complete day. Um, so it's really important because, as we know, rings are for remembrance, a complete cycle, an eternity of 24 hours. So 24 is really, really uh, important. And you'll see all of these circles uh, and rings and references today within the Minerva. So seemeth but the life of man a day. At morn he's born, at night he flits away. Um, so again, the sun and the moon is talking about a day. Uh, Lo, uh, uh, Solomon, Solomon. Um, here the Athenian sage just stands, the glory of all uh, Grecia to this day. The private life one uh, while will most embrace in travel, then he lists to spend his days, again, more days, uh, who uh, Alcides, uh, uh, another name for Hercules, uh, to her lasting praise, uh, in action still delights to spend her days, I think anyway. It's to do with Hercules though, that's that's important because you're going to meet Hercules in a second. Uh, with whom mild peace, the most of all desired, had learned, uh, muse shall end their happy days, while thou to all eternity admired, shall live afresh in after ages praise, or be the lodestar to thy glorious north. Remember where Ben Johnson's buried, drawing all eyes to wonder at thy worth. North is also upright. So if you've ever been to Westminster Abbey uh, on a tour, uh, for instance, uh, then you have probably uh, walked over uh, this grave unbeknownly. You've walked over the grave of Edward de Vere unbeknownly. Uh, so and you can see this here. I love this picture. Um, he's the ship, your Colossus. Um, <laughs> And you and you've passed over um, the grave of Edward de Vere. Uh, so the passenger may be warned, uh, may warned be to say they had their being here another uh, day. So there we go. We've returned uh, back to the arms of Shakespeare. Hopefully you now see this in quite a different light. Now, I've used nine books uh, to show you this and give you proof. Uh, just as a warning, I'm not done. Uh, I still have the most conclusive proofs to come. Yeah, but I'm just showing you all this uh, now already. So also a polite request. Um, if you have used this shield uh, without. Please do remember it's not right without that falcon. Here's a quick summary. I think I've actually put an error in. I've, I've noticed. Um, so we've we've spoken about the draft grants and the fact that it was signed by William Camden, the Clarence Sue King of Arms, um, elements of armories um, is by De Vere as evidenced by the four dedicated uh, letters and the numerous references within. And one of these letters is signed by Edward Camden, Cardinal's Comfort, published at the command of Edward Oxford by Thomas Beddingfield. Uh, has an uh, to the reader last lines really important uh, the ascendants of armories are referenced multiple times uh, in the element of armories also by de Vere. both the ascendants and the elements of armories are full of evidence explanation and cunning and reveal the true meaning as symbolism of shakespeare's coat of arms and i will prove to you before the end of this video that edward de Vere is the author of ascendants of armories uh, which is going to cause real difficulty uh, to uh, people who disagree with this work uh, color um, we've spoken Shakespeare's arms has got more gold than kings it's really unworthy we really shouldn't be doing that we've talked about the uh, relation of colors and their relation to each other uh, we've also talked about how it's incorrectly 
uh, impaled and it's not courted as it should be and should rightfully be done. Uh, two lines, uh, the lines, oblique, pertingent, uh, they're parallel. Um, the the bend is a fourth honorary, honorary uh, and Gerard very does, uh, does something really brilliant with his uh, mix up of Dexter and Sinister. The number and position, we've talked about um, how there is uh, two spears there and the orientation of those, one of them that's held upright uh, and one of them that is oblique. Um, and then we started talking about the falcon, which is uh, very much the crown uh, in the final crown of this work. It is the speedy dispatcher. and I'm not done with the speedy dispatcher just yet. Uh, and there's loads of references and you'll find these throughout many of the books uh, that he's written and also Shakespeare's coat of arms. And we've also talked about its position, Shakespeare's coat of arms, in relation to the other coat of arms around, which, for instance, the Edward Edward Clark sandwich, the ox uh, next to it. Uh, there's loads of things there. And also the very sickly bird, because its spear isn't upright. Um, in Minerva Britannia, it's dedicated. Uh, that's wrong. That's not William Camden, actually. Uh, that's uh, the other uh, principal arms, uh, the King of Arms, the one after William Dethick, whose name now escapes me. Um, uh, uh, it's also dedicated um, by Westminster Abbey Monument. Uh, the Minerva Britannia, it's, it's, it's implied, it is insinuated by the Westminster Monument. Abbey Monument. Also, uh, Interestingly, um, William Camden did write a book on the Westminster monuments uh, in Latin. Might want to translate that. Uh, the falcon is the most important emblem in the book at the service of its prince, Sir Vere Nesset. All the emblems contain great wealth of references to his secret arms. Uh, the creation of William Shakespeare and explanations for de Vere's disappearance found in the suggestive Latin margin uh, footnotes, illustrations and crafty inventions. Minerva also directly references Iconologia by Caesar Ripper, which is full of, uh, of hints. Uh, ben Johnson, buried upright, two gravestones. Uh, he was educated at the expense of William Camden. Um, and there's a Westminster monument paid for by the Earl of Oxford. We've discussed every man out of his humour, which is ingenious uh, in its satire. Um, William Shakespeare of Stratford, depicted as Sogliado. Uh, he's deliberately left out of this sequel. This is the figure of subtraction. Uh, there's loads of examples within that text. Uh, that is going to uh, allude to this. And we've also talked about the execration of Vulcan, which is really important, which contains a testimony uh, that Edward de Vere is uh, T. Uh, there's also a golden falcon holding a spear directly above and pointing to Ben Johnson's grave. He's the only person buried upright in Westminster Abbey. Uh, so as the sedents and uh, the elements really, really does evidence throughout, you're going to have difficulty um, disputing the amount of references to that. It's incredibly significant. Now, um, may our wise and noble prince receive the rightful praise he deserves, but we're not done. Final research and final proofs and the secret of secrets. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, are you ready? Now, here's where the real revelations are going to start to come out. And when I mean real revelations, I mean uh, real revelations. Um, and I'm also going to give you some conclusive proofs. So probably just a coincidence, but now this is how I wanted to start off uh, with some of the stuff I found uh, just to kind of because I, I wasn't sure at the time when I, when I started making this. Um, and also my reaction to it was no, under no circumstances, don't want to believe it, don't want to believe it, no, 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 um, I really don't want to believe it. Um, that's the same reaction, coincidentally, I had when I realised that Richard Mulcaster of the Elementaire was the veer. I was like, I don't want to believe it, I don't want to believe it, you're just being silly, this is not sensible thinking. And then I was a little bit more objective and I actually decided to read the book, at which point it became pretty evident that it really was De Vere. Uh, so my suggestion would be be really critical, stay objective, don't allow your uh, predispositions, your biases um, and your emotional reactions to dictate your view on this. Go on the evidence, please. And I'm about to give you a whole host of new evidence uh, and you are, feel, you are free to go and read and uh, research this stuff uh, yourself, please do. Um, when you see it with your own eyes, 
then you're going to understand it. So, let's do this. So, <sighs> princes may take unto themselves what device they will, so it be born of no man before the time, that time whereof have uh, you used the number of. Um, so, I did tell you he mucked you, in a sense, um, because it's not a device uh, born of man. There has been someone beforehand um, that has used the device of the uh, golden falcon. Ha. So, Ormond. Hmm. Some all there. This is a golden falcon holding a scepter. This happens to be Anne Boleyn's uh, emblem. Now, when I found this, I didn't like this. I was like, uh, okay, coincidence much? Uh, then also how he starts the ascendants. He starts the ascendants uh, in his prefaces with uh, this typography. We have someone who's being beheaded. I was like, okay. Fair enough. Although I did, I like to try and look at these as close as possible and try and um, really make sure there's nothing lurking uh, in these. Um, and I did notice the expression on the face changes slightly. And if you uh, if you actually look at the last one, you might notice missing the border. And then also if you if you notice the the woman. You notice her belly. There seems to be a slight discrepancy um, on the line of her belly. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. That's all we're gonna. That's all we're gonna say for the minute. But let's uh, let's keep going on. And um, I also accidentally found this. Uh, the there. Yet it is good armour and noble in those flaunches, which are the, the these things. Uh, may be born under two sundry coats, but therein lieth a mystery. Born under two sundry coats. I was like, all right, okay, fair enough. And then I came to this, which is uh, he goes through um, a history of uh, the monarchy, um, descending and then ascending. Uh, so always regard to pre-bearing. In the second consideration, you say whether uh, he be able to declare his pedigree. If he be, yet I am not able uh, to note it, because I never learned so far. Gerard, I will also teach you the order of two pedigree, uh, uh, direct pedigree in two sundry sorts, and both to one intent as followeth. So he goes through it, descending, and then he goes through it, descending, starting with Elizabeth. And ending uh, with Elizabeth. To send some fruit. Uh, the Queen Majesty that now is of whom I praise God if it will be will. To send some fruit as well to, be, uh, to comfort of her majesty. As to the great joy of all her subjects. I first began. But ere you depart, as I first began, here's Elizabeth. I first began, worthily born of old for honour's sake, worthily born for old honour's sake. So will I end like, so will I end likewise. So we return to this, the H and the E, and the crown in between the H and the E. Crown in between the H and the E. Right, okay. And also if we have a look at these um, cognizances, cognizances um, well, here is the... Prince of Wales, the heir to the throne. A nice P there, and a H for E. Or you could say that's an E 
and D, Edward de Vere, maybe, I don't know. Um, and also note this one, this is um, quite a royal fleur-de-lis. This is the Baron of the fleur-de-lis. That's quite a royal emblem. So we've got quite some, some royal emblems. We've also got quite a lot of roses that are surrounding this. Okay, fair enough, Clem. So let's, let's continue. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Richard Field's printing device was the phoenix, and the phoenix often associated with Queen Elizabeth. So the falcon, Bambeline, and Boleyn, which is his, if I'm right, grandmother, and the phoenix, which is his mother. So he's using emblems that are near and dear to him. Um, and of course, uh, let's let's just have a look at this falcon and try to understand because it in itself is a coat of arms because you'll notice behind it you have a Purben Sinister. This Ben Sinister, what is your opinion thereof? He that beareth is a bastard. A bastard, cried you, I never taught you that. Who that learned you so to term it to give you wrong instruction? Uh, count it therefore an error of arms or our arms. Okay. What colour he will, uh, he, but not of metal, for metal is for the bastards of princes. Uh, the head of this falcon, you may be able to see, is also looking behi behind. That's called regardance, being in regardant, i.e. in the sinister direction. Therefore, um, no man should bear this metal in arms, but emperors and kings of blood royal. And it's all in gold. It's all in all. Uh, here beareth uh, or, and then it uh, parteth the field into two colours and is of itself metal. And then it is a secret of secrets. So it's all metal and is of itself metal. Both is of or. Or and or seems to be an O, not in fact a G. Hirhort do know um, if the Hirhort uh, knows an emperor by fortune to be, as sometimes some of his poor subjects are. Well, we know someone who has got a very poor grave indeed. Edward de Vere buried under Ben Johnson's. Uh, the parallel of the prince. To the king, he's vulnerable in no place but one, and this of ours we hope be hurt of none. His had his phoenix, ours no teacher needs. Also here, parallel of the prince to the king, as thou thy sea queen, a blessed babe, as thine hath done to thee. Um, we'll, we'll not we'll not talk about um, this one. His wits left no heir. Um, we'll not talk about uh, Edward de Vere's uh, son. But do do uh, do notice do notice this is the last uh, image also in um, uh, the elements of uh, the elements of armory. Notice that it is these sinker foils in Ben Sinister. The last picture in that book, first and last, are important. Now, we're just starting to scale up the evidence. Thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound, wherefore should I stand? Now gods, stand up for bastards. King John. It's quite an important play because it has one of the most complex characters in Shakespeare. In it, which is the bastard. King John, enter King John, Queen Elena, uh, Salisbury with the uh, chatty, chatty lion, chatty lion, chatty lion. Um, not going to ask about that. Um, so, if we have a look, what now, my son? This is a, a private discussion. Um, 
between the Queen, Elena, and John. King John. What name, my son, have I not... Well, what name, my son, uh, have I not ever said? Okay. Which none but heaven and you I shall bear. King John, our abbeys and our priories shall pay this expedious charge. What mean? Uh, what men are you? Uh, enter Robert Falconbridge. Do we remember Falconbridge from the Minerva? Philip, your faithful subject, I, a gentleman, born in Northamptonshire, an eldest son, as I suppose, to Robert Falconbridge. Okay. Um, Robert Falcon, Northamptonshire. A soldier by the honour-giving hand. Uh, Cordelian, we have our oar in the field, knighted in the field. Uh, the son, Robert, the son and heir to that same falcon bridge. Uh, you came not of one mother, then it seems. Most certain of one mother, mighty king. But for the certain knowledge of that truth, I put your oar to heaven and to my mother. Uh, out of thee, rude man, uh, ye doth shame thy mother. Who's that? That's the queen, is it? Yep. Ellie, El Eliz El El Elizabeth. Heaven guard my mother's honour and my land. And my land. But once we slandered me uh, with bastardy. But where I be as true begot, or no, that shall I lay upon my mother's head, but that I am as well begot, my liege. Compare our faces and be judge yourself, if old Sir Robert did beget us both. Sir Robert did beget us both. He hath a trick of Cordelion's uh, face. Do you uh, not read some tokens of my son? In the large composition of this man, King John. So, um, let's uh, let's uh, start, shall we? Uh, a bit of an insurrection, uh, if I may. Because what does that say? In the reign of King Edward the Fourth, this was Jack Cade, Jack Straw, the bastard of Falconbridge, the bastard of Falconbridge. And it's referring to this play in particular. The plot of King John, uh, John adjudicates uh, an inheritance dispute between Robert Falconbridge and his older brother, Philip the Bastard, um, during which it became uh, becomes apparent that Philip is the illegitimate son of King Richard I, Queen Eleanor, mother to both Richard I and John, recognises the family resemblance in Philip and suggests that he renounce his claim to Falcon, the Falconbridge land in exchange for knighthood. John knights Philip, the bastard, under the name of Richard. So no, the gallant, a gallant monarch is in arms and like an eagle or his airy towers, uh, you bloody Nero's ripping up the womb of your dear mother England, blush for shame. Uh, for your own ladies and pale standing up, remember, visaged maids, their thimbles into armed gauntlets change, their needles to lances, and their gentle hearts to fierce bloody inclination. Strike up our drums to find this danger out. And the bastard says, and thou shalt find it, do not doubt it. Do not doubt, so strike up the drums. Um, if we have a look at this um, from, uh, I think, Act 5, Scene 5, that's going to be important. When English measure uh, backward their own ground, as foul, sh shrewd news, be shrewd uh, thy very hearts underneath that, I did not think to be so sad tonight, black, who ever... Uh, spoke it, it is true, my lord. Uh, well, keep good quarter and good care tonight. The day shall not be up so soon as I, myself, 
well-mounted, hardly have escaped. A way before conduct me to the king, heart, I doubt I will be dead or ere I come. Uh, scene six. Speak quickly. Again, all these quick references to the falcon, to the swift. Uh, why may not I demand of thine affairs? Hubert, I think, thou hast a perfect thought. Hubert. Hubert. What may not I demand of thine affairs? Hubert. Well, that awfully sounds like Robert. Well, a H though, doesn't it? I think thou hast a perfect thought. Hmm. Uh, who thou wilt, thou mayst befriend me so much as to think I come one way of the Plantagenets. Why, here walk I in the black brow of night to find you out. So walking in the sable. And the row is there as well. Oh, I am scalded with my violent motion to speed to see your majesty. Straight let us seek, and straight we shall be sought. The dolphin rages at our very heel, heels. Dolphin uh, rages at our very veer heels. Indeed, someone straight at our heels. Oh, let us pray, pay the time, but needful woe, since it hath been borne hand with our griefs. This England never did, nor never, ever, veer shall lie at the proud foot. Of a conqueror, but when it first did help to wound itself. Uh, now these her princes are come home again, come the three corners of the world in arms, and we shall sh uh, shock them. Never shall make us rue if England to itself do rest but true. Now the last person in this play um, is the bastard who is having his speech. So he's the last person speaking. Um, in uh, this speech, got loads of evermores and uh, veers. Do rest, but true. Hmm. So let's do this. We've been talking a lot about fire. Ben Johnson's execration of Vulcan, all the references to fire. Well, let's have a look at a fireplace. This is Kenilworth Castle in in Stratford in Warwickshire, twenty minutes from Stratford upon Avon. Well, let's have a look at the coat of arms, shall we? And along that coat of arms, you are going to see a baton, the rugged staff, the rugged staff. Um, And that also to me looks like a T. That's uh, Robert Dudley. This is the, the, the castle of Robert Dudley at one stage. The first Earl of uh, Leicester. So we have a baton and we have a T. We also have this. Uh, that means Dwar and Loyal. This is, uh, his motto, Dwar and Loyal. Right and Loyal. Uh, if you have a look at that D, you're also going to see some double Vs. And it also looks like there might be a fleur de lis there. So, um, here is uh, Sir Robert Dudley, who was a knight. Um, he was the first Earl of Leicester. There's his life dates. He was really, really important. Uh, because he was the Queen's suitor for quite some time. At one stage he proposed uh, to the Queen but was rejected by the Queen. Uh, he was the Queen's favourite from quite some time and one of the most powerful and important men in uh, in England. There's his um, coat of arms. You may see that there is a moon um, in the centre. Now, you'll notice uh, this printing device on the front, Britain's Bower of Delights. Uh, this has been on the front of every single one of the videos I've made so far. I didn't realise how important it was, though. I knew it contained Come Hither, Shepherd Swain, 
which is very important if you watch um, uh, the first video. Um, but on the front of it, we have this bear and this rugged staff being held, as you'll see, upright, vertically. Noble gent, NB gent. We have this staff being held up vertically. That bear, coincidentally, apparently his name is Artos, which is very interesting. Um, so we have this, but we also have uh, the, <laughs> not ready for that yet, the motto, Dwar and Loyal, the same motto. Um, so this has very, very strong relationship uh, with a very strong relationship with Robert Dudley. And then I accidentally found this. You can see the exact same sign of the rugged staff and the bear at the top of Robert Dudley's arms. This is from, thank you to the Huntington Library for digitising this. This is from the Heroica Eulogia. Who's it authored by? William Bauer? Bauer? Bauer. That is Britain, Britain's Bauer of Delights, um, which contains the very, very important uh, poem in which Edward de Vere reveals his identity okay so that's that's crazy okay this is absolute craziness already okay also notice um that uh, the where am i going with it? if you uh, do digit uh, some arithmetic with the date you also get 28 um <laughs> so bauer dedicates the volume of this newly created uh, work to the earl of esther so heroica eulogia is dedicated to the Earl of Leicester and the inscription in the front sometimes the truth comes to light unsought Whew. okay uh, so I'm pretty sure um, that's some really strong proof already that uh, Robert Dudley is very very much involved um, in this and also look at this, the Rose and Crown near Holborn uh, Bridge. The Rose and Crown near Holborn. We have our Bourne. We have our 10 in there. If we chose to see that, a H is an E. Um, and our bridge, like Falcon Bridge. That's important. The Rose and Crown is quite important for where he is buried. He is buried in, in St Mary's Church in, in, uh, in, uh, in Warwickshire. Here is um. Here's some roses, and a crown, uh, on his grave. Let's have a look at his monument, shall we? Well, you can see again, this rugged staff, and this this bear. But let's uh let's just see. And again, the rugged staff and the bear being held upright, the rugged staff upright. Have a look at what's behind. You can see that we have some spears. Okay, here's a spear in particular, which is at the same angle as the spear on Shakespeare's coat of arms. Okay, let's do, um, and you'll notice, oh look, there's a, seems to be a T. There's a T on that particular uh on that particular um, flag. Let's do some counting. One, two, three, four. That is the fourth spear. That is the fourth spear, the 40. Notice the double Vs. And also above we have this little winged messenger. Um, that is a gentle married uh, that, that if a gentleman marry, this is from the ascendants again, a gentlewoman heir, he may bear her coat. He may bear her coat. <laughs> well, he is bearing her coat. In a sense, there is a bear there. Here is um. Whew. Whew. Let's 
keep going, keep going. So here we have Queen Elizabeth's coat of arms. Dieu et mon droit. That's uh, God and my right. That's still used um, outside of Scotland uh, by the monarchy. That's a that's their thing. God and my right. Well, we've met this, haven't we? Right and loyal. And the motto of uh, Shakespeare's coat of arms: Not without right. Hopefully that is starting to make a little bit more sense why it's called, um, why that motto is not without right. There's a full picture for you of the falcon that is above, and that's pointing to the grave of Ben Johnson. You'll notice what is on its head, the crown. That's the full grave um, above of, uh, if we have a look, you'll notice the IHS there. There's loads of interesting things. Can you see the rugged staff? Can you see the rugged staff there at the top? There's a rugged staff for you at the top. Loads of things, the L's. We have a lot there. Let's have a look. This is John Hunter. A hunter, much like a falcon. His news as a gifted interpreter of the divine power and wisdom at work and the laws of organic life and their grateful um, veneration for his services to mankind as the founder of scientific surgery. Scientific surgery. There's loads, there's loads and loads of things here. That's just so much. Um, I, um, I'm, I, can't, I can't talk about it. I just want to show you the key, the key things as we head towards proof. Notice also it's uh, St. Martins in the field, Artins in the fields, and 28. Uh, next to it, well, what do we have but a grave of Sir Robert and his um, his wife here, whose name begins with an E. I uh, can't remember it off the top of my head. And of course, whoa, 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 whoa. And if we have a look above those graves, we have this wonderful um, monument uh, here. Um, which is full of wit, full and full of wit. Uh, if you remember, here's a golden lamp with fire. You may have remember Ben Johnson's previous one that didn't have any fire to it. Um, the uh, the bust on the top there, which you may be wondering, which seems a bit disjointed, that's Sir Charles Lyle, Lie and our double L. Um, here we go, and he's a geologist, so probably pay attention to the stone that's being used for the graves. So um, this is really um, cool. I really love this. So this is a, if we have a look, we have our double-headed eagle, our double-headed eagle, double-headed eagle. He beareth the jewels, uh, was born two eagles sat upon the house of his father. Signifying unto him the Ro, which is the Or, and the Ra, or the Pa in this case. Um, and whose is this? Robert. Also, if you look, yet again, hidden away, you can see the rugged staff. And of course, this is referenced in, in the Minerva Britannia as well. You've seen the, the rugged staff, which I probably should have put a red box around, actually, on the previous grave um, of uh, John Hunter. But here we have as well um, the husband good that by experience knows with cunning skill to prune and where to plant, to so where to put the rugged staff without it being noticed. And again, notice that is upright. Uh, so, um, Justice uh, Lippius thinks that this soldier, for it was a private uh, device who bared the shield, was of a legion made out of two, for the two eagles seem mixed as it were in one. Not have I in present any better conjecture to bring, though I would, uh, he had delivered his concept, what the crown over it might mean. His conceit, sorry, his conceit, 
uh, that's what the crown over it what might be made out of two out of two eagles seen mixed in one and the crown over the top remember argent is for princes uh, revived among the rest at westminster and there written emperor hath it but one head and the same seems like uh, anciently painted or stained in the glass window over it if we have a look at this monument um if you have a look at what they're pointing to she's pointing to the t remember i am t and the angel is pointing to the t now let's have a look at this we have we have our x or 10 in roman numerals it's an important number um and if we have a look next to it, we have some berries. Well, you'll find that in the Minerva Britannia. Uh, Britannia. And also uh, death. If we have a look here, we have uh, death and Cupid side by side in an inn where room was scant. Together, both they lay. Death and Cupid for you. We have a look here. We have a swan. Here's your swan. He beareth Argent a swan. Seems to be an Argent. He beareth Argent a swan, uh, jewels. Well, it's in Argent, I should say. That's in the swan on there is in jewels. Um, doth but only delight in music. Uh, doth not only delight in music, but sin in uh, geth of himself. Uh, Martinus saith, blah, blah, blah. As soon as the king of the Ligurians, bewailing the death of Phaeton, Phaeton um, was turned into a swan. As Ovid witnesseth, in the old time this bird was uh, consecrate to Apollo. The swan uh, pursueth the cockold maker even unto death, and will not leave the spouse breaker till he kill or be killed. His chief strength is in his wings. He singeth much before his death as rejoicing the end of all calamities. Indeed. Uh, you'll notice this shield in particular. This shield is very important because what are its colours? Sable and ore. Quite high up there. Um, um, if we just see what it says. This is the ninth honourably uh, honourable ordinary. Nine is an important number. And containeth, i.e. containeth the first part of the shield, which is more estimation than is well considered of many that beareth the same well let's just have a look at this well if you have a look at what's contained on the center uh, we have this your ermine this is the first and the chiefest of the rest and is called ermine and thus shall you say he beareth ermine and not argent powdered with sable it is the skin of a little beast uh, lesser the uh, squirrel in the la uh, squirrel his being is in woods, in the lad of armory, in the land, sorry, of armory. Um, the lad, I suppose, is also there, but the land of armory, whereof he taketh the name. An emperor, a king, and a prince may have these powders in their apparel as thick set together as he will. An earl, his mantle's cape. Uh, man, his mantle's cape with three ranges otherwise termed ranks ra ranks that ranks is important they also remember that in some coat they are told but then they are not to the number of ten but they are not to the number of ten well we have a ten and x on the front there we have another x there it's twenty and another X there. It's 30. And can you see our 40? It's on the window in the glass. Another X, the fourth. This differeth from ermine, for on every side of the uh, powders there is one uh, here of jewels. Here of jewels, much like glass. And what's really funny as well, this is the 4T. If you remember that H is our uh, E. Um, our Hethin Feta is our E. So 4T. We have this. And just notice the shield has nothing on it. 
it's transparent. Notice also it has a P on it. These P's are quite important. Here it means proper. It's the proper colour for glass. There's the window. You may see the fleur de lis. Hibereth Argent's a flower uh, de luce uh, sable, black in this case. Although this be of a colour sable, yet naturally it hath all the colours of a rainbow, which giveth unto the beholder there a marvellous delight, and yet is not so delectable in smell. <laughs> well, glass doesn't have a very good smell, I'm sure, uh, well, next to none. Uh, but the root containeth in it a sweet savour. Natural uh, liege lords, the kings of England, I could write more, but sith it accordeth not to my purpose, I will here uh, with leave off and return to the flower de luce, telling you that you shall learn by it that when things are born in their natural colour, then hath the first bearer something in him correspondent to the natural uh, property thereof. But when there are altered from their uh, uh, proper colours um, then is there to be considered either the addition or subtraction and to take thus for the gentle rule of other things with a figure of addition or subtraction well it seems he's not just doing this with the inclusion uh, of letters or um, the exclusion of players but he's also doing this with our fleur de lis you'll see that that's a slightly different fleur de lis. Um, the addition or subtraction, but when they are altered from their proper colours, when they are altered from their proper uh, devices, they're being used and to take for a general rule of all other things. So there is the fleur de lis, um, in a sense, on the, on the grave with the falcon. And you see this quite a few times. He beareth uh, sanguine, a flower de luce argent, uh, for a difference of a sixth, like sixth brother. This flower of all hath most diversity in him, and therefore is likened to the rainbow. Uh, but the principal colour, I mean, that hath uh, most mastery in him is blue. Remember, blue is for Britain. Uh, the signification whereof is steadfast truth in which the bearer thereof uh, should flourish as this flower in the field according to the saying of David, flower in the field. Well, here's something from the Ascedents. And here in this escutcheon is to be noted that my cutter hath done a fault. Not so fault, for he hath set her go owing out of field, which nothing ought to do that is movable. Yet workmen that be not skilful in this art do commit the like faults very often, as for example the glasser that glassed the temple church windows on the north side hath set the arms of England so out of order as the lions are going out of field, so that neither the glasser, painter, nor any that cutteth in stone may do in these things without the advice of the Hearhorts, for the like fault also is committed in Saint Catherine's blah 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 T at the end. Okay? Notice the four T again, the four T and the T uh, that ends at the end. Now this is important. Church upon a tomb here take uh, with you a rule that nothing may be set with the head downwards. Now, we've already spoken in, in the previous one. Uh, I mentioned Westminster. We're talking about the church. We're talking about the glass here that glassed the temple church windows of the north side. Shall we have a look at them? So, here we go. Well, here are our lions that have been talked about. And here is the head that is downward cast and nothing may be set with the head downcast. Nothing being Edward de Vere. So Edward de Vere is set uh, with the head, with the person, in this case, of the head of the downward cast. Should we have a look at this very magnificent window? I double V, that ends double V. We have, we can see the VV of the, uh, the M, so double V. 
E, our ore, our gold. I can't really see that very well, but I can see a T and a V. So there's more wick going on here than we can see. John, good old John. Uh, wolf, we have our double V of our, of, our, of our W and an E on the end. We have an R of Barry. Um, the K also contains a V. You could see it as uh, your B. Uh, you can also see that as a 3 and a 1, a 1 with a 3 uh, behind it. Uh, that seems to be a T, again, a V, and that S is super important, which we'll talk about in a second. One thing I do want you to notice, though, please, is these. That's an oxhorn. They're oxhorns, and you are going to see these everywhere. But first off, you need to know why they're important. And the Ovid's Metamorphoses is so important, particularly Book 15. Okay, I think I mentioned Romulus spear um, that turns into a tree. Well, we have a, a sequence of three stories in that that are really important. Here's the second one, the one after. This is Sippus, Kippus. He was a um, he was a really he was a legendary uh, Roman uh, uh, military commander, and there was a one day he grew ox horns. Uh, on his head and there was a prophecy that whoever grew ox horns on their head would be king um, now Kippus uh, decided that it was better to not be a king uh, to have voluntary exile so what he does is he, he covers his horns in laurel leaves and goes to the senate and he tricks them he, he pretends, he, he tells them a lie about whoever has ox horns uh, will be king of, of Rome, uh, but will make laws uh, that will make the citizens slaves. So he gets the, the Senate to, um, to bar, to, um, uh, to banish this person from ever entering the city of Rome. At which point, as soon as that is passed, he takes off his laurels and lo and behold, uh, Kippus is the one with ox horns and and the senate may following the laws they've set they must banish him from the city um but to to make amends for this because they they give him a headdress of honor for the fact that he he had the chance to be king and he didn't want to be king um because he he didn't think he'd maybe do the best job or perhaps because there was a higher more important cause um but he um he, he was praised by the Romans and they gave him as a tribute lands outside of the of the uh, the gates of, of Rome that equaled the amount that oxen with a plough could circle within a day. Right. And also in remembrance of Kippus on the gates of uh, on the on the gates of Rome, they engraved his ox horns the symbol of his ox horns so his name might be remembered forevermore and what you will find this is from the first folio is you will find these ox horns engraved upon i'd imagine quite a few you'll see them there in the Angkor spine as well these ox horns are his marks his engravings um, to let us know that it is the Earl of Oxford that has done this work, just as you have seen those uh, on the window. You can see it on the window there. You can see his ox horns, his mark uh, of the ox. So uh, you also have your uh, double Vs there, which you can see, double Vs there. And you can see uh, your Edwardus, um, so your Edward. Also notice what's on the background here. You have an E with a crown. We love our E. Uh, we've been having a lot of witty, cunning play um, <laughs> all over the place with this figure of edition, with this E. Um, it's the most characteristic letter in his name, Edward de Vere, as well. Um, if we actually have a look, you might notice he did tell us to have a look um, at the arms as well. So let's have a look at this spear, which he's holding upright edward is holding a spear upright and what's it pointing to but veer 
Can you see that? It's pointing to Veer. You have a Veer, V-E-E-R. You have a Veer, and also by his feet, V-E-E-R, you have an anagram of Veer. Um, that is by the tip of the spear, the head of the spear, and by his feet. You also may notice underneath the jewels, the robe of jewels, his undercoat is green, is vert, is veer. Okay, underneath this cloth is veer. Right, the, the game he's playing is, is just wonderful. Uh, there's also loads of other things. I'm not going to go into too many of them, but you'll find so many overlaps uh, between this stuff and the Minerva uh, Britannia. Um, I'm sure many, many books will be written about uh, all of the wit in the future. Um, I'm aware that our Prime Minister is writing said book, uh, which I'm sure will be a tour de force of words, wit and invention. Um, but might I politely request he includes some of this uh, research uh, uh, in his book uh, and uh, I, I wish him well with it. Uh, so let's just quickly talk about this because this is the third and perhaps most important um, story in um, after Kippus uh, in book 15 of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, this is uh, the story of Asclepius, Asclepius, um, the god of, often seen the god of medicine. Um, and uh, what, what happens is basically Rome is, is facing uh, an epidemic um, where people are dying. Um, so the Romans, the Senate get desperate, so they dispatch a um, a, a, a team um, to go to uh, to the temple of Apollo uh, at Delphi um, and to ask for help with this 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 major epidemic um, and uh, Apollo says what you are seeking here O Romans you should seek for nearer you then seek it nearer for you do not need Apollo to uh, uh, relieve your wasting plague you need Apollo's son. <laughs> That's very good. Apollo's son. Go then to him with a good omen and invite his aid. I read that really as like know yourself um, if we know ourselves better. Um, but that's maybe the meaning beneath that. Anyway, so they, uh, they, they need to go and seek Apollo's son. And Apollo's son is Asclepius. Um, so they, um, uh, the, the leader of... Um, this this troop that's been dispatched um, has a dream uh, where the god Asclepius comes to him um, with a staff and a snake around the staff, um, and and tells him that uh, like go visit me um, at uh, my temple and when you come there I am going to transform myself into a giant golden snake uh, and then take me with you back to Rome and I'll I'll help you. So um, the Romans go to the temple of uh, Asclepius, which happens to be uh, in Epidavros. Epidavros, uh, no, not Epidorus, Epidavros, um, which is uh, the one that has one of the most uh, uh, beautiful um, Greek theatres in the world. It's magnificent. I, I, I absolutely adore it. It's one of the best um, theatres in the world. So that happens to be where... Um, his temple is so they go to um, to the temple uh, of Asclepius and uh, lo and behold there is a giant golden snake uh, so the Romans uh, take uh, the golden snake put him on the ship they go off on their voyages off on a few voyages and then eventually uh, get back uh, to Rome where he's welcomed uh, with applause um, there's the dream that I was speaking of before, which I probably should have showed you. Of, um, that. Anyway, he, he comes back to Rome. Um, this, this giant golden snake comes back to Rome. Uh, and the serpent deity has entered Rome, the world's new capital. And lifting up his head above the summit of the mast, looked far and near for a congenial home. The river there, dividing, flows about a place known as the island. So he chooses an island. On both sides, an equal stream glides past dry middle ground. And here, the serpent child of Phoebus, left from the Roman ship, took his own heavenly form and brought to the morning city health 
once more. So he transforms back from this golden snake, from ore. Remember, golden is ore. He transforms back from this ore uh, to his own form once more and brings health to the city. So um, get ready to give praise to some very great wits. Now that we know this, this, I think, is one of the pinnacles of the research I've been doing that we've been working uh, towards. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I think this is absolutely incredible. How's he going to reveal himself? Well, it's pretty witty. Meet the window of Edward the Confessor. Yep, I joke you not. That is Edward the Confessor. OK, shall we have a look at it? I'm sure you may be able to see already. There is our golden falcon right at the top looking down upon King Edward. And there is Edwards, and there's loads of things going on here. You might notice that the border actually contains the same E, the crowned E, and also golden falcons. You have a border of golden falcons. Just to hammer the point home about the falcon, this really was the Swifty Dispatcher. Good luck arguing with that. Um, so, uh, Edwards, um, if we have a look, again, we have the ox horns on this window, okay? Uh, but... What is this window of? It's in memory, double V, me, in double V, uh, V or E, of the Royal Army, Ro or Ra, um, Ed, medical. Well, what's the story we've just heard about? Medical, Asclepius. It's from Ovid. This is what it's all about. It's about uh, the story of Asclepius. Uh, medical cause. Um, and same with the scientific surgery you saw before, medicine. Uh, all of the double L, the, both the Ra and an An, which is lovely. That word ranks, which I did tell you to look out before, that ranks, great word, is on this window here as well. So uh, you also notice this, uh, this S, this snaking S, that again is probably a, a little nod to Asclepius, but just uh, to be, uh, I'll show you the really obviously in a second. Also notice uh, there's a book there that seems to have a P uh, on that book, maybe some T's that I can see there maybe, um, which is interesting. And he's holding uh, a ring, but notice this. Here's the really interesting thing. I'm not sure whether you, whether you might have noticed this. This is why we need to look a little bit closer. V and an E. Here's a crown and a key. Now look at this. You have some golden skulls. That is a skull. Can you see it? It's a skull at the top. A golden skull. Why is that important? Because of this. That skull is sable. And that skull is ore. If we have a look behind, likewise, at the glass of the window, which I would encourage you to do uh, now, you have a flaming, remember fire is important, ox. That is an ox on fire. If we look a little bit closer, maybe have a see it. Can you see that E? It's very subtle, very subtle. As with lo a lot of this work, if we have a look at what this guy is pointing to in the glass, well, it looks like uh, we have some double V's. There might also be some golden double V's and some other stuff, but we definitely have some double V's there. Uh, I also think he's probably pointing down here to the green stuff. There's going to be something there. That is an ideal place to hide some wit. Um, but I don't want to um, start speculating and go in too much um, detail because there's just so much stuff here. This whole window, I mean the star of his coat of arms, the sun above, there is so much stuff in the glass of that window, um, which is just remarkable. Ah, so, um, returning to this, hopefully, there we go, starting to knit it all together, all those cords that you've been seeing, you can see uh, that our falcon, uh, or whatever this is, or whether they're eagles behind, I'm not entirely sure, but that's definitely a falcon. We have um, it being tied together. All of the threads are being tied together um, at last. If we have a look at the window 
again, well, let's have a look at who's adjacent. This is Ed Wynn, Edwin, where we have someone with a spear at an angle, and we have uh, this staff being held very straight, and that's insinuated in other places as well, even the direction of the falcon, uh, which is an oblique direction, and the cross, uh, which is uh, straight up. So we have quite a few of these things. There's so much meaning in this mean in this window. It's a little bit crazy. And again, it's all it's all suggested and and told uh, for you in in, in the Minerva Britannia. Uh, fair princess, great religious, uh, modest wise, uh, by whose fair arm my muse did first arise that crept before full lowly on the ground and durst not yet from her dark shade aspire till thou sweet sun did help to raise her higher now we might be starting to get all of the apollo and the sun references uh, here write her fate her date her banishment can you see the ox horns there brilliant no yeah he's even put his ox horns uh, there uh, or may the day lasting lily be uh, or soli uh, sequium uh, to follow thee that's apparently here, the, the flower of the sun from the marigold uh, continually uh, following the same. And there you can see we have a window of glass. Yeah, it's a window. Clever, no? Uh, to, the ex to the most excellent Princess Elizabeth, uh, only daughter to our sovereign Lord King James, King of Great Britain. Now, here's which which is just amazing and and so this is to James the first daughter and he's calling her king uh, him king of Great Britain now remember um following what we've found already uh, Edward de Vere uh, is the heir to the throne of England okay however he for whatever reason chooses not like Kippus to take the throne probably because he's publishing so many works and he feels he's doing a, a, a greater job for humanity and um, uh, posterity by the work that he's doing which truly he has done right um, but Great Britain why Great Britain well um, it's from the De Vere Society website with a, with a few minor additions uh, Queen Elizabeth dies and is succeeded by James the first James the Fourth of Scotland, son of Mary Stuart, in a uh, a remarkably smooth and peaceful transition of power, thus uniting the English and Scottish thrones for the first time. I'm okay with those double A's. Uh, in the same uh, in in the same uh, year, Oxford's uh, crown annuity of one thousand uh, pounds is renewed by King. James, who describes him as Great Oxford. So um, he's being described by James as uh, Great Oxford. There's a reason he's being described by King James as Great Oxford. And there's a reason why the transition of power was so smooth and peaceful, because you are looking very much at Edward de Vere's creation which is why on his window you have that flag, the, the, a coat of Great Britain, because Great Britain is very much the Earl of Oxford's invention. Note to this, to my dread sovereign King James of Great Britain, King of Great Britain, anchor, anchor of hope, and continue. This is the first picture uh, in the Minerva Britannia. Yeah? Uh, in double chain of a diadem doth hold, who circle it, it bounds the greater Britain, uh, to God obliged by uh, so by twofold band as born man and monarch of this land, with malice vile in vain doth man intend to unloose the knot that God uh, hath linked so fast, who shoots at heaven the arrow down at last, lights on his head and vengeance fall on them that make uh, their mark this sovereign diadem. And there we go. You can see uh, this sovereign uh, diadem uh, there. So hopefully uh, no one will uh, shoot down um, this wonderful uh, sovereign diadem 
of Great Britain. Um, I love Great Britain. I'm, I'm 40% English, 20% uh, Welsh and 40% Scottish. So uh, like, I'm really proud of my wonderful uh, country, Great Britain. Um, so if we also have a look, you may see we have, just to really spell it out to you, um, some uh, snakes on some staffs. So we have this Asclepius. Okay, um, there we go. We have our Asclepius. Um, yeah. And we have some double Vs. So you can really, really see this. Now this makes sense. All of the snakes and Minerva Britanna, it makes sense. You can see these triangles here with the snakes, snakes on either side of these. And where's it going? It's going up to the crown, which is indeed on top. And there's a little T in that uh, orb as well. So there we go. Um, hopefully this is making more sense uh, to you uh, now. If we have a look, remember rings are for remembrance. Indeed, they are rings are for remembrance. Um, and if we have a look at this, now something really bothered me when I saw this. If you have a look at Minerva there, she isn't being born with a spear in her hand. That's quite an essential feature of her birth, that she's being born with shaking a spear in her hand. If you also notice, um, Jove, uh, uh, Zeus in his hand, is holding... Um, uh, an X, those lightning bolts are forming an X. They're a bit of a weird shape for a lightning bolt, aren't they? They're quite square in their um, in in their making. Uh, so if we just have a look, and, and you'll see them over here again. Uh, and here's the statue of Terminus, because we are about to reach uh, one of our main terminuses. Um, so here is Terminus, statue of Terminus. Um, a pillar high erected was of stone and as we can see now and hopefully we understand his monument isn't stone it's glass which is really really poetic for Apollo the god of the sun has made his monument in glass uh, in former times they uh, which they named her terminus uh, as was esteemed a god of everyone uh, the upper part was like a woman framed uh, of comely feature down unto the breast of marble hard a pillar was the rest a pillar hmm, pill pillar that's important uh, which when jove passed uh, with stern aspect he bade them remove uh, this god remove and get them gone but terminus as stoutly did neglect uh, her hest and answered uh, i give place to none. Remember, De Vere is nothing, none. I am bound, I am the bound of things which God above has fixed, and none is above to remove. Uh, and yeah, well, you're going to have difficulty removing uh, that. And you can see the 40 at the bottom there. Now, uh, let's just have a look at this halo. That halo is in vert, is in green for Veer. Veer. Uh, so we have a halo of green. Now, I missed this the first time. It's really easy to miss so much of this stuff if you're not looking uh, for it. Um, but just as that, uh, as Terminus is, the upper half of her is flesh. The lower half of her is stone. Um, hmm. I missed this on the first time. Can you see any more green on that window? I had to go back um, and on the second time I realised it's being a little bit obscured there deliberately. Okay, So that's what you're going to see from the front. But what you need to do is have a look behind the marble or the stone because what you have there, again your ox horns below, you have this, which is very, very important. You have uh, the phoenix with our Zeus's lightning bolts, which explains why there was no spear, because the spear is not being held by Pale, it's being held by King Edward. 
Okay. Uh, this is a phoenix, and you'll see this same image, which is crazy. You see this same image in the Minerva Britanna, which is the sun and the earth uh, here again. Um, and here is our, our phoenix above it. Uh, so um, the noblest a sprite, right, right, sprightest, uh, that with the bird of Jove um, have learnt to leave the uh, and blah, 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 your heart's content and high felicity, a faithfulness, and you, you, that overlook the clouds of care and smile to see a multitude of ants or Taurus upon this circle striving here and there uh, for thine and mine, yet pine amid uh, their wants, yet while, uh, uh, or anyone I should say, that's the thing, me included, I've, I've been an ant many times and not noticed this, uh, for thine and mine, yet pine amid their wants, uh, while ye uh, yourselves see as spectators free from action in their follies tragedy. So, whew. to heavenward, homeward, once you had your birth, virtus, uh, uh, which is virtue, and uh, that's really, that's such an important line, which is why it's so long to heavenward, homeward. Once you had your birth as well, and then our virtus, our virtus, uh, at the end of this line. Um, so if we just kind of analyse slightly some of the things that are going on, relating these back to the ascendants. But this, but in this coat he is in proper colour and is in his natural field. And wherefore do ye not say proper colour or that the sun is of his proper colour? Um, Galatus say that a man shall discern colour if he may come within a night's rays, rays of any banner. But I never heard of a man that came within a hundred night's rays of the sun. What is a night's rays? It is nine foot of uh, a size in length of the field. Well, I was wondering what this is. Well, nine is an important number, obviously it's six. But if you have a look here, uh, you actually have the one that you can see from the front uh, is your I and your X. Or you could argue it's just the ones in the window. But I think um, it's telling you because it's between the I and the X. Yeah. Um, so if you come within a night's race. So if you come within this X and this I, then you can see what is behind it, which is this. This is very important. Uh, the rose is very, very important. The flower of all other is the beautifulest to behold and of most comfortable smell. Um, that amongst all flowers of the world, the rose is chiefest and beareth uh, the uh, praise, therefore, or prize, it beareth the prize. Therefore, uh, for saith he, the chiefest part of man, which is the head, is crowned with roses, and so agreeeth that is written in the book of wisdom. Let us crown ourselves with roses, meaning with sweet smell of heaven, uh, roses, uh, with of heaven's joys. Of this golden rose, I could say more, but because it is uh, Romish. I put it off. Romish, ro, or, or uh, ormish, or me, or me, I I H S. So I love this. We've got our or, our double V, and our I S H. Um, I put it off. We have our golden rose, in a sense, with gold at its centre. If I remind you what uh, the Tudor rose, the colours of the Tudor rose. Uh, Elizabeth Tudor, his mother, well, you will see that in the back we have our green and white and then our red, and at the centre we have uh, our gold, but it's not just gold, it's blue. And remember, blue is for Britain. He's trying, like, he's done more for the English language um, than any uh, author by far, but he's given the English and, and well, the British their tongue. He's he's given, um, he he's made Great Britain, which is why uh, that back is blue because it's blue for Britain. Uh, you also see this scienta et ingenio, uh, and you've met this already. Like all science and cunning, 
science and cunning, which is why he probably is buried in the North Isle, because the North Isle has got loads of scientists um, in that isle um, of the world. So is ignorance the only evil? So science and cunning are the only good of the world. Ignorance is the only evil. Now, we've kind of reached, there's so much I could say about this, but I, I don't really want to say any more about this one. I think I've pretty much uh, justified and shown you uh, about this princely man of his origins. I've still got a few more uh, conclusive proofs, one that may be uh, as conclusive actually, uh, but I do want to show you uh, this. Now we, we've just heard that science is important, science is very important. Now he, this is a polymath, remember he's a, a cardino and uh, cardinus comfort. Uh, he's publishing in many different domains. The elements of geometry is maths, uh, poetry, history, uh, on religion, uh, he, he's published so, so much uh, in regards um, to what he's, what he's giving us. Uh, but he also publishes in science. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the arms of someone particular. It's just glossed over. Um, but some of you may know whose arms this is. This, of course, is the arms of Sir Francis Bacon. So congratulations to those people who thought that Francis Bacon uh, wrote the works of Shakespeare. You two are correct, but there's just more to it. It's Edward de Vere wrote under the name of Francis Bacon. So you are right. There's just more to it as well. Um, so these are the arms of uh, Francis Bacon. There was a reason why he was created the Baron of Verulam for the first time. Verulam. Come on, it's, it's there for you. Um, several coats. Um, uh, the fourth as the first the fourth as the first. So the fourth star as the first, perhaps. Um, now have I one other achievement to show you, the which I will uh, defer a while because I will not tie you with too much of one thing uh, together. Uh, therefore, you shall have uh, the means, uh, the mean space of sundry, sundry other coats as blazing. There's the sun and there uh, is the moon, which are both important. You'll see these on the likes of at uh, this again you've, you can see these these pyramids um we have our um our sun and our moon oxford right there the ship uh, which also you have seen uh, so this is it's just incredible the sheer amount um this guy has done he is truly uh, an incredible prince and oh, he's amazing so um anyway at the end of the ascendants of armory here's a little uh, puzzle um, for you. So, uh, for such one as King Edward III made for bringing him good news from Britain to Dover, by which figure you shall have, you shall perceive that Heerholt may have all honourable uh, shifts, all honourable shifts, that possibly may serve there too. Oh, there's the queue. I've been looking for that. I've been looking for that queue everywhere. As in my time, <laughs> And of last year, I saw a here halt for the lack of the queue. Thank you. Ah, been racking my. I knew I saw that somewhere. That queue is the queue on William William Camden's uh, uh, monument. So that was the one queue, the one uh, line of queue. I'm so glad. Thank you very much. Uh, shift is important. The honourable shifts because that's the character in every man out of his humour. And he says it again, just to make it clear for you, and for that shift making, uh, most worthy to be remembered and perpetually amongst Heerholtz and to be written of in the chronicle for Veer or ever. Uh, ha he had had the Queen's royal coat of arms, uh, not to bear of knowledge of this uh, art. He had had... He had had the Queen's royal, art, royal coat of arms. Indeed, he had um, not so bare knowledge of this art. It seemeth to you uh, is so apparel, for he can read and well understand these two verses following. So here you go. Here's two verses. I have a feeling you might need to know some armoury to understand it. I've exhausted uh, my methods um, of of decryption, although to be honest, I don't want to spoil the fun for everyone because um, I've, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm pretty tired now. Um, so good luck, um, good luck cracking it. Do let me know um, what it says. 
Um, so uh, you're also, I'm just going to quickly explain to you what the A's, the double A are about. Uh, well, this is what we have. We have, if you notice in the, I'm, I'm not sure this has ever been said before, but in the Minerva uh, Britannia, you have um, the uh, these printing devices with your AAs in. You can see your AA, your AA, and AA, AA, AA. You actually have this five times uh, within the book of these AAs. But what is this AA, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, so um, here we are. Um, in old and in the old time before printing was devised were writers of books at the king's cost. These gentlemen, I say, when they became masters of men, their servants wear two letters upon their sleeves, as it might be an A and A. The one letter for the Christian name and the other for the surname. But you can see the A and A there. Um, and we have a Ra there because that P is, is a Ra and a Ro there. OK, the ninth hath been called a gentleman, Ra, sun god and Ro, gold. Uh, this is such as one as serveth a prince. So his AAs uh, are a little signs again, one that is serving a prince. So if you ever come across a double A, just know, know ye. Uh, and of course your AAs are actually uh, upside down VVs, so it's really your double V again. Um, so in the front of... Um, uh, the accedents, you've also got this. You've got some AAs, some number fives. It might be nice to do some handwriting analysis uh, on some of that stuff because it's very interesting. Um, I will also mention this, if I may. This is Edward de Vere's uh, coat of arms himself. Uh, Edward de Vere's coat in 1586, when I believe the art of English poesy was published, and he importantly starts receiving his £1,000 annuity from the Queen. Uh, the the art of English poesy is the the longest uh, job application uh, to his mother now as we know, um, asking to not do his duty but to to um, to devote his life to poetry and learning. Uh, so uh, some people have already done some really great work on this. Um, I was reading some of this uh, Oxford's Heraldry Explained by Robert Sean Brazil, uh, two thousand six Shakespeare Matters Spring. Uh, uh, the courtesy of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship and Oxford's new coat of arms in 1586. Uh, uh, Barbara Burris, uh, Burris, I hope I'm saying your name right, I'm sorry if I'm not, a 2003 Shakespeare Matters Summer uh, SOF. So um, they've both done some great research and I actually think both of them have elements <laughs> that are right, even though they disagree with each other. Uh, I both think there's elements that are right in both of them. Um, the question is, what bird is that on the top? I'd hazard a guess that that might actually be a falcon. Uh, there's 21 coats, 21 coats uh, on this uh, shield. But the important thing is, as we know, is it's the meaning. So work needs to be done explaining the meaning in relation to the accedent, uh, the accedents and the elements. And if you really, really want to, I'm not going to take on this because like two is enough um, but if you want to read the Academy of Armory be my guest um, so across the uh, the heart of this shield um, you have a uh, a lion you have the king the lion across and this is from the Minerva Britannia remember across the heart of that shield that is a very noble and princely shield indeed and just to give you a mini speedy dispatcher, very simply compare these two. For like our minds, we are commonly dressed. I think just by comparing those two coat of arms, it becomes pretty obvious who is the genius and uh, who is in his service. Uh, so um, I've not spoken about the title page of the Ascendants of Armoury, which is a masterpiece and we're heading towards the end uh, of this uh, of this talk um, first off you're going to see obviously we have our ox horns there our mark of the ox uh, we also have a bend same orientation as Shakespeare's arms uh, with some letters which I'll explain in a bit so across the bend if you also have a look uh, hidden away uh, we have our star, Edward de Vere's star from his coat of arms. Uh, we also have a, uh, a cloud with our falcon. Um, 
whose, uh, so virtue have their original whose tokens be shown in the scotching between the king and the judge. Well, it, it does say that. And we, we have a king and our, our judge is the fire. We like our fire from the work that we've been doing already. Uh, we have some books at the bottom there. And what do we have but a mask on those books? Three books below. Uh, we also have, uh, seems to be, a spear in a trap. If we look, we have 24 on the sleeve. Uh, we seem to have V uh, on this uh, on this king's um, uh, legs. We have a 4 in this book. Uh, we have our double V on the, the Caligate Knights, uh, on Lee's um, uh, startups. Uh, we have our T there. That's our T, our 6 or our 9 and our 40. So we've got all our signs of the Veer on the title page of this book, which I hope starts to make it a little bit clear. But of course, what are people pointing to? Well, they are pointing to or looking down at this, which is, you might be able to see it. This is your, this is your double V. You have uh, your double V. Uh, and if you have a look here, sacrificed here, uh, if hereby your minds uh, be stirred by virtue to seek what e'er you lacked, then uh, are ye also indebted to this well-deserving author by of necessity enforced ye of elder fame embrace the man and love the work for here your virtues are displayed and blazed to the world that but in corners lurked so there you go he's proved his double v and also shown you that the ascendance of armory uh, is by him so that's the first page ha. um so advise you well this work ere uh, ye reprove uh, conceive it wearily uh, read it more than once so you so shall you find an art worth precious stones indeed you will you'll find precious stones although the back uh, although the, although by kind the will not abide but the back might uh, the glittering show of comely uh, phoebus course but from the light air shrouds herself aside apollo's beams party shine near the worse so here we go uh, here is the back page the last page of the ascendance of armory uh, now when you look at it there's a lot going on it's very confusing um uh, let's start let's start with these figures we have atlas and hercules well from hercules and the iconologia we know he represents heroic virtue we also if you notice have pegasus down here uh, Pegasus is the uh, the force of virtue, and well, let's have a look at Pegasus. So this is um, the to the reader of this one is by Richard R. Argol of the Inner Temple. Um, wisheth the reader advancement by virtue, not just advancement by virtue, but the ascendance is by virtue. It is by virtue, by virtue, by virtue. Um, I suppose that also could be an anagram of two and veer, you veer, I suppose, maybe. I don't know. Um, so um, if we have a look at this uh, shield here, we have uh, Pegasus, Volatat, uh, uh, Alta Ad Sedella Virtuous, uh, which means virtue flies to the heaven. So already, hopefully you can see virtue is really, really important uh, to this work. Uh, and if you remember back, uh, I'm not a trained practitioner of neurolinguistic programming, nor should I be. Uh, but there we go. If you remember the uh, the virtue, then this is going to make a lot more sense to you. Virtue uh, yet will ever abide with us, uh, yet uh, that shall mount with our minds to the highest heavens. Well, virtue flies to heaven, uh, yet virtue ever abide with us and will mount with our minds to the highest heavens. It is virtue flies to the heavens um, by your loving and assured friend, the Earl of Oxford. Notice this uh, this very weird pilcrow, this pea. Now, we've been seeing some peas uh, quite 
oft in this work and throughout this video, but this is a, an important P. Why? Because what are we pointing to? We have our P. That is our P. This P is actually just below here. Uh, you might see it again before, uh, but it's a circle, so they're all um, P's around it. And most importantly, can you remember how many times virtue featured uh, in this uh, letter by the Earl of Oxenford? Eight times. And what are we pointing to? Eight. We have our P and our eight times. That is our proof that Edward de Vere is writing the ascendants of Armory uh, and the proof that Edward de Vere uh, is the the author of Shakespeare's work and many others. I've, I've outlined some of those uh, those knights, uh, as, as he calls them in uh, Wit, Written Brass, uh, part two. But he's published many, many works, not just in English, uh, but also in French and Italian. Who, who knows how many he's actually um, published. But this, this man is a genius. Um, you also notice his star there. There's his star um, above the coat of arms. And uh, this Pegasus, uh, it, just in case the inner temple law courts would like to know uh, where their heritage um, has come from. Well, I'm sure you know that Robert, Robert Dudley was a, a, a patron of the of the inner temple law courts. Um, so perhaps you might like to know uh, where your uh, your which is on your gates and all over the place. You have a lovely garden, by the way. I really like your garden. Um, but um, if you'd like to know where your coat of arms and your motto comes from, that's where it comes from. Uh, so uh, back to the front. Um, and to say we have some rings, remember rings are for remembrance. They're also mirrors, holding the mirror up to nature. Um, let's just have a look at what is across that bend, P-I-F-T. So P is for prudence, the looking glass of crystal in a field of uh, green or vert. So it's a mirror and in a field of the, uh, which signifieth Prudence. Um, prudence searches all things and trieth, uh, trieth forth truth. Uh, we have also justice. That uh, that I or, or J is for justice, um, which uh, upholdeth the dignity of every or very um, Veer's estate, or I hope every estate, and yieldeth to everyone to Veer his due. Uh, we then also have uh, fortitude. Uh, the third is a pillar of uh, porf porphyria in a golden field, uh, which signifies fortitude, who groundeth upon, um, again, he's telling you all the way through this, administer, <laughs> administer groundeth upon, uh, uh, con, uh, I was going to say there, um, confidence, sir, okay, um, he, uh, fleeth to none uh, but to but, oh I think it was to do with hold and um, how hold is tenon maybe I don't know um, he fleeth uh, to none but to God saying he is my fortitude and lastly we have temperance which is where our P is the fourth is a, uh, a, a Jug and cup of ruby rock in a silver field, which signifieth temperance, who ruleth himself by discretion against the violent movings of courage and things unlawful, and causeth all things to proceed in order and degree. So he is discreet. It's about discretion. Why might this be important? Well, this happens. There's a T there, quite a big T, because this is, if we, are, if we remember, my lord, that I... Am T, as he says in the execration of Vulcan. Uh, we have, uh, well, our T. This is our fourth paragraph. It says, the fourth, uh, the fourth T. This is our T. The fourth paragraph. The T of the fourth paragraph. And just to remind you, here's our P, our pill crow, uh, which arguably. Um, 
it could also be a D, which is the fourth letter. Uh, you have Ford, Ord, so there, um, here, or or not, for as he saith, saith, there is no imperial crown but of gold, but as for other crowns, there are of, uh, of all other metals, their colour must, therefore must be named the fourth T. The 40, the 40, remember that eta is also an E, and you have, well, a 4 and a T. So that's 40, and also you may see fortitude, 40, 40, 40, 40, and 4T. And then after that, you get the mark, the T, uh, this important, uh, which is a T in that pilgrim as well, actually, but this very, very important mark. Uh, which um, he uses to identify himself later on. So if we return uh, back to this and have a look at the coat of arms, really important. Uh, this is telling you about uh, his ancestry and, and who his parents are. If you have a look at both of these two um, uh, uh, flaunches, uh, then you'll see that the background, the field of it, is your R. Your R for Robert and your E for Elizabeth. Uh, and th these flaunches are somewhere in between the two, as you can see. One's not very much on there, the other it, uh, is almost touching. And you can see uh, that it's an intermediary uh, between the two. So this is the reward of a gentlewoman for the service done by her, uh, service by her done to her prince or princes by the uh, voiders. Um, I O V. Um, void is nothing though as well. Should be of one of the the nine verbs. Uh, uh, she rode armed into the field. Um, Robert Dudley was made knight uh, of the horse. I think it was uh, by Elizabeth when he rode to her um, for her, upon her coronation on the horse. I believe uh, or something to that extent. A worthy princess, most worthy to be held. To be had in perpetual remembrance. So saying, O worthy princess, if we have a look at this one, he beareth, as in bearing child, he beareth verts. Um, yet it is it is good armoury and noble in those flaunches may be borne two sundry coats, but therein lieth the mystery. So this is why that was important. Uh, we've seen this one. Well, look at the V's at the, at the top there. Uh, this coat I set out for your learning which means you should probably learn from it, um, and took uh, the trick of the same. Um, Any time he tells you to, uh, to, to uh, for your learning, it means that we really need to pay attention to it. Um, he beareth party per bast. Very good. So that's your bastard there. Uh, your party per bar uh, per bast. A vert is but vert is good and lawful armory, because um, it was. It was Queen Elizabeth and and one of the highest ranking nobles in the country. Uh, so he is of royal blood. Uh, the field 10, a bar uh, argent. Um, this is the ninth honorary ordinary and containeth the first part of the field, which is of more estimation than is well considered of many that bear the same. So that's one of them, which we've already seen at Westminster Abbey. But here's this one. This is the coat I spoke of in the place of a bar. Uh, by this you may see the coat equally divided into five parts according to the rule. So here be beareth, uh, so you've got two uh, bars across there. Um, let me see, it's divided into five parts. So you've got the V's here, um, you've got the five parts, and he's telling you, or trying to tell you where he's coming, uh, his, his parentages. Uh, so the foxes, or the oxes quarrel, um, uh, Sergeant uh, or of where, you, of where you say sergeant, that's a weird spelling, uh, for that he is half bird, half beast. Uh, it is a term appropriate uh, to him and to none other. Remember, he is none. It is appropriate to him. Uh, Deuteronomy, uh, do write uh, that this is a um, Deuteronomion, do write that this is a fierce beast and keepeth the hyper. A hyper hyperborean uh, mountains, precious stones, um, 
I think they are of great hugeness, for I have a claw of one of their paws, which uh, should show them to be as big as two lions. So he is, uh, if Elizabeth is, is the phoenix, the bird, um, and Robert is the lion, he is the, um, he is the griffin, the two, and has a paw, I have a claw of one of their paws, I've had a claw, which should show them to be as big as two lions. Um, John Argent, again John, so he tells this lovely, again, little uh, story using uh, the colours, um, which is lovely, Lady Orr, I wonder who that is, and John Argent, um, daughter and only heir uh, to the Earl, uh, hath to his first wife, a daughter, the Earl of Jules, so the Earl of um, Jules is red, but he's, he's, this is this is him in this story, by whom he hath issue a daughter named Azur, blue. So um, the lady or the dieth without issue, Sir John, second wife, Dame, and many have the Earl of Burt, uh, shall not the gentlewoman Azur, uh, first begotten, bear her father's coat as heir and her heirs forever? Well, that's beautiful because her fa arguably her father's coat um, is great britain's coat um but her mother's coat may bear to her and her heirs uh, forever so if we look here that um probably um explains a little bit more of what's going on here he's telling you um kind of where he's where he's coming from his ancestry cool so um I'm not a sociopath, I promise you, but um, I do think this is quite funny uh, because, as you'll notice, around that these Bs and Ps, well, some of them are Bs, some of them are Ds, some of them are Ps. Well, what you can do, actually, uh, is this. Robert Dudley and Elizabeth Tudor. Remember those rows, those Ps, those rows are Rs. In Greek, the row is R. So we can do Robert Dudley and Elizabeth Tudor. They each contain uh, this this row, this B, and this D in their name. So it's it's a very fitting uh, circle uh, here, which I, I think is really beautiful and really lovely. Uh, so, oh, oh, reaching reaching the end of this now. Uh, so here's um, uh, Robert Dudley, the uh, the first uh, Earl of Leicester, and um, Queen Elizabeth notice their features and um, it's the honour of my life um, to also give you the portrait of Edward de Vere. Hopefully you can see the family resemblance so on the left you can see that he has his father's nose there's a very um, particular nose that you can see there so he has his father's nose and if you look he has a rouge tint. If you actually look a little bit closer at that photo, you'll see uh, that he has a rouge uh, tint to his hair. Um, so there we go. That's Edward de Vere's portrait. But allow me just to quickly prove this to you, other than the quite um, apparent uh, characteristics he shares with mum and dad. Um, and also, um, I should point out, this is a Titian. This is probably one of Titian's last portraits. Uh, I've already spoken to a Titian expert and they've confirmed um, that the date uh, is not when it is currently uh, known to be. Uh, but that doesn't surprise me given he teaches the figure of chronographia, the figure of counterfeit time. Um, so anyway, um, this is Edward de Vere's portrait. Allow me just to quickly uh, prove this uh, for you. Um, he also he would have gone uh, to Titian to, to visit Titian because Titian was doing a series on Ovid. Uh, there's no way if he's translated Ovid's Metamorphosis and you've seen Metamorphosis and you've seen how important it is to him that he's not going to go and see one of the greatest living artists um, who's been doing a series on Ovid and also get a portrait uh, from him. Um, only a few people had permission because you needed the Queen's permission to leave England. Uh, to go abroad so he would have needed the queen's permission and it would have cost a lot of money uh, to do this so it was a very rare very very rare uh, trip uh, to make but we know uh, that he went to travel in Italy for a year and there's no way he's going to go past uh, Titian without stopping 
for a souvenir. So let, allow me to quickly prove this really is uh, his portrait. It's a rather magnificent uh, portrait for many reasons. You'll notice the shadow there, the hand disappearing behind his back, the gold chain, the gloves. It's, it's quite imposing. But it's what's hidden in this portrait. And this portrait is probably one of the most complex pictures uh, that I've ever seen. There's layers upon layers, like at least three layers of things that are going on uh, here. Notice again, we, we have the subtle gold and, and mainly black in this, in this photo, um, as opposed to the other uh, portrait I dislike quite substantially. Uh, so here we go. Uh, if you have a look in the background, you may start to see some lines craftily being very uh, in ingeniously drawn in by the artist. Allow me to show you what I think are some of the most important in this. Uh, I'm only going to do a few because there's just so many. I'm not even going to start with the coronation. Uh, but let me do this one. Do you see it? That is a man in a mask. So that's a man hiding his face with a mask. A player, let us say, um, with a mask. Okay. You might be going, OK, right, that's uh, I can I can actually I can see this man here holding a mask to his face. Good. Well, you'll also we've been talking about that single star. Can you see it? Can you see the single star there from his coat of arms? That's his single star. And also uh, we have his signature. There's your Veer. Can you see it? Veer, V-E-R-E, Veer. So there's our veer. So there's a man in a mask, your star and your veer. But let's go a little bit further just to give you uh, a fourth uh, proof, well, fifth proof, I suppose the, 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 the similarities facially is kind of a big, uh, and uh, with his auburn tint is kind of a big hint. But uh, there we go. So let's just have a look at this. Can you see this? So this is a bird here. Can you see that? And you might be able to see the clam yeah, can you see that bird's mouth is there? Yeah, bird's mouth is there. So this is our falcon, craftily hidden away, and our clam, with perhaps a pearl in our clam, uh, right by his ear. Why is this important? Because of this bit. And come now to the prettiest stone called the pearl, which is a door writeth to be engendered of the dew of heaven, Plato saith, the pearl hath virtue, uh, come fortative, forth, virtue, comfortative, comfortative, uh, that's lovely, and restorative, uh, and is food to man. Well, this, the pearl, this is certainly going to be restorative, which is very uh, verified uh, by um, verified, having nothing, having nothing to eat, but only pearls. Uh, that pearl hath a singular uh, virtue in comforting the brain. So again, he's telling you, again, we have our virtue and our forty right next to each other. And it is comforting the brain because it's right next to uh, his head there. It's like unto the merchant seeking godly pearls, which when he found uh, one prettiest, uh, prettiest pearl, uh, found all that he had and bought it, whereby Hirhorts may learn to bestow this Pretty, uh, prettiest uh, treasure upon such as worthily will esteem the same and to reward the ox with hay as a gripper well nerth. And so end I uh, with this metal uh, planet and stone showing unto you, uh, that's me, TT, all there, which is lovely. Um, and you also have a, a me, a, a, another one there. Um, planet and stone showing unto you the signification of of uh, the me tt or, or metal uh, simply of itself it signifieth to the bearer there so there we go uh, that is edward de vere's um portrait uh, which i hope um uh, finds its its rightful its rightful place um so uh the last thing i'm going to say uh, which i'll leave you with is what this actually is uh, we've talked about, and you'll notice now, uh, the 4T, the 4T, which is right across uh, the band there, and the P, P, I, 4T, which is really important uh, for showing you uh, the the person who really is this. Uh, but why is this important? 
well, because we have the kings of the world um, in peacetime, preparations for defence, in war, learning. Uh, he, he says really beautifully, uh, learning is the enemy of war. Um, and as our planet starts to burn, um, I'm sure uh, learning and virtue is something we could all do with a little bit more of. Um, but importantly, what is uh, in regards to this? What what what's the shield of? Well, this is the uh, shield of the philosopher king, um, and we should be very very proud uh, that we have uh, had one. Um, and of course, I'm feigning you because I'm really going to end with thank you very much and much love to you. Take care.